Okay. Welcome. Welcome to the regular Board of Education amended on November 17, 2001 on uh, November 18th. Uh, we're back into open session, coming out of closed session. We'll start with the call back to order, Superintendent. Yes, Mr. Short. Here. Mr. Reed. Here. Mr. Hoover. Here. Mr. Clark. Here. Mr. Huey. Here. Ms. Gao. Here. All are accounted for. Thank you. Okay. We'll take the, uh, <clears throat> do the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, can we start with Peter Maroon? You're back there. Thank you, Peter. There we go. A broadcast and recording is being made at the uh, direction of the board and the broadcast may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. The meeting is being live streamed on the district's YouTube channel. The public's health and well-being are the top priority for the Board of Trustees of Folsom Cordova Unified School District, and you are earn, <coughs> urged to take all appropriate health and safety precautions. Folsom Cordova Unified School District Board Policy 1313 promotes mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among employees, <coughs> parents, and the public. We will treat staff, parents, and members of the public with respect and expect the same in return. If any member of the public uses obscenities or communicates in a demanding, loud, insulting, or demeaning manner, the board will calmly and politely admonish the person to co communicate civilly. Written comments were accepted until 3 p.m. today. These comments were e emailed to the board prior to the board meeting for review and will not be read out loud during the meeting. At the direction of the board, the superintendent will take call, uh, call roll to acknowledge the board's received electronic comments submitted by 3 p.m. today as it pertains to today's board meeting. Superintendent, okay. Mr. Short? Yes. Mr. Reed? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Gao? Aye. <clears throat> All are accounted for. Thank you. As a reminder, in addition to the state health order and corresponding face covering guidance, the Sacramento County Department of Public Health local order as issued on July 29th remains in place, requiring face coverings in all indoor public settings and workplaces, including school settings. Copies of the county's health order are available for anyone who wishes to review during the meeting. Falls Cordova Unified School District requires all in-person attendees at board meetings to wear face coverings, regardless of vaccine status. For those who do not have a mask, one will be provided for you. The board is legally required to ensure that all attendees, regardless of vaccination status, except individuals who are specifically exempted pursuant to the CDPH mandate, wear face coverings while attending the meetings in person. The only exemptions are as follows. Persons younger than two years old, persons with medical conditions, mental health conditions, or disability that prevents wearing a mask, persons who are hearing impaired or communicating with a person who is hearing impaired, where the ability to see the mouth is essential for communication. Persons unable to wear a face covering based on medical or mental health exemptions may be subject to the request for verification. In addition, persons exempted from wearing a face mask due to medical or mental conditions must wear a non-restrictive alternative such as a face shield with a drape on the bottom edge as long as their condition permits it. The district does not allow members of the public to attend in board meetings in uh, it does allow to uh, in a virtual format, which is described on the district's website, folsecordovaunified.org. Uh, so this is being broadcast. You can go to there. Also, I think out in the lobby, we also have it out in the lobby. With that said, we can start officially the meeting. We'd be going to item five, reporting out of closed session, superintendent. We have no action to report out of closed session tonight. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item six, adoption of the agenda. Mr. President. Yes, sir. Um, I would move uh, approval of the agenda, except for uh, I would request that um, item 11A, discussion action uh, for the approval or denial of the new Pacific Charter School, 
uh, petition be moved up uh, following 10A. So it would go 10A, 11A, and then we would go back to 10B. Okay. I'll we second. Have, we have a first uh, reads motion. A second was Mr. Hoover. A roll call. Mr. Short. Yes. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hoover. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Mr. Huey. Aye. Ms. Gow. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item seven, public participation. Uh, this is when we're allowed to approach the board that's not on the agenda, uh, but at this point, the board cannot uh, respond to things uh, on this agenda item. We do have quite a bit of folks here for general comment. How many do we have? We have three for public participation. Oh, three. So we'll do these first three, and then the rest, we, it looks like we have for actual agenda items, and we will call everybody when it goes to the actual agenda item which which is the charter and i think the safety mm -hmm. commission so we have quite a bit on there we're going to restrict it to two minutes for that and three minutes for students okay, okay. <clears throat> for that start we'll start with the first one patricia stegler stoddard oh, that looks like an l and after that it'll be marina gabriel Hello everyone, my name is Patricia and I've been a preschool teacher for six years now, serving in the Rancho Cordova community. A few points, one, per Harvard, the British Medical Journal and nearly all major publications, COVID-19 is no longer a pandemic, it is endemic, meaning we are all eventually going to get it. Two, having a card showing your vaccination status is a false sense of security from liability as you can both contract and spread COVID if you're fully vaccinated. Three. This is nothing like MMR, polio, small packs, smallpox, vaccines, as it doesn't immunize you from the virus and no institution would mandate getting the vaccines for these viruses if you have already survived them and received natural immunity. As I've seen over the last year and a half with this now endemic state of COVID, children have been suffering with their academics, development, social skills, and their mental health. Even with the little ones I teach in my local preschool, I have seen the negative effects this endemic state has created upon them. According to the CDC, for children ages 0 to 17 years of age, a total of 5.2 million cases of COVID have been confirmed for 0 to 17 years old with 542 total deaths. That is a survival rate of almost exactly 99.997%. If a child aged 0 to 17 years of age has a 99.997% survival rate, then why are we mandating an experimental vaccine or requiring our children to wear masks for an illness with a 99.997% survival rate? If this school board truly cares about the well-being and health of our children, our future, then we should stand up against fear, look at the data, and stop masking or mandating a vaccine that will do more harm than good for our children. Let's stand together and join other local schools who have rejected the vaccine mandate, such as Calaveras School District, Mark Twain School Board, and Happy Valley School Board in Shasta County, to name a few, and protect our children so they can live a healthy and fulfilled life. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Marina? Marina Gabel? Okay. And after Marina be Joanne Buck. Hi, sorry, caught me off guard. Um, I am again uh, speaking on the mandates, the vaccine mandate. Um, my son has just turned 12, so it's a concern for me. Um, also as an employee, it's a concern. I love my job as a school bus driver for Folsom Cordova. I love the kids. It was not easy to become a school bus driver. And, um, you know, I love to work and these so-called vaccines aren't working. So why would an employee who gets vaccinated that can carry the same level of this virus be able to work when they could get me sick, it, it just doesn't make sense. The science isn't working. It's, it's political, it's money, it's political, and our children are now gonna get caught in the middle of it and your employees. And it just, 
I know that there are at least 13 districts that have written letters to Newsom that do not agree and are standing for their staff and their students. And I'm just wondering if you have written a resolution yet, or are you going to? And if you do, could you please make it public? Thank you. Thank you. And Joanne, Bob, Joanne. Oh, there you are. Okay. Hello, good to see you all again. Um, since a lot has been said about the shot and the masks and what harm they are causing to small children, I'm gonna go to the social emotional learning. Um, I don't know if this is true, but if true, if you took money from the CARES Act and then you do this stuff to these kids, then you sold other people's kids out for money. Um, and since you've taken it upon yourselves to without the permission of the parents to insert yourselves into the social and emotional lives of other people's most precious, precious things in their lives. You know, if you want to become a social worker, you need an advanced degree. If you want to become a counselor, you need an advanced degree. Do all these teachers that are inserting themselves into the social and emotional well-being of other people's most precious, precious beings, are they qualified? Do they have these advanced degrees so as not to cause any psychological damage? Um, my maternal immigrant grandmother only had a third grade education, but she had more wisdom than I have seen anybody have. Because knowledge is fine, but if you don't have the wisdom to use it effectively, then all that, all that knowledge is useless. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay. Is there any virtual comments? Do we have any virtual comments? Hearing none, okay. Uh, Remind, we're on YouTube, so that's we do have people that would do uh, comments. So if they're out there, just let us know, raise their hand, correct? Okay. Uh, moving on to reports of district organizations. Uh, we'll start with um, student advisory. Uh, thank you and good evening. Um, at our last student advisory board meeting, we worked on developing um, a social media presence to help collect feedback from a more um, comprehensive and diverse group of students um, and keep students informed um, about board decisions and upcoming board discussions. Um, Dr. Blackburn and her team also came in to discuss school-based health centers and the types of services that students would like to see offered. Um, many students ex expressed support for better, better available resources regarding uh, pregnancies, especially emphasizing confidentiality on that front, um, sexual health, particularly for LGBTQ students, rehabilitative services for students who struggle with alcohol or drug use and addiction, district provided physicals for students who might not be able to afford them, uh, and increased clarity and opportunities for mental health support. We also uh, further discussed our student summit that we plan to hold next semester, considering topics we would like to see discussed, um, such as um, equitable outcomes and mental health, as well as ways to increase student involvement, uh, such as bringing in a professional who might have experience with student listening circles. Um, and our next meeting will be Wednesday, December 8th at 10 a.m. Um, via Zoom. Thank you. California School Employees Association. Good evening, school board members and Dr. Kaligian. Um, I was, I'm gonna, I'm intending to speak on the two items that are agendized if uh, the board would prefer that. Yes, if you could stay up for the discussion. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Pulse Cardiff Education Association. Good evening. 
just have a very brief report at this at this point in the evening, but I wanted to thank the superintendent and our special ed department for addressing some special ed concerns that came up this week um, so quickly and so efficiently. It is greatly appreciated. It's been a challenging year with staff shortages, and I see it really impacting our special ed department, um, not in a good way at all. There, it's really compounding the situation in so many ways to have the shortages of IAs and BSAs that we have. Um, those roles really allow the students to be successful in their classrooms and allow the classrooms to function at their highest levels. So I look forward to continuing to work together to find ways that we can recruit and retain those positions. And again, I am really grateful to be working with a district that pulls together to support all of our employees. So thank you. Thank you. Falls Cordova Leadership Association. Good evening, board members and Dr. Kaligian. My name is Kay Malhai Huser, and I serve as coordinator for testing and assessment for our district, as well as vice president of FCLA. For tonight's updates, I am presenting on behalf of Dr. Daniels, who is unable to attend. I would like to take this opportunity to share an activity which I've had the pleasure of organizing for our FCLA family. FCLA's focus is on... Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll try again. <laughs> FCLA's focus is on SEL, or social emotional learning, as a bridge towards educational equity. The FCLA board recognizes that in order to provide SEL, SEL for our staff and students, as leaders, we must first take care of our own wellness. According to special education coordinator Hunt Lin, it is important to, and I'm quoting him, to take care of you to take care of the job, end quotes. The well-being of our FCLA members is a priority for us. As a result, FCLA is providing monthly virtual yoga classes at no cost to our members. We have secured a wonderful certified instructor, Taya Johnson. Taya is a third grade teacher at Blanche Sprints. She also teaches yoga at Ohana Moon Yoga Studio in Cameron Park. Why yoga, I can hear you say. As you can see from the yoga flyer, this practice has many health benefits, especially around the areas of stress management and relaxation. Well, we held our first cla virtual class on November 3rd. For some reason, many of us had our cameras off. We pushed through the hour-long class, and although we were secretly happy when it was over, we are looking forward to the next class on December, December 1. I have some anonymous feedback for you. I enjoyed it. I had the camera off most of the time because I'm embarrassed that I'm so out of shape. It was very relaxing. Now I can tell you, we all had that, share that same sentiment. The FCLA board will continue to develop and support this and other self-care opportunities for our FCLA members. After all, they're second to none. Thank you. Thank you. A District English Learner Advisory Committee. Good evening, President Short, Superintendent Dr. Kalingian, members of the board and esteemed colleagues. It's my pleasure to introduce again uh, for us, um, Ana Silvia Pimentel, uh, one of our officers for DLAC. She has a message and a statement to share, and I'll be translating. Buenas tardes. Uh, mi nombre es Ana, si, Ana Pimentel. Soy la secretaria del DILAC y tengo dos hijos en, en una escuela elemental en este distrito. Yo como madre y representante de los um, padres de, de estudiantes de este distrito, tenemos um, varias preocupaciones y dudas acerca de la nueva Pacific Charter School. Los temas son los siguientes. Primero. I'm going to try to catch up with her. She's got a um, couple. Um, good evening. My name is Ana Pimentel, and I'm a DLAC, the DLAC Secretary for Folsom Cordova Unified. 
I have two children and one in one in elementary school, one of our elementary schools within the district. As a parent and as a district parent representative, I have several concerns and doubts about how the new Pacific Charter School would function. My concern are, concerns are as follows. Uh, uno de los puntos serían, ¿cómo, ¿cómo estarían o cómo serían las clases? ¿En un salón um, con tiempo completo o homeschool o estudios independientes? Si fuera como homeschool o eh, estudios independientes, me gustaría recordarles que en esta área de Rancho Córdoba somos uh, la mayoría padres que trabajamos fuera de casa y no podemos uh, apoyar al 100% a nuestros hijos en ella. So, beginning with the concerns is how, how many of the classes will be implemented implemented are there going to be offered in traditional in-person full-time classrooms, homeschool, independent study? When reviewing the pacificcharters.org webpage, it only shows two options, homeschool and independent study. If the charter is to work in, an, in a homeschool and independent study, I would like to emphasize that most of our parents in Rancho Cordova area have to leave home for work, and therefore they cannot provide 100% support for their kids at home. Si es en persona en un edificio, me gustaría saber si estas instalaciones están acondicionadas, son salones adecuados y seguros y con áreas al aire uh, libre donde puedan jugar y relajarse a uh, los niños, así para que tengan un aprend aprendizaje socioemocional como ellos lo recomiendan o es la intención. Um, if the charter is to work in a traditional setting in person and in a facility, I would like to know if the building would be equipped with adequate and safe rooms. Are there going to be equipped with outdoor areas where children can play, relax, and thus attain an emotional, social emotional supportive setting? Si yo tuviera a mis hijos en esta escuela charter y tuviera un problema con el personal que trabaja ahí, ¿Yo a dónde podría hablar para que me ayuden? ¿O tienen algunas oficinas centrales? Another concern is if I were to send my, if parents were to send their children to this charter school and had a problem with the personnel, where would they call for help? Where would they have the head, where would the headquarters be located? So. Okay. Um, otro de los puntos importantes para nosotros serían si esta escuela Uh, tiene ayudas o apoyos para estudiantes aprendices de inglés o para estudiantes que tienen necesidades especiales o estudiantes que no tienen un hogar. Again, concerns for support for English learners, students with special needs, and homeless students. What services? Uh, también me gustaría saber si proporcionan ayuda uh, con centros de cuidados para estudiantes después de escuela. An, another, I'm sorry, do, and a major concern is to, do you provide child care centers for children that require before and after school care? Otro de los puntos que hem, hemos estado viendo es acerca del transporte. Tengo entendido que el lugar donde quieren abrir o instalarse es una área industrial, donde las uh, casas de estos estudiantes quedan uh, lejos de, de esta escuela. Um, ¿Cómo van a, um, tiene esta escuela transporte o van a seleccionar estudiantes que sus papás tengan vehículo o cómo le van a hacer? Um, regarding transportation, we have not seen anything and I believe that the location where the charter school is being planned is in an industrial area where the children's homes are far away from walking distance. Will this school offer transportation for the students? Are you going to select students whose parents have a vehicle? Or how is this going to be handled? Si abrieran esta escuela y a pesar, um, después de unos años no funcionara como, como se esperaba, ¿qué sería? ¿Cerrarían solo la escuela? ¿Qué va a pasar con esos, estos estudiantes? I'm um, concerned too with transiency. If the school were to be opened and in a few years down the road, the school did not work out as expected. 
Would you just close the school? And what plan would you have for the students in their current that are currently enrolled? Al revisar la puntuación en Google, en la página de internet, uh, acerca de la Pacific Charter Institute en la dirección 1401 en Camino Avenue, uh, solo miré que tenía una review y no era muy buena, solo tenía dos estrellas. Entonces, en base a esto, ¿cómo pueden demostrar que va a funcionar esta escuela? Um, some other information and feedback is that um, in reviewing the Google score for Pacific Charter Institute located at 1401 El Camino Avenue, number 510, it only shows one review and it is not favorable. It only has two stars. Based on what facts can they show us that this school is going to work and, and has proven success? Yo creo, nosotros creemos que no necesitamos la Pacific Charter School en, este, en esta área porque no trae nada novedoso para nuestros estudiantes. Nuestras escuelas de este distrito ofrecen todas um, las ayudas o lo que ellos um, vienen ofreciendo. Este, y para ejemplo, tenemos muchas escuelas. Eh, una de ellas es la Innova, Innovación Academy Online Virtual School, Riverview Steam Academy, etc. Okay. Um, in conclusion, um, DLAC feels that the Pacific Charter School, um, we do not need the Pacific Charter School because it does not offer anything new for our students. Folsom Cordova schools offer and provide the same services and more than Pacific Charter School claims. For example, we have Innovations Academy, an online virtual school serving um, distant learning. We have Riverview STEM Academy, um, others listed innovations, methods, students can go to, to become problem solvers, adult ed, other things listed in her menu. Además, después de una pandemia como fue el COVID y las consecuencias por la que, las que pasamos y estamos saliendo adelante, no veo conveniente que se experimente con una nueva escuela y, y estar moviendo a nuestros estudiantes de una escuela a otra experimentando solamente. En conclusión, considering all the difficulties our children and student, our students and parents have endured during COVID, it, I, the recommendation is that it is not convenient to experiment on our students by moving them from one school to another to see if it works. Thank you for your attention and consideration. Gracias. Gracias mucho por todo. Sí. Uh, I think we already got the agenda consent, right? Oh, okay. we're moving on to agenda consent then. I'll move it. Do I have a motion? I'll move it. Okay, Mr. I'll Clark, do you have a second? I did. Mr. Hoover, did you say a second? Okay, take roll call, please. Mr. Short? Yes. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Gao? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. And you're going to do an intro for us? Yes, so yes. I would be honored to introduce, um, in, uh, as a result of the consent action that the board just approved, Part of that action was the approving of the personnel action form tonight. And on that, we would like to welcome our new principal to Navigator Elementary School, Mr. James Tucker. He's joining us this evening. James, uh, welcome aboard. Congratulations. And just a short um, bio for Mr. Tucker. He comes to us from Bret Hart Elementary School, where he has served as their principal for the last five years. He began his career in education 17 years ago, spent 12 years in the classroom teaching K through five, with the last three years looping with an elementary cohort in a public Waldorf model. Mm -hmm. And I know building relationships with students, staff, and families are a key priority for him. And we look forward to having him in that role at Navigator. So welcome to the team, James. Thank you. I have one more announcement as a result of the personnel action form. Um, tonight, we also approved a, re a retirement of one of our longtime employees, Ms. Mr. Rob Thomas. And Rob has been with our district several years, and he's planning to retire at the end of December. Mm. Um, he is going to be a, a loss, <laughs> not having him in our district, but we want to thank him, congratulate him, and wish him all the best in his retirement. So from us to you, Rob, um, thank you. Congratulations. We wish you well.
Thank you, Rob, and thank you for being on board with us. Uh, moving on to item 10, public hearing. Item A, notice of public hearing, charter school petition to establish a new <coughs> Pacific Charter School staff report. With that said, uh, we'll go with ask the superintendent to introduce. Good evening, thank you. Um, just a little background first. On September 3rd, 2021, the new Pacific School submitted a petition to establish a new charter school to the Folsom Cordova Unified School Board of Education. On October 21st, 2021, the Board of Education held an initial public hearing with 60 days of receipt of the charter petition. Tonight's public hearing constitutes the second public hearing required under the Ch Charter Schools Act. As part of this hearing, dif district staff will present its staff report of proposed findings of fact and recommended, recommended board action on the charter petition. Following staff's presentation, the new Pacific School will have equivalent time to provide a presentation and respond to staff's findings of fact and recommendation if it chooses. And following the presentations, our board will have a chance to ask questions of both staff and the petitioner. Um, and after that time is completed with our board's questions, our board president will open up the public hearing to the public to comment. And, uh, and then after all the comments have been heard, then we'll close the hearing and move on to the discussion action. So with that being said, I introduce Ms. Betty Jo Wessinger, our Assistant Superintendent of Special Education. Ms. Wessinger will present our staff report this evening. Good evening, Dr. Kaligian, President Short, members of the board, staff, lots of you here tonight. Thank you, and families. The, the petition, do you have the presentation? Thank you. New Pacific School under Pacific Charter Institute submitted a petition to establish a new charter school on September 3rd, 21. If you could go to the first slide, please. Do you want me to use a clicker? Components of the pro proposed program include an educational focus with trauma-informed SEL framework, California standard aligned standards aligned curriculum and the target students are students with chronic absenteeism from Cordova Meadows, Cordova Gardens, Cordova Villa, Rancho Cordova Elementary, White Rock, Mills, Mitchell, Cordova High School and Kinney High School. Cal Pursuant to California Education Code 47605C, the set, which sets forth the guidelines to consider in reviewing the charter petitions and findings are divided into three categories, including areas considered met, areas considered deficient, areas considered significantly deficient. Note that these items support the staff findings and recommendations for denial of the petition. The summary of the findings. The summary of the findings following a comprehensive review and analysis of the petition by Folsom Cordova Unified School District, denial of the petition is recommended based on the following findings of fact. New Pacific School is demonstrably unlikely to successfully implement the program set forth in the petition and two, the petition does not contain reasonably comprehensive descriptions of the required elements of a charter petition and three, New Pacific School is demonstrably unlikely to serve the interests of the entire community in which the school is proposing to locate. Analysis of these findings shall include consideration of the fiscal impact of the proposed charter school. New areas considered met are among the, there are 10 areas that are considered met, including description of vision, mission, educational program, annual independent financial audit, suspension and expulsion procedures, financial ad administrative plan to name a few. No further analysis will be provided on these items since they are met. Areas considered deficient, in addition, it, all of these items, but I'm just gonna mention a couple of them, three of them, the governance structure and under the governance Structure, for example, it is unclear from the petition and the bylaws that New Pacific Committee will adhere to the Brown Act regarding to committees. There are no health and safety policies and procedures in the petition. 
and they, they, or a date they will be adopted and submitted to Folsom Cordova Unified. Regarding racial and ethnic balance, policies and practices to attract a diverse applicant pool are described, but no mention of benchmarks or support to maintain balance. The only groups that are identified are students with disabilities, low income, and Spanish speakers. This is not, there is not a description of the student groups that are specified on page 33. In addition to the groups previously mentioned, they are English learner, foster and homeless, and black African American. In petition, and in fact refers to, the petition refers to the various groups represented in the ter ter territorial jurisdiction of Sacramento County and not the territorial jurisdiction of the school district in which the charter petition is submitted. And the charter school should be addressing the territorial jurisdiction of the district and not the county. Recruitment strategies only specifically identify Spanish speakers and students with disabilities. And furthermore, it is unclear what input was gathered to address the needs of our working families as no before or after school programs are offered. Note that Folsom Cordova staff believes these areas of deficiency can be or have been remediated with additional information received from New Pacific School, um, but a response and the response does not constitute grounds for denial of the petition. New Pacific School staff report areas considered significantly deficient. These Items that support staff findings and recommendations for denial of the petition and the analysis will be provided under the findings. Finding number one, New Pacific School is demonstrably unlikely to be successful to, or I'm sorry, New Pacific School is not demonstrated that they can support target students. The focus of the analysis is going to be on the first talking point that is bolded as FCUSD staff believe the individual qualifications, special education and required affirmations and signatures can be remediated. New Pacific School has not demonstrated they can support the targeted students who are students with chronic absenteeism from Rancho Cordova school, schools. Access, including walking distances, transportation, safety, before and after school programs, plan for addressing chronic absenteeism are major concerns. Students with chronic absenteeism are struggling to get to their neighborhood school. Folsom Cordova Unified School District, District provides transportation to these schools. There are 26 routes providing this transportation to our schools in Rancho Cordova where chronic absenteeism is a concern, whereas New Pacific School is not providing transportation. The petition specifically states on page 42, the campus will most likely be accessed by car or bus. It is highly unlikely that students who cannot get to their neighborhood school will be able to get to New Pacific School. The walking time from the target schools ranges from 40 minutes to 63 minutes. The proposed location is in a light industrial area. There are adult entertainment businesses, breweries, and a vape store, all within 0.4 to 1.4 miles of the proposed facility. Not all roads have bike lanes, and RT regional transit stops are not readily accessible for all students in Rancho Cordova. The RT route times do not take into consideration the travel time to and from the RT stops, which, uh, pardon me, regional transit. When I'm referencing RT, it's regional transit. Or the safety concerns of having children riding public transportation unaccompanied by a responsible adult. It also does not take into consideration that the bus pickup times may not be conveniently scheduled to ensure that RT stop times are aligned to school start and end times so that travel time is not extended due to bus wait time. For working families, all of our Rancho Cordova schools offer before and after school programs, including ACES, which provides an afternoon academic enrichment program and dinner for our socially socioeconomically disadvantaged students. New Pacific Charter will not offer before and after school programs, evening meals, as well as other enrichment options. Finally, New Pacific School has no plan for addressing absenteeism specifically. SEL and other pro program components will not reach students who can't get to or who are not coming to school. Finding number two, the petition does not contain reasonably comprehensive descriptions of all of the required elements. 
And the post-employment rights of employees is not a concern as it has either been in um, the new public school response, already been remediated or we believe can be remediated. Remediated. So I'm going to talk a little bit about facilities. Major concerns regarding facility safety concerns due to lack of assurances in its response. New Pacific School has affirmed it will meet applicable codes, but there still is no evidence that that is referenced or will be available regarding square footage to be acquired, timeline for tenant improvements to ensure completion before the 22-23 school year begins. PCI has uh, identified state space, but there's no evidence that it's been available or that PCI has made any effort to enter into a conditional lease expressly contingent upon the charter petition approval. There is no information that uh, there is what the space will look like, that it will be completed in time for the opening of the school year, that there is a cafeteria or gym um, access to the fields across the street, restrooms, et cetera. Finding number three, New Pacific School is demonstrably unlikely to serve the interests of the entire community in which the school is proposing to locate. I'm going to, I will discuss community impact and these three bullets will fall under within the community impact. But I'm going to start at the bottom with capacity. Folsom Cordova has the enrollment capacity to serve students within its schools, both in Rancho Cordova and throughout the district. Additionally, Folsom Cordova already offers the program elements New Pacific School is proposing to offer within the district, both in Rancho Cordova schools and in Folsom schools. Fiscal impact. In the first year of operation, the fiscal impact will be between 409,000 and 815,000 loss in ADA. With a structural deficit anticipated in 2022-23, Folsom Cordova Unified Staff is projecting the district will be making budget cuts. If the district experiences a reduction in ADA, the budget reductions will increase, most likely leading to staff reductions and other cuts. With budget cuts between 2.2 and 4.5 million, if a reduction were made in certificated staffing only, the reduction would be between 22 and 45 certificated employees. If a reduction in staffing among a variety of positions, both certificated and classified were to occur, the reduction in a staffing would be approximately 29 to 58 employees or the equivalent of an entire staff of an elementary school in Rancho Cordova. The district acknowledges that the students at New Pacific School may not all come from Folsom Cordo Youth Unified and that staff reductions would need to occur to offset the reductions, which is why we calculated at both 50% and at 100%. Even with a loss of 50% ADA, the fiscal impact is $2.2 million cumul cumulatively over three years. Duplicity in programs. Programs and curriculum proposed by New Pacific School as compared to those offered at Folsom Cordova Unified School. So New Pacific School proposes to offer the following elements, project-based learning, individual learning plans, social emotional learning, college and career readiness, professional development for teachers. All of these programs over in the left column under Folsom Cordova are currently offered within Folsom Cordova. Some examples from some of our schools in Rancho Cordova, starting with Cordova Gardens. Cordova Gardens is moving to a whole school STEAM program. I'm sorry. Cordova Gardens is moving to a whole STEAM program, which includes a K-5 partnership with Soilborn Farms, which includes field trips and gardens on campus. There's a primary garden and there's an intermediate garden. There's also second grade egg, salmon eggs hatched and cared for on campus, released into the American River, fourth grade study of the vernal pools in the Mather area, and fifth grade science cap camp. The school is also in the process of a media program that will partner with Cordova High School and a 3D printing program for third through fifth grade students. One on all elementary schools in Rancho Cordova have one-to-one -one computers with the exception of Rancho Cordova Elementary, which will this spring. Social emotional learning, all of the schools in, all of the elementary schools in Folsom Cordova, both Rancho Cordova and Folsom schools are implementing school-wide second step curriculum for SEL. 
All elementary schools in Folsom Cordova offer Sunday reading and professional development is offered at all of the school sites in the district. There is ongoing through the school site and the district office well beyond 20 hours a year. Additional programs, there, there's a matrix if you want to look at for a more of a comparison that compares our programs at middle and high school and the offerings which I'll show explains our college and career readiness. You can click on the link that's provided in the slide. The new Pacific School will be afforded equivalent time to respond to the staff report and the recommended findings of fact. Following both presentations, the board will ask questions and any, any member of the public will have an opportunity to voice their input and opinion regarding the petition to establish the new Pacific School. In a, in a follow-up agenda item, the board will take action to approve or deny the petition. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wessinger. And it looks like your presentation was about 15 minutes, so I will invite Dr. Kiefer uh, to come <coughs> forward on behalf of New Pacific Charter and have uh, equal time to present. Welcome, Dr. Kiefer. Right. I'm so sorry. That's all right. That clapper. <laughs> I want to make sure I great. Good evening, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Collegian. Thank you for letting us present tonight. Thank you to the Folsom Cordova staff uh, who contributed to the review of the charter. I appreciate the time and the feedback. It's good to see everyone again tonight. For the new people in the room watching online, my name is Paul Kiefer. I'm a father of three children. I've lived in Carmichael for 25 years and Sacramento County for 32 years. I'm the executive director of Pacific Charter Institute. I volunteer through Rot Rotary, the Heart Homeless Groups. I'm involved in the Boy Scouts and I'm elected to the Sacramento County School Board. At our last hearing in October, we shared about our educational program and how we make sure that it's accessible to all students, including English learners, special education students, at promise and gifted students. We talked about the need for new Pacific schools and talked about our outreach efforts in the targeted communities. We introduced you to the founding principal, Romel Mabanta, and the rest of the team behind PCI, including our teachers, the psychologists, outreach teams, student services, finance, and even our auditor. We also heard from the parents who are excited about this program, and we have more of them here tonight. Tonight, we will share again what makes new Pacific school unique. We will highlight selected parts of our response to the district's analysis, which board members have received in writing. Finally, we will share a path forward with the district that we can work together. Before I get into the nitty gritty, I'd love to have the folks here in support to please stand up of New Pacific School. Thank you very much. What makes New Pacific School so unique? It's a new TK-12 school that is project-based, hands-on, cross-curricular. We will lever leverage social-emotional learning to develop leadership, belonging, and problem-solving, regardless of the students' backgrounds. New Pacific School empowers students to take ownership of their learning, build self-esteem, and global awareness in Rancho Cordova in a small, safe setting that is totally unique from anything else in the city. New Pacific School will be the only school that offers the following programs in Rancho Cordova TK-12 without academic and behavioral requirements that is also tuition-free and open to all students. We're going to offer Project Lead the Way, the project-based learning. We'll offer Leader in Me, which is actually not a program, it's a way of living in a social, emotional, uh, cognizant learning environment foreign language and art, mastery learning and inquiry-based learning, personalized learning growth plans for all students. Of course, we talked about one-to-one -one computing. And we have one awesome teacher and one fantastic paraprofessional full-time in every classroom, giving us at least a 15 to one, if not less, student-adult ratio in the classroom. There's nothing else like New Pacific School in terms of continuity, size, equity, access, culture, or program in Rancho Cordova. I carefully read the district's analysis of the charter petition, and I want to highlight some of the positive things that I saw, and certainly they were recognized tonight by Ms. Wessinger. 
The staff report validates the mission, vision, and objectives of the educational program. The report also affirms that the curriculum, instructional methods, professional development, and plans for serving all students have met the standard. There were no negative findings relating to a three-year budget and cash flow plan, which means the proposed plan is fiscally sound. They also found that the charter management organization proposing the school has the experience to run it. This is all good news and lays the groundwork for a confident approval. The district was looking for clarification in three areas, and we provided that to you. Questions about procedures and compliance, creating new requirements outside of the charter law, and a fear of job loss. We've submitted our responses to each of the issues raised in writing to the superintendent and the board, but I want to highlight a a few key points. In regards to signatures, the law states that you can submit either parent signatures or teacher signatures. We did both because we wanted to show that educators and families are both behind this petition. We can squabble on the interpretation of the law, but the fact is that we jumped over the bar with four teacher signatures. In facilities, we work with a commercial realtor with experience with educational facilities and charter schools, including John Adams Academy in Lincoln and Roseville, as well as El Dorado Hills. We cannot sign a lease until the charter is approved, and we will absolutely provide information to the board after we solidify the location. The location has not been selected. Although it seems uh, fait complete, the facility has not been selected, and we're looking for a facility that will be north of 50. That is our goal. We have no signed document to that effect. We will follow all zoning laws and building codes and all applicable laws to provide a safe, attractive space where kids want to learn within the targeted community. Access. We are committed to working with the families in the city to ensure that they can access the school through walking, bike, public transportation, or car. The district does not provide transportation for all students either, but we are all similarly committed to listening to our families to find what works best like walking school buses, carpools, and other solutions. We are absolutely committed to making sure kids and families can get to and from school every day safely. Chronic absenteeism. Educators at Pacific Charter Institute developed the school in response to the rising number of students who are struggling with social emotional troubles at school. When students are disconnected from school, they stop learning and they stop going to school. That's why we look at chronic absenteeism as a key data indica point indicating the, ne the need for the new approach. In Rancho Cordova in 2018-19, the average rate of chronic absenteeism in the targeted elementary schools, the Mills Middle School and Cordova High School is 16.74%. That's double the district-wide average, which includes Folsom of 8.3% and higher than the statewide average of 12%. PCI's four schools have a 96% attendance rate for over 3,000 students annually. We've developed a program and a culture that families feel welcomed and included and work together to eliminate barriers to participation. Cherry picking. To those ends, let me be very clear that we are not aiming at creating an elite school that cherry picks the best and leaves the rest. If we were, we'd start a private school. Our goal in pursuing a charter school with Folsom Cordova Unified School District, one that includes preferred admissions in the lottery to students who actually qualify for free and reduced lunch plans to make this incredible educational program accessible to all students. We do not have any academic or behavioral admissions requirements like magnet schools. Our goal is to bring students into the fold who are not feeling connected to or thriving in other district schools. They should have the same opportunity. Special education. In 16 years, we've only had one fair hearing at Pacific Charter Institute. Students with special needs require absolute attention and focus. With that, we adhere to all the rules and regulations around IDEA. Child find is a priority as we want to ensure the best, most accurate services and benchmarks are in place for the students. We are members of three different SELPAs that require accurate SACE reporting and they provide oversight to ensure that we are putting our students required services first using IDEA, IDEA as our guide. Teacher credentialing. We don't currently use teacher credentialing flexibility that will sunset soon. We currently employ over 150 teachers and proper and credentialing as a top priority. The teachers we hire will be appropriately credentialed just as they are now. And if we have any other concerns, certainly we can work them out.
help. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's good. So where do we go from here? We can and do currently run four schools with 11 different educational programs. We have an excellent team, not only for the site, but backing up them up for, with operations, student services, and support. I'm confident that we can open and run an incredible school in Rancho Cordova. Finally, I understand that because of the way California education finance works, the taxpayer dollars do follow the students, that the district will not receive funding for students that choose other schools. We realize that the district is constantly adjusting to factors that are outside of their control, like housing, birth rates, students leaving the district for other schools, and of course, pandemics. If the board approves our charter tonight, we will share our data with you to ensure that you have the real data to make projections so you have the time to make the adjustments. We all know that the district is growing, so the small school that we're planning will hardly affect the district budget or staffing with the growth in South of 50. In conclusion, we believe that the charter is very comprehensive, but we also acknowledge and honor that some districts want more detail in certain areas. To those ends, we'd ask that the board direct the excellent Folsom Cordova staff to work with PCI on an MOU addressing any remaining concerns. Once the charter is approved, we can move forward with finalizing the facility and open enrollment for the families. I'm here to answer any of questions, of course, and we hope you approve the charter tonight, direct staff to put together an MOU on the details, and we look forward to being a part of the Folsom Cordova family. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, sums it up for our presentation. We'll be going into board questions of staff. So uh, we'll start from, we'll start with uh, Mr. Hoover and we'll work over this way. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's see here. So just a few things, a uh, few things from the staff report that I had questions about. Um, I guess the first would be re related to the transportation concerns. Um, is there a, a statutory or other requirement that transportation be provided to any students uh, um, in, in, in state law? Not, not in state law, no. Okay. We, and we have board policy regarding transportation for our students. The, okay. The do we do we offer transportation to all of our students? No. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure that this is not a. Um, I mean, this is obviously something that uh, you know we can talk about as a concern, but I want to make sure it's not a legal issue. Um, there's also some uh, 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 commentary in the um, staff report. So there's, there's a couple sections that talk about, you know, the substantial financial impact on our district. Um, but then there's also some other sections talking about uh, expressing doubt that P, uh, New Pacific School would meet its enrollment targets. So I guess my question is those don't really square to me. So if, if the new school does not meet its uh, targets, there likely will not be a substantial financial impact on our district, I would assume. And if uh, there is a substantial financial impact on our district, then it's likely that they're closer to meeting their enrollment targets. So I guess I'm just trying to figure out if, if like, which one is it? Um, did staff, does staff believe that they are gonna meet their enrollment targets or that it's gonna be a f substantial financial impact on our district? There were, there were two different areas of analysis. And so in looking at the required signatures, Dr. Kiefer pointed out that they they overmet the standard in that there's a standard that there's a required number of parent guardian signatures or there's a required number of teacher signatures and they submitted both. In counting the parent signatures, there wasn't enough parent signatures point pursuant to ed code, which would be bring into question whether they could or not they could meet that enrollment capacity, but technically those signatures weren't required anyway. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to square these two just because it seems you know, uh, contradictory to me um, that uh, we've expressed two pretty significant concerns in the staff report, but they, they don't seem to really match with one another. Um, so uh, I think 
I think that's something maybe we as a board should discuss. Um, Mr. Hoover, before yes. we leave the financial projection piece, can we have Mr. Martin um, share some feedback on that, please? Because he did the analysis of that. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so with regards to the, the financial concern, um, we did give a range. Uh, we had projected, I think their projection was uh, about 90 student enrollment in the first year and then increasing as they also expanded the grade levels. Um, over a three-year term, um, we gave a range. So if we, we knew that not 100% of the students would probably come from Folsom Cordova. So we gave a range of 50% of the students up to 100%. And that's where we came over the three-year term of uh, impact of $4 million to $2 million. So I would say even if only half the students come are from Folsom Cordova, um, we would still see a substantial impact of uh, $2 million to the district. So there is a financial impact. Um, anytime you lose students, there's a financial impact. But um, we, that's why we gave a range, because we don't know, right. obviously. So and, even at right. 50%, which I do think that 50% would probably be a conservative estimation. And even in that scenario, over the three-year term, we'd still lose $2 million. Okay. Now, the report also states, um, I believe, that um, that those numbers do not take into account any loss in the need for staffing or, or other costs. So we would also, there would be cost savings as well. Yes, correct? traditionally there always is. But um, as we know, um, students don't leave at specific grade levels and even chunks. So a lot of times, even in our own programs, when we lose kids, um, we're not really able to reduce staffing because um, if you lose three kids per each grade level, um, that's absorbed across those classrooms. And so we're not able to reduce a teacher um, so the staffing and some of those savings that you would imagine if they were all from one class or grade level and you reduce, you know, potentially if you lost 50 kids and if they were all coming from one grade level, you'd lose two teachers or you'd be able to adjust down for two, two teachers. But in this scenario there, coming across multiple campuses, there is a potential that the savings would be very minimal uh, or reduction that, uh, in the expenses. So that's an mm. unknown as well. So we just don't know, right? Exactly. Okay. Um, well, staying on that topic then, because I think this is a, you know, a... Um, an important one. Um, I mean, is it true that we're having teacher shortages, challenges with hiring, all of those things right now? Is that is that would that be an accurate statement? Um, at this time, we're not having the shortages we had at the beginning of the year. Okay. So we've uh, we've made a lot of headway on teacher hiring. Uh, we still are having some challenges with classified personnel. Okay. Okay, so I mean, but I think we're trying to, we're obviously still trying to come back from, uh, you know, some of the, the shortages and things that um, kind of presented from the last couple of years. So um, I think, uh, yeah, that's helpful. So, so given that, so that's a good, um, that's a good segue. So uh, obviously we're talking about a potential charter school in Rancho Cordova. Uh, do we know if we have lost students already to charter schools in other uh, districts or other parts of the uh, the re region? Or, or do we not have that data? I, I don't know if we have the data to know exactly the loss of student population, but I, I think there would be an assumption that, yes, students um, that would be in our boundaries have attend either private schools or charter schools. For, for okay. Definitely. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit to... Um, the Sacramento County uh, appeals process. Um, the um, there is a there is a situation here where if this board uh, denies this petition, that it does get appealed and approved um, by Sacramento County on um, on appeal. So, if that were the case, would it, is it correct to say? that Sacramento County would then reap the percentage of uh, dollars that um, the authorizing authority gets and be responsible for accountability and that we would really have no oversight over the charter school. First off, it wouldn't, it, the appeal wouldn't be automatic. Mm -hmm. And so sure. New Pacific School would have 30 days to file their appeal. And then upon appeal, yes, if Sacramento County Office of Education approves the petition, they would be the authorizer. So as the authorizer, they would receive the 1%, which would be the fee for the oversight of the program. Okay. And, and we just wouldn't, I mean, at that point in time, assuming obviously there's also the possibility that they don't approve the appeal, but at that point in time, if it was approved, our district would um, still be facing all of the concerns that you theoretically raised in your report, but 
wouldn't really have any of the oversight. In terms of the loss of ADA, yes. Right, okay. Um, would, um, I don't know who wants to answer this, uh, but would our staff agree that there is an achievement gap between Folsom and Rancho Cordova schools? Just based on, we can base it on dashboard data or whatever data um, we'd like to base it on. Yes, if you look at our dashboard data, there is, um, you know, our Rancho Cordova schools uh, have lower scores in some of the areas on the dashboard. Um, I think it's something that uh, as a board, we all acknowledge, and it's it's something that I think every member of this board is probably at one point in time expressed, you know, grave concern about. Um, so I guess with that in mind, um, is it possible, uh, because, you know, we've heard a lot about the concerns to our district, concerns to our budget, concerns to our staffing. Uh, haven't heard a lot about students tonight. Is it possible to have too many options for, for students? And if uh, no one wants to answer that, I can ask something more specific. Um, would, would our staff agree that different students may excel in different learning environments? And, and is that the reason we offer different programs in different schools? Can you repeat your question, please, Mr. So do, do we agree as a district staff that our students, that there may be different learning environments within which our students excel, which creates the need for different programs. I would think yes, to a certain degree. It also, the choices and options that are offered to our students are also based on what our families tell us they need. For instance, when um, we were uh, facing coming back to in-person school and coming out of the hybrid uh, model that we were in last mm -hmm. year, we realized that we had students and families that didn't wanna come back to school in person. And this board actually was the driver behind looking for another option for students <coughs> that we didn't have before in, in a K-12 uh, five day a week program, which, was, which is Innovations Academy, which we created last mm -hmm. spring and opened up this, this mm -hmm. year. So I would say, you know, this board and our staff have been responsive to um, other needs and options as they arise, just like this board did when they created Riverview STEM years ago as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great. Those are both great examples um, of, of areas where this district has innovated. Um, and I think, you know, Riverview STEM is a great example. We obviously uh, just got announced some amazing awards for that school. So that's that's an absolutely it's uh, uh, a great example. So I guess I'm going to probably have more questions, but I think I'll end with this one. Um, uh, Will uh, there there've been a lot of concerns expressed tonight about. Uh, you know, conditions or location or different uh, after school programs, things like that. Um, will any students be assigned to New Pacific School or will be enrollment, uh, will enrollment be based on voluntary enrollment? That would be a question that Mr. Dr. Kiefer would need to answer. Okay, so, um, okay, I guess I'll rephrase it then. Will our district be assigning any students to New Pacific School? No. Okay. So um, will uh, then, then any students that New Pacific School enrolls, uh, that will be a decision that was based on the parent's choice to send them there, I guess is what I'm getting at. Well, that would be, yes, but also based, based on, on a lottery, whatever their course, enrollment or, policies are sure, as well. Sure, Okay, uh, I'm gonna stop there for now. I may have a few more in a little bit. Okay, uh, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Thank you for the presentation. I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to dive into the staff reduction for our certificated and our classified staff. And you have mentioned some numbers, even at 50%. Um, I think the classified was 22 to 29. Yes. Um, and certificated was 29 to 58. I believe, actually, I believe it was the other way around. I okay. believe that the certificated was 22 to 29, and then the 29 to 58 was both. Okay, so could that be, like, out of all the sites in Rancho Cordova, or is that just one specific site? 
what I'm getting at is, do we run, and I want you to be honest with me, do we run the possibility of closing down one of our schools if it gets to that point? I used that as an example just to show the community impact and the the staffing at one school mm -hmm. but as sean already talked about the more likely scenario is we're going to lose two or three students out of a classroom here another classroom here another classroom okay here. so we are in no jeopardy of closing down the site as of yet i uh, mean as yeah. we're facing that structural deficit which we probably will yes face and it's yes. not a probably we will face probably yes. next year yes um, that was one of my concerns that we could possibly lose the site. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't want anybody to sugarcoat it and say, oh, we're not. The possibility is there. Am I correct? I think, I think it's not a likely scenario, particularly, you know, when, when New Pacific School opens in the first, you know, they're, they, their projections, their numbers, numbers will go up over the years and yeah. then they'll begin to open secondary and they'll open grades. I believe the way that they have it mapped out is they would open up um, through through eighth grade and then nine, 10, 11. TK five, six, eight, then freshman class. So yeah. over three years. Yeah. Okay. And um, then in subsequent years, they'd add a grade in high school. One, okay, thank you for year. that. Yeah. So when you talked about the programs that are currently offered, um, that does include our Charter, correct? FC, Folsom Cordova Community Charter, yes. Okay, so because I didn't, uh, I didn't see that in there, but I just wanted to clarify that to make sure. Um, so I guess uh, I do have questions for Paul, uh, if I may ask, Mr. President? Yeah, I guess. Okay, so Paul, I, I do have questions for you. Um, I'm kind of concerned about this mapping or this proposed site. Is this going to be the site or is this not going to be the site? Because it sounded a little indecisive. Yeah, so we have not chosen a site. We're, we're negotiating with, that, with a particular site, but we're actually still seeing properties becoming available in other parts of our target area. Okay, so I'm going to throw a what if at you. What if it's not this site and it's another site that's further out? We would pursue it, uh, work towards negotiation, and let the district know where uh, we've found the site that would be best as the best possible solution for New Pacific School. Okay. With that being said, and, uh, and you have made the comment that, you know, yes, we offer transportation to our students, but not all students. But do you offer transportation to any students, any of them? At New Pacific School? Yes. We're not open yet. Well, I mean, uh, if you were open, you know what I mean? Yeah, so we have a robust budget. Right. We know that, we know that we're going to, not only do we make ends meet, but we'll be able, to, uh, be able to put resources towards areas where we feel like we could, we could individualize support for individual parents. All that's going to be very specific to families. Right. Uh, but, because but, we're not talking about a whole 800 kids in elementary school or 500 kids. We're talking about 90 kids. Which right. is much more manageable. Yeah, but you're talking about targeting our socially economic disadvantaged families, correct? Some of them may not have that transportation. Some may be in a cohort to where they don't have carpool. So how do we how do we address that? Yeah, so it's, especially now that this site isn't really, you know, uh, it may be another site, maybe further out or further in. It could be, that but, would be our goal. but we don't know. I mean, that's the unknown, right? Yeah, I mean, to that extent, our goal is to target the uh, low-income families and to work every way that we can to get those students to campus. Okay. And so, so as you know, there's many nimble ways that families are able to move their students to school. Well, we'll discuss that about family participation later on because I still have some questions about that. Um, when we talk about uh, supports proposed, are those supports that you're working on? Um, let me, uh, let's see here. 
so LPAC and supports for emergency EL learners. Uh, you know, we have the summer school community partnerships and you just have LPAC and support for emerging EL learners. And that's proposed, that's not in place. So my question is, when would that be in place? Is it something that will open the school first, work on it later? So uh, when it comes to LPAC, anything that has to do with the committee that's uh, required by law, that'll be, that will be arranged as school opens because you have to have parent participation. And so as we're enrolling students prior to school opening, we'll be forming those committees that are required. Beyond that, we, we already have started our, our uh, coffee with the principal. Uh, we've already started activities like that so parents can get used to talking to the person in charge who would make decisions on the site. Even though there is no proposed site. Well, and so they talk to that extent, right? Yeah, well, I'm just saying, I mean, if yeah. a parent says, so oh, where is this going to be? And your response is, well, gee, I, I don't know, but this is tentative. It's just based That's on... That's our responsibility because we have to get it open and then we have to make sure families can get there with our target groups, for sure. That's our responsibility. Okay, well, I'm, I'm still kind of curious about the additional supports proposed. Will they or will they not be uh, implemented? All supports for students listing the charter will be implemented. The ones that are proposed, correct? Those, those are the minimum of supports that we will be formulating and supporting students and families with. Okay. Um, Mr. So, we did, so we didn't mention PTA. We didn't mention other organizations that are, uh, that are optional but may be valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a boosters club. If sports happen to uh, boom, we need a boosters club, then a club would be formed. Okay. Um, you know, I always have to ask this question, and anytime somebody tells me about a charter school, I, I, and I just want clarification uh, on a couple of things. Uh, independent, dependent. So an independent charter school means it's directly funded. This mm -hmm. school would be directly funded. Dependent means that it's uh, a school of the district. Right. It has its own board. We have our own board. You, you know, know I'm asking this yeah. for clarification. Yeah, it's, right? It is an uh, independent charter school. Okay, so another clarifying question is uh, board oversight or no board oversight? We have a uh, nonprofit corporate board oversight of New Pacific School. Okay, are any of those board members here? Yes, uh, Dr. Rex Fortune is our president of the board, okay. uh, who is part of the uh, uh, Fortune family and also uh, founder of uh, Project, uh, Project Pipeline, which was a, an instrumental uh, uh, teacher uh, training program. Uh, he also was a superintendent in Center Unified as well as Inglewood. He also was a deputy superintendent of the state of California, CD under, um, I can't remember the superintendent, Wilson, uh, Mr. Wilson Riles. Okay. Thank you. So Thank that's, you, the only, that's the only board member that you have. Representing You're representing the board. Okay. Thank you. Um, there may be another stand up question real soon um, coming forth. Um, so, my God, I mean, I have so many questions <laughs> for you, it's not even funny. Um, I, I don't know, and they talked a little bit about our teachers and uh, if there was a teacher shortage, so from what I'm hearing, there's not, um, right? Okay. Um, where are you gonna find those, those teachers? I mean, do you have some that are waiting? Are you doing any recruiting? If you are doing recruiting, what kind of recruiting are you doing? Well, I know for sure I have interested teachers that are here right now. If you're interested in teaching at, at New Pacific School, could you please stand up? Thank you. Okay, great. Got three, all right, um, that works. Um, let's see. So we talked about behavior and you know, there's, I, I guess, you know, you would take any child in whether or not they have behavior issues, correct? Uh, we take every single student that applies. Okay, okay. And fits through the lottery. Gotcha on that. So if, let's say we had a student that continued to misbehave and there are no supports for them, what do you do with that student? Uh, thank you for the question. So certainly we expect project, uh, leader of me 
as a baseline that the students will learn how to self-regulate and self-monitor. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of having a school where uh, every classroom has two adults who work full time in the classroom, one adult would be able to work with that student and de-escalate that student's behavior. And beyond that, we also have counseling on campus. And so we'll have other individuals who will be able to support that student. And finally, every single employee on the campus is trained in Leader and Me. And so by doing that, everyone will be speaking the same language. And the language of, it's really the language of love and the language of compassion and the language of accountability, which is what the kids will learn. Okay, so let me get this right. You will have two adults in each class. Yes. All right. Um, I'm pretty sure, Mr. President, I've, I'm going to actually uh, ask a couple more questions. You'll have more opportunity during the discussion. Will, uh, okay, I just yeah. wanted to make sure because I actually want to hear public participation yeah. as well. Yeah, right um, after this, we won't go into discussion. Okay, so you'll have uh, thank you, Mr. Keefe. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Reed. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions for both uh, staff and Mr. Kiefer. Um, so looking through the, the staff, uh, analysis, uh, it's broken down into different sections. One section is areas considered deficient, uh, and then, uh, it goes on to speak about areas that are, uh, considered significantly deficient. So, um, I guess my first question for staff is, is there anything in the areas that were deemed deficient? that couldn't be easily rectified. I, I believe that most of them could be, I believe that most of them could be easily rectified. However, the recommendation would be that there would be an agreement, um, that the approval would be uh, conditional upon agreement to those terms and having those areas actually remediated. So for example, just using governance structure as an example, um, the committees that Dr. Kiefer referred to, because those committees are required under, under law, they would be Brown Act meetings. And so we would really want to make sure that the Brown Act requirements are documented within the petition um, regarding uh, the credentialing. The credentialing requirement, which I actually think was one of the ones that was significantly deficient, but we felt like could be corrected. But the, the concern right now is that we actually have a disagreement about what the credentialing requirement is in what our staff findings are in the report and what Pacific Charter reported in their uh, response. And so as the authorizer, we would want to make sure that before we ha approved the agreement that we actually had an understanding on what the credentialing requirement is. Okay. Um, and, and I think in the area, and, and I'm in uh, number two on page five of the staff report, the area is considered deficient. Um, I mean, some of these seem to be uh, th that if we had more time, uh, meaning the state hadn't imposed a 90 day uh, time period for uh, the board to make an up or down decision. Um, some of these seem like they could probably have been answered by, by a back and forth phone calls uh, for, to confirm or uh, at the very least um, asking for uh, additional documentation that would address the concern. But, but the, 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 the time frame and the, the process that the state is forcing the board to operate in uh, creates restrictions for that type of back and forth. Is that, is that fair? <laughs> I, I think to some extent that's true. However, the petition itself was just incomplete. And so to have a back and forth to say, this isn't in your petition when it just should have been complete to begin with. Okay. Um, so I want to dive into a couple of these. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert at, at charter schools, um, uh, and I'm sure staff and, and the board is, are learning a lot in this process. This is the first application that we've had. Um, but under uh, governance structure, um, it was indicated that one of the deficiencies is that there wasn't a clear description of the flexibility and level of autonomy of New Pacific School um, from the Pacific Charter Institute. Is that a requirement 
under state law that there has to be a clearly defined autonomy or is that something that we just would like to see? Well, and that's that was clarified in the response that we received from Pacific Charter because Pacific Charter School does not have its own school board. They, they really are under the umbrella of Pacific Charter Institute. So the school board is actually Pacific Charter Institute. But there again, that that's where the concern for me comes in regard in regard to the committees, because it looks like a lot of the decisions for the school are going to be made by parent committees. And so that's why it's really important to assure that they're Brown Act meetings. Okay, so so it's okay that they're um, the level of autonomy is, is not um, necessarily with the, the school versus the, the, the institute. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I just, you know, I, 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 when I thought about that, um, you know, I, I kind of questioned myself, well, do FCUSD, our, our 34 schools, have autonomy from, um, from, from us? And, and they don't. They, they all report back up to us as well. So, all right. Um, the next question I had is, um, uh, it says a clear delineation of roles and responsibilities of parent councils, advisory committees, or other supporting groups. So the concern is whether they will have um, parent councils. Is that the concern? They, they will. And in the, the response that we received, they, there was more clarification regarding the parent committees. And so we received two responses from Pacific Charter. So about in early October, around October 8th, we received a packet of information, which was about 50 plus pages. And within that packet was the, the more description about the committees. So, so actually this, this back and forth, even though it wasn't a formal, you know, part of the process is starting to answer some of those questions. It occurred. We, yeah. we got a supplemental pa packet on or about October 8th. Uh, there was a subsequent request for a, a SELPA document that was provided even after that time. And there was also a meeting where Dr. Huber, Mr. Barton and I sat down with Dr. Kiefer and a, a fiscal representative. Okay. Um, it, it did, uh, again, reference, and I, uh, my, my fellow board member, Mr. Hoover, you know, asked the question about transportation, but that was identified as, as a, a deficiency, even though um, it's not required by state law. What, no, it's what, not required by state law, but one of the things that there's this, this impression that, that Pacific Charter is putting out is that our Rancho Cordova schools offer less than our Folsom schools when in fact there are in many cases more opportunities in Rancho Cordova and at our schools where we have problems with chronic absenteeism we are transporting students to those schools so there are many more bus routes in Rancho Cordova than there are Folsom. We also took into consideration the safety concerns so you may recall there was a, a a, a student who passed away who was killed by a light rail train and and we took that into consideration and we don't have students we offer transportation where students have to cross railroad tracks so those are some of the other concerns regarding the safety and, and transportation and the proposed location for the the current proposed location um do do fcusd part-time employees are they in the state retirement system Yes, they are. Yes. Okay. Um, so is there disagreement on the signatures or has that been resolved? That's been resolved. That's been resolved. Okay. Um, special education. There is a, a, a good amount of staff analysis about um, special education and, and uh, specifically, I guess it's page 10, second paragraph under special education, that the petition does not describe how special education services will be provided consistent with SELPA plan and or policies and procedures, nor includes a fiscal allocation plan in alignment with SELPA uh, new school uh, 
uh, SELPA New Pacific School plans to join. Did, uh, did I understand that they, they are currently affiliated with three SELPAs? Is that what I heard earlier? I, I think that was Mr. Dr. Kiefer. Yeah, there's Twin Rivers. Lodi Unified and El Dorado County, uh, the Charter SELPA in El Dorado County. Okay, so, so but, but oh, I see, but, uh, SELPA has not been identified for this school. There has. So, so we would not be the SELPA. Mm -hmm. We would, they would not fall under our SELPA for special education services. New Pacific School would work under the El Dorado County. Uh, El Dorado County actually has two SELPAs. They have an El Dorado County SELPA and they have an El Dorado County CHELPA, which is the SELPA for charter schools, mm -hmm. essentially. And there's nothing that's uh, inappropriate with them working with, with that SELPA, correct? No, they can they can choose the the SELPA under which they want to operate. So does staff any longer have concerns regarding special education though? Yes, and because and also because as the authorizing charter, we would we would still be responsible for some oversight, and uh, we still do not have a, a clear description of the services that will be provided and the continuum of services. And so there has been some back and forth, and my concern is that. I've been provided documents, but when I look at what the El Dorado County MOU says, the El Dorado County MOU says that Pacific Charter School will be responsible for the services, which which they are. There's there's agreement on that, but Pacific Charter School says that the MOU spells out what the services will be. And so really what I would like to see is a clear description of the services and an assurance that the full continuum of services will be provided by the by Pacific School. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, Mr. Kiefer. Uh, can you, well, first of all, let me just confirm. You're looking to start operations in August 2022. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, can you uh, tell us um, how did you decide on your educational focus and, and why? Um, and, and I actually have a follow-up question, but if you could uh, indicate how you, you came to that decision. Uh, we at Pacific Charter Institute have become acutely aware of uh, the mental health condition of students deteriorating. Uh, it's been widely, widely reported uh, for the last two years, uh, EdSource, CalMatters, you name the publication, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, they're all talking about it. And we said, how can we be part of the solution? And so that's how we determined that the social emotional learning would be the base. And then we already do project-based learning and, and an open environment in the model that we have. And we wanna do that same model in a classroom. And so everything we do really well in the field, we know we can do in the classroom. Well, I mean, why did you decide to focus in on absenteeism versus focusing in on project-based learning? In my view, project-based learning isn't, an, isn't um, it's not for everybody. Um, but I think good mental health for kids is for everybody. And so for us, we wanted to target mental health first. And then we also, there's been a lot of talk about absenteeism. We believe students working in a collaborative environment using project-based learning as an all-day thing and not a piece of the day, we feel they're going to not only, and the data shows it, that they're going to not only be more engaged in school, but they're going to make sure they find a way to make sure they get to school. So if, if they're having a bad day, they're going to have a better day. At the end of every day, the students will do a recap on exactly what they were working on, what went well, and what they want to do better. And that information will go to the parents and to the principal and the teachers so the next morning they start the ground running. So it's a constant loop about self-evaluation and uh, really self-awareness. So absenteeism is a condition of disengagement. Tell me, so August 2022 is, is basically nine months away. Yes. And you don't have a lease yet. You don't know what the facility will require for build out. You don't have the furniture, you don't have the employees yet. Um, there seems to be a lot of things that 
would need to take place in a very short time between now, assuming uh, the, the school board approves it tonight, and August of 2022. How confident are you that you're going to be able to accomplish that in such a very short period of time? Uh, I'm 100% confident. We have the full weight of Pacific Charter Institute behind it. We have, um, we're running it, uh, we have all the employees we need uh, currently. So even during the, the pandemic, we've been capable of uh, being an attractive place to work. So we know if we post for this job, we'll get the very best people who will wanna work there. We're confident through the real estate, the, the expertise of our, our broker and his ability to work with uh, contractors and designers and, and, and developers that he will be able to get us into the building. And as far as chairs and things yeah. of that nature, certainly, uh, once again, I mean, yeah, I know there's a, there's a supply issue coming off the ocean, but uh, we're confident if we buy locally, we will outfit the, the classrooms for 90 students. How, uh, I mean, I guess my question is, how can you be so confident that you can meet the time frame when you don't even have the location? This whole thing has been a difficult march. And so I, there's been nothing but headwinds in this. It's been very difficult. And to me, that part of the equation is, is, is one that uh, we'll work tirelessly to, to make sure we can make it happen. And um, at the, the, least, the least best solution would be in, in charter school law, we could ask for a one year extension to open, but our goal is not to ask for that. Our goal is to open in, in August. Does the one year extension in the law uh, eat into the five year renewal period or is that push the renewal period to I, six years? I think that's negotiated. I think if, if uh, we came to you in March and said, you know what, the facility is not gonna be ready. We can also open as late as September 30th. So we actually have a longer window than what we provide as a calendar. So if we, all, we would come to you and let you know our calendar has been adjusted, we're gonna push into uh, more of June in order to make sure that we can uh, open the doors. Okay. Um, Mr. President, is it uh, appropriate to ask our legal counsel a question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, my question for legal counsel is, uh, is it a requirement under state law that, that a physical address be included in the application? Do we even have the ability to approve an application that doesn't have a physical address? So good evening. Uh, the Charter Schools Act requires identification of a single location. Um, understanding that at this point it's always perspective, but it does require an identification of, of at least one location within the jurisdiction of the board in which the charter school would be located. So in this instance, we don't have a physical address. I will defer to staff and or Dr. Kiefer to confirm whether it's a physical address or a, or a general location, but there should be identification of a single site. Uh, Mr. Kiefer, do we have that? It, certainly. It, we Excuse you. me. Excuse me. We identified a site, but it's not the optimal site, but we have a site identified on Kilgore, which I think most of you are aware of, that we have put into the petition, but we hope to find a better site. Where would your optimal site be if you could uh, find a, a location? North of 50. North of 50. Yep. That's our optimal. And so we've met the law regarding having a site identified, but uh, we are trying to reach, we wanna make it easier for the students that we're trying to reach, the target students. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. President, that's all the questions I have okay. for right now. You, you have the opportunity during discussion to ask more, so. Okay, Mr. Hui. Just a few questions. Uh, I think probably for Mr. Martin, I'll put you on the spot. If, if we can go to the slide that has the financial information as well, that might be helpful. I think maybe it's page 11 or 12 of the staff report from tonight. Uh, but I can start with the questions before we get there. Uh, so Mr. Martin, I, I, first question would be, uh, would a current FCUSD student who is chronically absent generate less funding for the district than a student who has perfect attendance? Yes. Okay. Uh, the numbers that we used were based off of a projection of 95% attendance to enrollment, which is our average for our Rancho Cordova campuses. Okay. Um, and then just for note, the new Pacific Charter 
was uh, budgeting at a 97% uh, attendance to enrollment ratio. They, um, they were, they're budgeting for 97%. If I'm understanding this correctly though, we our projections are based off of what our average attendance is though, though if new Pacific charter brought in the students they wanted to bring in, we would be losing chronically absent students. So actually our percent that that's the percentage would be a little bit different. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, thank you. And so the last question then would just be the percentages that we're seeing here and we can base it off of the hundred percent enrollment. Um, I'm seeing that the number for each year, but I'm curious, what's the percentage of expected revenues that would be lost under the scenarios in the staff report? So the percentage of revenue, correct? A, the a, yeah, total the, LCFF funding is that rather right? than the the raw numbers on the paper here. Yeah, how would that work out as a percentage of our expected district budget? Sure. It it well, I would have to do the numbers quickly for you on the top of my head, but um, figuring that we have about twenty thousand students, um, you'd be looking at. Uh, half of a percent. Okay. So it, it would account for 0.5% of our expected district budget at the 100% enrollment figure. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Alice. Um, yeah, I have a few questions for Mr. Kiefer. Um, so I know you mentioned that the location um, displayed was just tentative, but how was that chosen? Like, so, our goal is to find a location that's zoned correctly and also would be able to meet the building code. And so that location met those criteria. And so our goal would be to find a similar location, a similar space that would be closer to our target uh, area uh, that would also meet the zoning um, and, or, and the building, of course. And have those like been looked into in locations that are more optimal? Yes, and uh, we actually, our, our real estate person is here who can speak to more detail of what he's uncovered. And, uh, and with the, uh, because of the pandemic, there's a lot of fluidity in, in facilities where people are checking out and going out of business or they're downsizing or any number of, and so it creates more opportunities for us to find a space that would be location better. So if, um, so if the like location hasn't been found yet or like a better location, is it likely that one will be found? So my experience is we're going to keep pursuing the Kilgore space as we're looking for a better space. And so we'll be putting revenues towards planning and things of that nature to make sure that um, we stay on course. But if in fact we are unable to find a space and able to get into it, we would let the district know that we're definitely going to be in that space for uh, a period of time. A similar situation occurred in um, Citrus Heights where the school, the charter school was not able to move into its in initial site. So they were in a site that was away from where they wanted to be. And then uh, because they were going to build their school. And so it took, they're still in the process of building it. So it takes a couple of years, but they too were targeting students in the area community that they were seeking to enroll. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I was wondering, cause you mentioned like mental health was something that PCI or, um, was really pursuing. Is there um, any supports that you guys provide that the district doesn't? Yeah, so the district certainly provides mental health support. The question is um, both uh, frequency and, uh, and how much is it meshed into the culture of the school. I can't speak to Folsom, Folsom Cordova, but I can speak to uh, New Pacific School Every day, the students will be engaged in a way that allows them to have a better mental health perspective for themselves. And all the pieces of Leader and Me all relate to their ability to uh, build better, better confidence and better, better self-awareness and increase their, their, their own personal self-worth of how they perceive themselves. And in terms of like any professionals or like uh, actual mental health specialists, are those provided? Uh, they certainly are. So uh, do we have any uh, PCI school psychologists here? So we have school psychologists. Um, we have counselors. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have a few questions and then we're going to go out to the public. Uh, question, so just bear here. We're going to start soon. 
I have some questions for you, uh, Dr. Kiefer. Has um, new specific schools have a petition in other district and have they been approved? Uh, that petition is still uh, in the, it's prior to the public hearing. Which district? Uh, I have to get, uh, Roseville Joint Union High School District. So it's in process right now? Yes, it is. Okay, so if that does get approved, then you're going to have issues with staffing and all that too also, right? No. No? Okay. It's in a different part of, of, this, of the community. It's in Placer County. Okay. The other questions. Uh, do you have specific, and just yes or no, um, experience on in-classroom yes. operating a full-blown K-12 through school? In, in, you mean a site-based program? Site-based, in-classroom, have you, your, you know, your institute have specific, have done that? Do they have specific experience? No. That includes all your operations. Have you done that before? Not in our, our operations, no. So you do not have, okay. Um, have you worked with the city of Rancho? I know there's not a location, but they do have usually city staff Planning can work on targeted buildings, and they usually will give you what's compatible with zoning code, building codes, and everything else. Have you worked with the city on a preliminary use permit in those areas to target south of or north of 50 and in this area? Have you even had the dialogue with the city? So our, I would defer to our real estate broker because he's, he's working with his people that do that work as well. So... I wouldn't be able to directly speak to how, what their contact has been with the city itself. So you don't know? I, I don't. He would okay. know. All right. Um, I think the question about independent and dependent was asked earlier. Thank you. Um, but I do want to embellish a little bit on the governance structure. D is it the committee, I, I know one of your board members here, uh, are there, they're not elected officials. Would that be considered loss of local control with uh, taxation without representation because you use local control and the folks here are elected by the community and from the areas that hold everybody accountable for uh, the tax money and everybody, the parents, everybody else to provide the service. Does that committee, are, are they gonna, similar to that or are they different? So they're different because we're a school of choice. We have to actually match the needs of the parents for them to want to be enrolled versus compulsory education of traditional education where families are, are uh, assigned what schools they go to, either within a district or within a boundary area of a school. Uh, so in regards to our board, our board and, and our organization follow, we are registered with the state of California, the Secretary of State, mm -hmm. and we are a nonprofit corporation and also a 501c3. So we're accountable to both our charter and to our federal documents establishing us as a corporation. Mm -hmm. So, so what I'm hearing is that these committees are local parent committees that come from the community. Is that correct? I'm not sure what you're referring to. You're, you're saying that these are... Are you talking about our school board? Yeah, our, our school board. Our, our, our board. Our the board, trustees. and then the governance structure will use committees, I said, parents from the community, correct? So committees would be at the local level at the school. At the local level. Yes. So can I have a question for the audience? Anybody that comes from Rancho Cordova... That is a parent that has a high aptitude kid chronic in this audience right now. Please stand up. I see none. Okay. Um, I also want to see, there was a concern in there about the ag um, attorney general having concerns with conflict of interest with you being on the county board and then also versus how does that impact your decision making? It doesn't impact my decision making at all. And it doesn't actually affect my role being here in front of you. Okay. It, would that be considered a conflict right now that still might potentially impact this district? Yeah. So the Bonta ruling uh, from the Attorney General is suggesting, in his opinion, that a sitting county school board member cannot, cannot also be leading a charter school. And so there's a handful of us in the state, and so it's a targeted decision that he's put down. But it is, uh, as I said, it's an opinion. 
even if that were in place, my choice wouldn't be between being here in front of you. It would be whether I would continue to sit on the school board or my career as a charter school leader. I've told my family, I don't know if we can live on $400 a month as, a, <laughs> as sitting on a school board. So probably I would have to default to being on um, the leader of the charter school, but that doesn't intertwine with my being here. Uh, from so, his, if the, from so his, if the board here denies it and it goes, the appeal will go next to the County Board of Education. Yes. What would you do? I'd have to recuse myself completely. Okay. okay. The other thing is, um, since, since you're on the board, would, would it in any way benefit you financially if you do get this approved? No, there's no financial incentive for me to be doing this work. When our board approved our ability to do site-based schools, okay. it was strictly for that work, okay. not for uh, any growth for me personally or any employee in the organization. Okay. Got a few more here. Um, safety. Do you have contracts like we do with the city on service resource officers? If you were talking about on-site tonight, later, does you have on-site safety procedures and policy in place like campus monitor safety staff, active shooter plans in place that we do have likely that we do? Yeah, we provided our safety plan to the district. And so it's for our existing schools. We provided that. Uh, with a site-based school, it would have a more uh, robust safety plan that would be created and in place prior to opening of the school. In regards to safety officers, the goal would be not needing a safety officer, but certainly we would look into it if, if it deemed. Mm -hmm. uh, we would already use protocols like uh, being buzzed in, so safety of internally and mm -hmm. things of that nature. Okay. Other one is the signature requirement, the percentage you talked about teachers versus parent signatures on, how many did we have that were parents from that area you're targeting on the signature requirements, maybe that's for us or you, but how many are the parents? I, I, did, I don't percentage have wise, you yeah, just mentioned you had four teachers, but. I don't um, have a calculation on, on where they live. I did, we didn't scattergram it. We, but aren't you targeting? Those, we are, those, and, and we you don't know. We targeted where, to get signatures, you have to be in a place where we got most of our signatures was at the Walmart on, on Folsom Boulevard, which is in, this, this, in that community. And so the signatures we, we were able to get were at that location. We also got signatures at the soccer fields over us. Skoda, right. we got, I mean, there's a variety of places where we were able to, to get the signatures. Are you aware Walmart has an Amtrak right there, or the uh, transit system they drop off? There's a lot of people that shop at Walmart that are not from Rancho Cordova. Every, every, a large percentage. every signature is someone who is interested in the school by statute and also uh, sign their name to it, and also get the number of students they'd been interested in attending our school. So, so you don't really know the demographics of the parent signatures? It's not required by law. Not required by law. Okay, thank you. Um, chronic apticism, you said you used the data, was it 2018 or 2019? Then you mentioned later, in the last two years, you've been noticing a lot of apticism engagement. This is during COVID times. We have witnessed class, you know, uh, California and actually the nation, about a 30% across the board, across no matter where you're from, from disengagement and absenteeism due to COVID and quarantine, and especially with the lady that spoke here earlier. She said in Spanish that they, those parents have to work. They're essential workers. So with those parents, what she said there is that they're not able to provide that type of extra support in the house. How, how, in a, how are you going to be able to support folks like them that are essential workers and that are due to the COVID related things, how are you targeting those folks? Those are prime families for us because they're the families that they know when they go to work, their, their children will have an absolutely fantastic education and all the, all the things they need locally, we will be able to put in place. We don't know what those things are and we know what we provide in the petition will establish what's gonna happen in the classroom every day, all day. What happens before school and after school, we, wanna, we are aware of what we may need to build, but we have to know what our family's needs are before we build it. Mm -hmm. And we can build it fastly, fast. Okay. Uh, the cap, 
I know we're talking about incremental growing for the first three years, but you don't talk about the ultimate cap by state law is what, 1250? And you're also talking going to a high school. What, yeah, I know last time I asked, you said we don't vision to be very bigger, but the potential can be you can go 1250 all the way to 12. So uh, in the fifth year, it potentially can be all the way to a complete 1250. 1250 um, students? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Well, the, I mean, the, the uh, law in fact, says the you, numbers they yeah. said, well, th there's no law on caps. Okay. So, any, so there's high school, charter schools that are 3,000 students. All so, right. um, But I think what, what's on the screen now shows what our growth pattern is. It wouldn't be smart for the families or the students to go outside of this growth pattern. It would make change in grade level spans, but our goal is this small school. So, so right now you're not thinking out for the fourth year and fifth year, you don't, you're not projecting to grow more than 350. Yeah, because we, we want enough to have enough students that would, that our single subject teachers could support okay. uh, in a way that, uh, yes. So the site that you're looking at is a fairly large facility. How many square feet is that? About? That particular site, we were looking at one half of that facility. Okay, because that's we like, talked with the, uh, the like 30,000 square feet or something. Yeah, I think we're looking at roughly... 15 to 20,000 square feet. Okay, but it's yeah. 30,000, I, I think. Yeah, so. so Potentially, we, you can expand to 30,000 double. Yeah, I mean, I would, you, would, you would know if things like that were happening because we would be reporting what's happening, mm -hmm. and then we wouldn't be doing it. I okay. mean, it's just, not, it's just not how we work. Okay, so you, you mentioned earlier you'd rather be a public school under this nonprofit. So are your employees that would be considered public employees because it's considered a public school not a private school all of our students uh are i'm sorry all of our teachers uh belong to stirs mm -hmm. and so whatever that category that is applied by the state of california that application also applies to our teachers okay okay that would be my only questions right now i'm going to uh, start the hearing thank you dr kiefer um how much time and yeah we're going to have two minutes per person we'll start off with the uh, a stack here. I did want to mention before we start the hearing that we had a huge stack. I don't know how many, but uh, the stack of opposition from the community, but they're not going to speak. Uh, we just, we're going to put it into the record. So uh, when you available. say the community, Mr. President, what do you, what do you mean? Well, you can look at these. They're, they're collected. Yeah, I, Mr. President, I'm wondering if during the public comment, if the board is privy to uh, look at those. I'm I could curious. pass them around, yeah, Thank I'll you. I'll just pass them by. You can take a look at them. Uh, Mr. President, I'm not sure I heard you. Are you saying you have opposition cards, but they're not here to speak? That's correct. We do, we do have people from the opposition. Oh, we do. So we do have some, but these are the ones okay. opting not just to go into the record. That's all. So, Excuse yeah. me, Rob Thomas, uh, CSEA. Um, CSEA, uh, as well as the F FC, uh, FCA, um, put those cards out to see okay. if, uh, to, to at, at the school sites to see what our, our folks at the school sites, most of the outreach was to employees, but some there are some parents also that signed those cards. Okay, and I'll pass it around, you guys can look at them. It's so are these, uh, have these been entered via the public comment process? They or is going, it just a stack that they was delivered? Be, yes. mm -hmm. w which is it? Yes, they'll be entered into the record. Be entered into, yeah, kind of like they, our they just have on. not yet. Right. Okay, so the public will not know who these individuals are. It's just like correct? these being. It'd be like the public standing up in right support here. of the school. This would sure, be but they're not here. So that's not what it's like. Some so maybe. so the public, I'm saying the public is not aware of who these individuals are, correct? They will once it goes to the record, like these folks. Okay, so, okay, so tonight on. they will not be made aware of who those are. Okay. It would have to be entered in, yes. Would, would you, when I have an opportunity to speak, would you like me to offer them to the school board at that time? Or what process would oh, you yeah. like in order to receive them? You, you can, you can do it at that time. Some of them are CSEA, some of them are FCEA, some of them are staff, some of them are parents. Maybe you could sort it in that manner and yeah. the names would be entered into the minutes, but we'd have an idea of the okay. numbers. I will, I will formally up. offer them to you at that time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We're gonna start the public hearing. Start with our first speaker, uh, Mr. David Sander.
Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, board members. I can tell you it's been a long time since I've stood at this podium. Yeah. <laughs> and Welcome. it also feels a little strange to be on this side of a dais. <laughs> uh, you know, my usual job is at the city on that side of the dais. So it brings me down here. But I, I'm really pleased to, to be here, to see how you run a meeting, and to uh, engage in this discussion. So on the topic of uh, charter school, this is not an easy decision, I suspect, for anyone. Um, I can tell you generally I'm in support of the ideas around charter schools. I'm generally supportive of the idea. And on the surface, you might think that Ranch Cordova could be a good place for a charter school to locate. We definitely have some schools that are challenged, and we have many parents in our community who seek education elsewhere, elsewhere outside of those internal schools in Ranch Cordova, those internal public schools. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't know what the most recent count is. You might be able to, to ascertain it. But we've got an awful lot of students in Ranch Cordova who transfer to Folsom schools and actually attend school here in Folsom. And so we're divided from our community. And that is a, that is a big deficit for us as a community. Um, we also, in Ranch Cordova, this is not your problem, but in the Elk Grove Unified School District, we have parents who are driving an hour each way to get to a middle school. Because there is no middle school in our growth area, because the Elk Grove School District, unlike your district, is quite behind in building adequate facilities. So there's a facility gap. There's no high school, there's no middle school, and we have an excess of, I think it's approaching 20,000 people living in those uh, growth areas. So it's not a reasonable uh, option for them. But as I said, it's a, it's a challenging situation for Ranch Cordova. I am familiar with a lot of the, the factors that cause kids to be uh, absentees at, at school, and I'm worried that this particular application doesn't deal with those, although that appears to be the, the focus. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of issues that need to be tackled. I think our public schools are well positioned to do that. I'm not sure that charters are really able to touch that absenteeism number. So I view this as a high risk um, operation for Ranch Cordova. It's an untested charter operator in the sense that they haven't run a full school before. We don't have a transportation solution. And as I mentioned, as a city leader, delicate situation, we have concerns about the site. So with that said, thank you very much for your time and I appreciate your good work here. Thank you, David. It's good to see you. Next speaker is Garrett. Gatewood, please. All right. This is weird. So weird. All right. My name is Garrett Gatewood. I am the mayor of Rancho Cordova. So first of all, uh, thank you for all your thankless job you guys do. My board members are amazing. You guys are, are beacons in our city. I'd also like to thank the staff for a thorough uh, analysis of the, of the proposed charter school. The staff's findings are clear and indicate the charter school specific has not demonstrated that they are a target to support the students of Rancho Cordova or could serve the interests of our community. The school board is elected by the voters of Rancho Cordova and also think that the charter school is not a good fit. If you can't convince one of my board members from my city or a majority of them, then this is a bad fit for my city. The school district needs to operate in a partnership between the representatives of both cities and not do one city that places the entity into my city. Ultimately, the voters of both cities are the ones that make this decision. The school board members are elected by Folsom should defer to the members of Rancho Cordova when talking about sitting a facility into the city of Rancho Cordova. I strongly earn you to support the recommendations, of course, of your staff and the recommendations of the school board members of Rancho Cordova. They know what's best for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Next one is Janelle Rulli. Good evening, board members and superintendent. My name is Janelle Rooley. I am an attorney with the Law Offices of Young, Mini, and Core. We represent more than half of the charter schools in the state, and I'm certainly proud to be here tonight on behalf of New Pacific School. This new charter option will provide really a terrific opportunity for, this, for students who so desperately deserve it. I wanted to address one of the findings from the district staff that somehow an opinion from the attorney general is a reason for denial of this charter. It is not. An attorney general opinion is just that, an opinion. It is not mandatory, it is not law, it is not regulation. Moreover, the opinion in question is not a reason to deny the charter. 
There are eight reasons why a charter can be denied. This opinion does not implicate any of those eight. Uh, first, it does not render the educational program unsound. Second, it does not invalidate any of the petition signatures. Third, it does not diminish um, any of the legally required affirmations. Fourth, it does not take away from the reasonably, uh, reasonably comprehensive uh, descriptions. Fifth, it does not impact um, the exclusive public school employer statement. Sixth, it has nothing to do with serving the interests of the community. Seventh, it's unrelated to the district's financial position. And last, the opinion has no bearing on whether the, whether the petitioners are demonstrably likely to successfully implement the charter petition. There's simply no legal authority to deny the charter based on the contents of this opinion. We serve as legal counsel for Pacific Charter Institute. We've heard nothing from the county about this. Uh, no changes that are needed based on this. The opinion does not carry the force of law. If it does, you heard Dr. Kiefer say that he would make a really difficult decision if that does become law. So we urge you to set this aside as part of your decision-making practice. And I also just want to lodge a lot of concerns about these, this like stack of anonymous complaints. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker is Dominic Quilco. Hi, good evening, school board. My name is Dominic Guaco. I'm the labor relations representative who works with our chapter here in Folsom, Cordova. It's my great privilege to work with your incredible classified staff. Um, I wanted to come here today again to urge you to reject this petition. As several board members have noted, uh, there's a lot of missing pieces in this petition. Mr. Reed correctly pointed out, as we talk about facilities, equipment, there's a lot of missing pieces there. But as Ms. Wessinger pointed out, we're also talking about missing uh, details on the special education supports, uh, transportation. There's no mention of the McKinney-Vento Act in the petition as well. And those are also concerns. So finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about the great relationship that CSEA and the district have and how we've collaborated uh, over the last few months, right? We are your partner in this district to support our students. Uh, part of AB 86, which was a school reopening bill, uh, brought about $400 million uh, into school budgets to expand paraeducator services. Here we worked with Don and his team to bring about uh, $1 million in to expand paraeducator services to support our students. Uh, if we lose uh, funding, that'll uh, mean a loss of supports for our kids. Uh, so again, I wanna appreciate the district uh, and all that you do, urge you to deny this petition. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Roboto. Uh, Superintendent board members, good evening. Welcome, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm here to actually answer any question from Ms. Uh, Betty Jo about special ed, um, any specifics you wanna know regarding what New Pacific would offer as far as special education to the continuum of services. So if you have any specific questions, you know, feel free. I do say that um, it is unique. We both work in traditional districts where a SELPA was responsible for a continuum of services within that SELPA. Oftentimes schools within the El Dorado uh, Charter SELPA, the school itself is responsible for providing that continuum. It doesn't mean that that school will have to have that continuum of services in that school. So we've worked with many kids where we had to place kids in non-public schools. We've had to find more intensive services for kids. We've even had to place kids back in their own home district um, for a, a program that was offered there that we couldn't offer. So everything is individualized. Uh, we offer comprehensive services. And I would say in this program being so small, we will not have numbers to say, you know, what would be typical of most schools where they have larger special day classes, uh, you know, certain types of classes that we just wouldn't have the numbers, but individual needs come first and all of our decisions are based on the students and their individual needs. So uh, to, to get to your point, we offer all the services uh, compared to any other school in the state. Uh, we're good at what we do. As he said, we've been to one fair hearing, one, again, it wasn't a, a FAPE issue, but we handled it well um, in 16 years. And I think our relationships with our parents and our students um, is first and foremost. 
And I think the offering for the general ed um, services that we're going to offer is going to um, really um, be the forefront of every kid that um, attends our school, whether receiving special ed services or not. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Wrench. And after Susan, it'll be uh, Anna. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Ranch Cordova. Been here since 1975. I went to Walnut Wood, Cordova Lane, Mitchell, Cordova. I am now a um, employee of the school district. I have had four children go through the um, schools here. I've had one child or one granddaughter that is now at Mitchell Middle School. I'm concerned about um, what they're asking. They're talking about absenteeism. My youngest daughter was one of those cases of absenteeism. I don't know what this school is offering that would have helped my daughter to be able to to continue. I know um, our school district offered Kenny High School and she made progress there until she got pregnant and that she made progress at Walnut Wood, which was another support that this school district does offer. Um, I'm concerned about their targeting of um, social disadvantaged um, families because at this point, I'm concerned because as one of the board members asked about is any of the parents here of kids that are chronically absent from school here to discuss it, that, are, that want to go to the school, and I don't see that population here. I work with those kids because I work with the kids that come in one day a week and I don't see that their families are here, and I hope that this is addressed. Thank you. Anna? And after Anna, be Victoria. Um, hi, my name is Anna Rorba. I'm assuming you didn't want to say my last name because it's not easy, but nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, your role is to be a voice for the children and parents in this district. Part of your role is to take into consideration suggestions from the district staff. However, they are, not are, they are not elected to represent us or make the decisions on issues. You are. As stated by the California School Board Association, you were elected to make decisions that will best serve all the students in the community you serve. CSBA also states clearly, the role of the school board is to ensure that school districts are responsive to the values, beliefs, and priorities of their communities. Boards fulfill this role by performing five major responsibilities, setting direction, establishing an effective and efficient structure, providing support, ensuring accountability, and last but not least, providing community leadership as advocates for the children. It can use, continues to state that these five responsibilities represent core functions that are so fundamental to a school system's accountability to the public that they can only be performed by an elected governing body, you. This charter school fulfills those responsibilities. Student achievement in Rancho Cordova continues to lag behind the rest of the district. If you don't choose to take accountability for this and seek to change it, then who will? If you don't raise the bar in those areas that need it most, you are actually, lo actually lowering the expectations for the rest of the district. This isn't a zero sum decision. If those that can't don't, then who will? If you don't choose to give kids the opportunity or choices to learn in, a different, in different environments, they will continue to fall behind. If you don't choose to provide better opportunities for those who need it most, you are essentially lowering your expectation of their ability to grow. If you don't vote yes, you are act actively choosing to grow the divide within your own school district. No one wants that. As a parent and taxpayer, we want you to innovate, grow, and continue not just be not to just be perceived as a great school district, but to take actions that will continue to make us win. Giving Rancho Cordova the opportunity to create another high quality educational environment that has proven to work raises the output, not just for the community, it raises it, yeah. it resides in, but the entire district. Please vote yes. Okay, thank you. Victoria? And after Victoria be 
David Shrimp. Hello, I'm a parent here in Rancho Cordova, and I work also as a secretary for board of directors for a local preschool that my daughter attends in which she'll be enrolled within um, our public school district within the coming year. So during this time, you know, parents at, in my position um, look into the schools that our children will be attending. And during this time, um, my partner, who also works at Mercy Folsom Hospital and attended a Chamber of Commerce uh, dinner in Folsom, when they had a discussion about the school district. What, that school, what they said was that the best private school education you're gonna get is a public school in Folsom. They didn't say about the Cordova, Rancho Cordova, they said it in Folsom. What we would like is to have that same standard. We want people to that same half, that same standard to be in Rancho Cordova as it is in Folsom. I'm just here to have, say yes for a choice and having options for our education to meet that same standard that we have in Folsom. Thank you. And David, are you here? David Trim. Okay. No, see him. Okay. Next would be Natalie um, Unschill. Natalie. Seeing none. Move on to Janelle Ruley. I already spoke. Okay. Move on to Chris Limon. Good evening, Mr. President and the board members. Thank you for having me. My name is Chris Lemon. I'm a father of two kids, uh, ages five and eight, and I live nearby in Fair Oaks. I'm also a commercial real estate broker and manager of the area's third largest commercial real estate company called Newmark. I specialize in charter facilities. To date, I've completed over 1 million uh, square feet of charter facilities up and down the state of California. Current and past clients include John Adams Academy, Rockland Academy, Placer Academy, and Pacific Charter Institute, and several others. I've been working with New Pacific School for several months, helping them find and negotiate their potential new facility. We have focused on properties in the district that would be a suitable retrofit and have ample and safe play area for students. Ideally, the school would find, uh, ideally the school would find a location in the district north of Highway 50, but we haven't found one in that area yet. Our current target is a nice shell that would lend itself nicely to an educational facility retrofit. While working on the current school facility, we continue to look, as Dr. Kiefer noted, each week in case a better option opens in the ideal target area. We're also looking for land for a long-term option. I endorse the response noted on page nine of Dr. Kiefer's response, uh, where it noted that the signing a lease prior to charter approval is not fiscally responsible. It's also worth noting in response to the staff report that the current proposed facility has actively been marketed for several years. I know this because my company markets it. Um, also in response to the staff report, uh, I have worked to build schools that have signed leases um, and commenced build out up to June of the desired school year. <laughs> we definitely don't want to do that, um, but it is possible and it has happened before. Uh, we have engaged a well-known educational experienced architect and project manager and very confident in our timeline. Um, happy to answer any of the questions you guys might have and uh, thank you very much for the time. Okay. Mar Mara. Gabriel. Is that Marwa? I think she spoke already. Oh, you spoke? You spoke, okay. Marina. Robert Thomas. Good evening, school board members. Um, I wanted to formally present to you about 200 signature cards from staff and parents expressing their desire that the school board deny the charter school petition. These are not public comments. These are simply cards expressing that opinion to the board. Um, also, um, I intended to um, make several points uh, in, the, in support of the denial of the petition. The first two had to change because during the process of the presentation, I found out that we do not have a location, not that we don't have a, 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 a when I thought um, I would start with is that the location is unsuitable. At this point, we don't even have a location. Um, so um, the second issue of transportation 
And the fact that they don't have transportation is also a big question mark because we don't know where those children would be transported to. So um, those, those present a great deal of uncertainty on about this petition and about how the execution of the implementation of the school would actually work. There's a lot of details there to be sorted out. Um, Pacific Charter has never operated a classroom-based school. Of course, they aspire to become a great classroom-based school. However, we do provide great classroom-based instruction. That is exactly what we do in our district. Um, we at Falls Cordova have better academic outcomes. Um, we are fully equipped to serve our students. We have the infrastructure, we have the students already in place. Um, so the fundamental question before you is, do you believe that your teachers, your administrators, and your staff are better suited to serve our students or PCI, which has never provided uh, classroom-based instruction? Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Angelica? And after Angelica B. Candice. Thank you. Well, I want to preface my remarks this evening by saying that FCEA is not anti-charter, nor are we saying that New Pacific Schools does not provide a good learning experience for their students. The real issue is, are they a fit for our district by bringing programs that FCUSD is lacking? I don't believe that they meet that metric, and as a result, we fully support staff's recommendation to deny the petition. The programs pr proposed by New Pacific Charter are replicating existing programs in our district, and there is no evidence that they would be more successful at implementing these programs. FCUSD has a history of bringing new and innovative learning experiences to our students. As recently as last year, we developed Innovations Academy to serve our students who did not choose to return to the traditional school environment. Several years ago, we brought the IB program to Cordova High, again based on families' desires to have this option for their children. We also have a strong, CT, strong CTE programs with many options from agriculture to engineering to marketing and more. Project Lead the Way has been in our schools for years now. Riverview STEM Academy focuses on that experience, and Riverview is not a neighborhood school, but is open to all students in our communities without an application process who want to focus on a STEM education. FCUSD has the longstanding relationships with our communities and families. Those strong relationships are critical to supporting families and encouraging attendance. FCUSD has developed attendance teams that follow up directly with families. Our team makes home visits with all the necessary supports to address attendance issues and ensure that students remain in school. Um, like Mr. Thomas, I'm skipping my next part because it was about the location and now we're discovering that, that there may not be a location as we originally thought. So I will skip that. Um, I'm just going to end by saying staff has done their due diligence and has done a thorough job in preparing their report. Please consider all the facts presented and follow the recommendation to deny the petition this evening. Thank you. Hang on, John. Candace? Can Candace? Thank you. After that, it'll be Alicia. Hi, members of the board. My name is Candace Kruger. I have been a parent of a student in the district for about four and a half years, and I've been a classified employee with the district for five. I ask that you deny the petition for PCI charter schools. I have a child enrolled in a charter school within the district, uh, Folsom Cordova Community Charter, and they offer the personalized education plans for students as well. Our district offers and, and practices the social emotional learning. Um, on top of that, PCI does not have any track record of operating a classroom-based school. And we, and we already have everything that they claim that they're going to be offering. We, we already offer it. So why are we gonna have more of the same? Um, I feel that Folsom Cordova is better equipped to serve the students PCI seeks to serve. And I urge you to deny the petition so that we can continue to serve our students at the level that we currently serve them now, or even potentially in the future better. Thank you, have a nice day. Thank you. Elisa? 
and after Lisa will be Romel. Hi, many of you know me. I'm Alyssa. I work as a paraeducator in your district. I substitute for STARS as a team assistant, and I have a child in this district. Our area could use a school, but I don't believe it's this charter school. It's not the answer to our problems, simply put. Many of our schools are impacted with student population growth, which I partially believe is due to a district that is doing things right. Part of doing things right has been assisting our district families who are struggling. With that said, the charter school may take 400 students, but there would not be ample transportation to the site. I go over in the proposed area a lot. There's no bus stop. Most of our kids in our STARS and ACES program, take your pick what you call it, they have a bus pass. They would not be able to get there. Their parents barely make it by the 6 p.m. pickup time. This, gar <coughs> this charter school has been known to be virtual, which as a parent distresses me beyond belief. To me, it's like they are going to take our kids and experiment on them. If the kids are failed by them, we would also be responsible for that failure by voting for the charter school. As a district, we constantly don't have the money for our current schools. If the charter school comes in, they will be taking part of that money away, which means layoffs for our current staff, who you recently have shown that you care. But the moment you vote yes, you're gonna show us that it was all just an act. I understand it sounds like a great idea with our current prompts, but what does it really mean for the future of education? It means we have decided it's okay to give up instead of fight, which is not a quality I want my child learning. Today is the charter school, tomorrow it's laying off workers. The choice is yours, but I ask you to say no to the charter school for your students, other parents, and your staff. Thank you. Romel. And after a will be Jennifer, and that'll be the last one. President Short, Dr. Kaligian, Board of Trustees, oh. my name is Romel Mabanta. Thank you for having me back. I'm the proposed founding principal of New Pacific School here in Rancho Cordova. I wanted to take a moment to highlight something that was in the petition. Uh, as Dr. Kiefer, he mentioned Leader in Me, which is one of the frameworks as social emotional learning. And I, uh, I remember having some questions about social emotional learning in our schools, in our existing schools, in our proposed school with New Pacific. Uh, one of the reasons that Dr. Kiefer brought me on is my experience with social emotional learning and my connection was with existing organizations who are committed to providing a culturally responsive social justice framework that is both neurologically, neurobiology, neurobiologically based uh, and we would be one of the first schools in the area to offer and introduce the Right Brain Institute. It's offered uh, by, uh, by both doctoral level counseling psychologists, social workers, and people who do the work every single day. Uh, if approved, one of the goals uh, from our proposal would be to have a deeper understanding of restorative practices and social emotional youth development, self-regulation, and building narratives around proven restorative outcomes. Staff will have, uh, we will be certified in level one, two, and three restorative practices with a trauma-informed scholar application specialization. We will have in-depth knowledge on how to help scholars process trauma accumulated before during and after the pandemic. We will also have in-depth knowledge on continuing on community building and circle proceedings. Our attendance plan also includes development of attendance systems and supports, monthly meetings with tier three, parent workshops and referrals, case management for ad promise. Also, we're in full compliance with the Brown Act all the time. We have someone whose job is all that is, is that, and that's her compliance. Uh, work is something that she does every day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, <coughs> that'll be our last insight. Now I think we have two virtual and Abby. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, so I am a resident of Rancho Cordova. I have actually had a student graduate from Cordova. I have one currently at Cordova, one at Mitchell, and one at Navigator. So 
I am familiar with the district and I can say I'm 100% for a charter school. However, I am very concerned about the fact that we don't have transportation. I mean, already when we had to cut the period from Mitchell Middle School and we had to add that zero period, um, we have parents who struggle to get their students there for that zero period. So we don't even have a, a structure for our kids to be able to go full IB. So those same parents, I don't think are gonna really have the capability to get those kids to that particular school. So I think that that's gonna be like a major concern. And I'm, I'm already struggling with the fact that I'm like, if we're addressing specifically absenteeism for this particular school, that that's gonna already be a, a huge issue for parents who already are struggling to get their kids to the public school that offers bus routes and things like that. I feel like if we had a school that was gonna model something like our Riverview STEM Academy that was gonna come in with some new options and things like that for our school, um, I would be all for that. And you know, I think what we continually feel at Rancho is that we get kind of the subpar. We don't get the best of the best. And I think that unless we're gonna come in with the best of the best for our students that we need to continue to look and as a person who's dealing with supply chain, my husband's an actual contractor, I would almost be shocked. I would be shocked if we would be able to get the school up and running by that point. My husband's a painter and literally had to drive to Fresno to purchase paint because there is literally none in the city. So with the supply chain shortages and things like that, and as a person who deals with that on a consistent everyday basis, I just feel like it's going to be a major struggle. And I, I just, I feel like continually for Rancho students, we continually get shortchanged. And so unless it's gonna be the most optimal for our kids, I'm also very concerned about this fiscal impact because when this budget cut comes down, is it gonna get cut from Folsom schools or is it gonna get cut from Rancho schools? And I can pretty much guarantee you that it's gonna get cut from our area because that's where this school is gonna be at. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you bring our two virtual? Three. Three virtual, okay. I'm gonna call on Hillary first. Okay, thank you, Hillary. Great, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Good evening, everyone. My name is Hillary Harmson. I serve as the Vice President of Northern California Local Advocacy with the California Charter Schools Association. I wanna express our overwhelming support for the approval of New Pacific School Rancho Cordova and ask that you vote to approve the school tonight. The staff report confirms the New Pacific School petition meets expectations related to educational program model, finances and administration, and charter management. Staff did not put forward a single negative finding related to the three-year budget and cash flow plan, confirming that the proposed charter school is fiscally sound. As you know, consideration of the community impact of a new charter school is a new legal requirement under AB 1505. The interpretation of community impact proposed by staff is far too broad and exceeds, exceeds the standard outlined in statute. Ed code states that authorizers must determine if the existing program has sufficient capacity for the pupils proposed to be served within reasonable proximity to where the charter school intends to locate. Therefore, it's unreasonable for staff to consider programming offered by district schools across the entire district in their community impact analysis, as this is clearly much broader than the intent of the law. The new Pacific team has been clear that their intent is to serve families within Rancho Cordova and their school will ensure this community has access to highly sought after programs such as Project Lead the Way, Leader and Me, Art and Foreign Languages, all in one school model. CCSA has been working closely with the new Pacific School Development team, providing resources and support. The charter petition lays out the breadth of experience of this charter operator, articulates a clear community need, and outlines a model program offering of accelerated learning, project-based learning, and social emotional supports that will be unique in this community within FCUSD. I urge you to approve new Pacific School Rancho Cordova tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Next, we have Chris. Oh, what's the name? Chris. Chris, Chris are you there? Uh, yep, I'm here. Thank you. Um, my name is Chris Bertelli. I'm uh, a parent uh, in this district. I have a student who uh, attended Folsom Cordova schools for over eight years. Uh, now she attends one of the Pacific Charter Institute schools. Uh, I am here in support of the petition. I'm here in support of the uh, the highly experienced expert leadership team uh, that Pacific Charter Institute has brought uh, in front of you tonight. I have been able to witness firsthand um, their expertise, the results of one-on-one -on -one, uh, education of students, uh, and uh, and cannot be um, uh, happier with uh, with the um, social emotional learning and um, the care in which they bring um, to educating every student. Uh, I think this becomes a very easy decision for the board tonight if they're willing to acknowledge, I think, one simple fact. 
that is in a student in a, in a district with 20,000 students, um, it is um, impossible and nor should you be expected um, to provide um, services that will adequately meet the needs of all 20,000 students. Um, we've already heard um, before that there are students who uh, are struggling, students who um, for all of the hard work and well intention, you're simply not gonna be able to reach. I think if you are able to continue to recoup 99.5% of your funding over the next three years under the worst case scenario in, uh, in the slide um, that, that discusses the finances, the financial impact of this, and the outcome is that several hundred students actually get an education um, that meets their needs. Um, I think that's a bargain. Um, and I, I find it a bit unsavory that so many people would say that a, a okay. Thank you. We have Debbie. Debbie, are you there? Hi. Good evening, board, Dr. Klee. Um, this is Debbie Krikorian, FCEA. I just wanted to um, say a couple things. FCUSD has a long track record of listening to the community and they're open to the students' needs. Currently, we have an award-winning school with Riverview that was open that is one of the top schools in the nation. We've taken the school, we've taken Project Lead the Way, project-based learning, and we brought it to the forefront as far as track records. When we're looking at PCI, they have no track record of having a classroom school. We're gambling on our students in Rancho that they will be able to open up a classroom school with the same vitality that we currently have in, in rigor that we currently have in our education. I agree a smaller school is a good um, opportunity for students and it's something that we could look into in our district as a whole and, and continue uh, to look at that pathway if you're looking at smaller schools and, and targeting um, students. But we do it with fidelity. We do it with um, research. Everything is research-based. And right now we follow our emotional social needs, even within our own schools by um, name everybody, every child by name, know every child by name. So we have our, our second step as well, currently in here. And um, I just feel that we just don't need to gamble with our own students. And what happens when we have no accountability for five years and they come up for renewal and um, they end up like my friend's school in Livermore where the doors are locked, they're not renewed because they didn't have that background experience and they didn't have um, the accountability with students. Then our students have lost education and, and we have to try to, to, to bring them up. I don't think our kids... Thank you, Debbie. Okay, that wraps it up for our public hearing. I will be moving out of public hearing. We're going to discussion. With that said, we are in the public hearing. And as we discussed earlier, we're going into item, uh, item nine that was moved after this for discussion action on this item is A, approve or deny new Pacific Charter School, Ranch Cordova petition, superintendent, Yes, this item is coming before the board for um, uh, discussion action. Uh, we just completed the public hearing. You have staff's report and through the findings the, and, and the findings of fact, we recommend that you deny the petition for New Pacific School. Um, and we'll turn it over to our okay. board for any questions. Okay, we go open it up for board questions. We'll kind of go down the same pattern we did last time. We'll start with Mr. Uber. Me first again. Mm -hmm. All right, lucky me. All right. <clears throat> uh, I don't know who wants to answer these, but um, I wanted to ask if Rancho Cordova Elementary School offers project-based learning such as Project Lead the Way. At Rancho, Rancho Cordova. Cordova Elementary? At Rancho Cordova Elementary School. No. Not at Rancho Cordova Elementary School. Okay. Does Cordova Meadows Elementary School offer project-based learning such as Project Lead the Way? No. Does Cordova Villa Elementary School 
uh, offer project-based learning such as Project Lead the Way? No. Okay. Does Cordova Gardens Elementary School offer Project Lead the Way? Not Project Lead the Way, but project-based learning, yes. Okay. Um, so a lot has been said that um, our district offers all the same things that New Pacific School offers. And uh, we tend to point to Riverview STEM Academy, which is, again, an amazing school in our community. So my next question would be, could we fit, if the students wanted to, could we fit every student from Rancho Cordova Elementary, Cordova Meadows, Cordova Villa, Cordova Gardens in Riverview STEM? Would that be a, a possibility? All the students of all those of other all schools? those schools, yeah. No. Okay. I think everyone can kind of see the point I'm getting at here. Uh, Riverview STEM is amazing. We do have some amazing, unique schools in our district, but we do not have enough for every every student in this district. Why would we say no to another opportunity for our students? Um, my my last question, I think, before I kick it to my colleague. Uh, on the transportation issue, is there an expectation for a school of 90 students that there's like a bus system or what, what is the expectation for a school of 90 students that would satisfy the staff? I think transportation wise, speaking on the transportation portion, I think the concern was um, the fact that the, the, the uh, charter petition is um, specifically targeting um, students who have chronic absences. And so transportation would be a significant hindrance for those students to be able to attend. So I think that was why we uh, notified or uh, marked that as a potential concern. So, but you think it's insufficient. So what would be sufficient, do we think? Like what would we Transportation services. So, so, but for example, a bus system, does it have to be a bus system? I mean, what what is the what would be a sufficient? Well, I think I think students that are considered um, uh, chronically absent mm -hmm. normally have issues getting to school. Right? Sure. Um, and there are probably issues related to home life or other situations that don't allow those students to access campus, and that happens where we have service. So I would want to ensure that at a minimum they have that same level of service, if not greater. Sure. Absolutely. Right? Because that's what they're identifying as a priority. <clears throat> Absolutely. So what does our district do uh, to address, uh, as has been mentioned tonight, uh, chronic absenteeism? Like what are the steps that we would take for a student? And maybe Mr. Meyer can share some of the, the steps of what we do. It's pretty systematic. Yeah, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, so a uh, question is, what does our district do to address chronic absenteeism, which I think we all, everyone in this room agrees is something that should be addressed. Um, what, what is the process for our district to address that? And that's, that's a loaded question, but the definitely uh, each school has different, uh, in each grades, whether you're talking elementary or secondary. So we do have attendance teams at all schools that really are focusing on building those relationships. Uh, every one of our schools is currently going through a program called Turnaround for children and uh, it's, it's four trainings where they send these attendance teams. It's all based about building relationships. Uh, we've learned that you can't provide items, you can't provide just more resources and expect kids to come to school. It's all about relationships and a lot of those relationships we're building at those foundational years. Um, we do do extensive home visits. Uh, we do those with myself. Uh, with my partner over there, Mrs. Hazarian. Um, we will also do that with site principals. We have an attendance nurse. We have our social workers, our MFTs. They're often the ones that we work really on finding out the barriers and the root causes. So um, we do have a full systematic plan. I don't know how, how deep you want me to get into this, where we have tier one, tier two, tier three interventions. We have an attendance toolkit. We provide attendance training annually. Um, to all of our administrators and our support staff. Okay. So it's, it's a very structured, um, and, but with that said, we're still running into a lot of challenges. Uh, but so uh, we do that for a district of 20,000 students. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say your job would be easier if you had 90 students in your school district? 
Would you say all of that would be a little bit easier if you had 90 students in your school district as opposed to 20,000? I guess by easier, uh, just by numbers? Staff, st uh, staff uh, needs, um, contacts, student contacts. I mean, I would assume as a percentage, it would probably be fewer, correct? Yeah, if you had the correct resources and the correct training for staff um, and it took those systematic approaches, yes, if we had that this, the same amount of resources. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Um, my last question is, can, um, can someone give me a, a description of what the DLAC committee's mission is? Ms. Cabrera. Um, first and foremost, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the oh no, I'm sorry. No. Oh, it's not working. I'll get closer. I can get up and, oh, okay. All right, closer. Um, the DLAC committee is the District English Learner Advisory Committee. Their primary role is to advise the district boards, such as yourself in the district, on English learner services for the English learners. It is one of the compliance items for English learners and the committees. Um, the DLAC is formed based on the school site ELACs, which are English learner advisory committees. And of such committees, they send a representative to form the district's English Learner Advisory Committee. Um, and, and the term advisory represents a number of things, the school plans, our local uh, accountability plan, the LCAP, and things such as the CARS, so budgeting uh, related to English learners in our district. Okay. Um, does DLAC generally act as an advocacy uh, committee on uh, school board discussion action items that don't involve um, our students or district, you know, English language issues or? DLAC has the right to advise on English learner related mm -hmm. uh, programs, education and services that stem not only to students, but their families. Okay. As well as curriculum. But is there, um, is it, would it be correct to say that any FCUSD student that chose to attend this charter school would be doing so voluntarily? Sure. Okay. Um, that's going to be all for me until my final comments. Thank you. Okay. Clark. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, a few questions uh, for our staff and obviously for uh, PCI. But, you know, I wanted to kind of piggyback on what my colleague was asking about um, PBL and, you know, some of the schools in Rancho Cordova that don't have it. Uh, but I wanted to ask the question of, um, I think it's NGSS science standards. Um, are they in all our schools? Yes, NGSS is in our schools and okay. those are um, project based. So um, in response to Mr. Hoover's original question, I was in my head, I was thinking more um, in terms of project lead the way. Right. Also, in terms of all the schools that we were talking about fitting in either Gardner or Review, no. But between those two schools, we have um, over 200 spaces. So any student that was interested specifically in project-based learning like Project Lead the Way, um, they, we could accommodate them through either Gardens and or River Review together. So, so that science standard, just for the record and clarification, is project-based, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. So... You know, he named off schools that weren't or didn't have PBL. Uh, what schools in Rancho Cordova do? I think the clarification was Project Lead the Way. Yeah, and that's or a Project specific Lead the Way. program. All of our science standards include project based learning, and okay. all of our elementary schools also have maker spaces, which are also STEM related, hands on project based learning opportunities. And all of our schools in Rancho Cordova are all Title I schools and also have after school programs that build in hands on project based learning opportunities every day after school, in addition to the summer program. So, would it be safe to say that all Correct. schools do have project based learning? They do. It, not specifically Project Lead the Way Wait, program, because that's their project based a learning. Program. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, that's what I wanted to kind of clarify the questions that Mr. Hoover was asking. Um, Mr. Kiefer, I, I, I did have a couple of questions for you. Um, your chamber, you're not chamber, I'm, I'm gonna get to that, but your board, your governing board, 
Um, how many of them are from this area, from Rancho Cordova? None of our board members are from Rancho Cordova. Okay, thank you. Um, how often does this board meet? Uh, we meet at least five times a year. Okay. Um, so five times a year, what, maybe once every other month, maybe? We follow the financial calendar for public schools. Okay. And LCAP calendar. And we also have additional meetings as needed based on either uh, education code situations that we need to resolve or laws that come into place that they need to be aware of, made aware of, things of that nature. Oh, okay. So it's on a as-needed basis, basically? No, we have five set meetings. You our do calendar have is set. listed. Okay. It's listed on the, under board of directors on our webpage. So if an emergency arises, like, heaven forbid, another pandemic breaks out, you would meet, correct, to make those decisions on what to do? Yes. Okay. Um, that leads me to that question of sight. Um, this is your first go-round. No, it's not. Uh, I mean, no. I mean, not Pacific Charter, but having a brick and mortar. So we're not, we're not naive to a site-based school. We have six resource centers. All of them have schedules. All of them have requirements. All of them have classroom protocols. Base. They have classrooms. They, they have, have teachers classroom. teaching students. Uh, I would liken it more to a collegiate environment versus an all-day, everyday school because students will come to classes twice a week for a class versus every day. So all those things that are in a traditional school we do, we just do it in a modified fashion. So it's not unknown to us, nor is it something that would be difficult for us to employ. But it'd be the first of its kind, basically. Uh, for PCI, certainly, but not okay. for our staff or the team that has extensive experience in site-based schools. Okay. Um, another question I had is, do you guys have a... Who oh, dashboard attendance school site? Oh, no, it's not dashboard attendance school systems in place. Um, I think it's modified uh, measures or modified method, modified excuse me methods or measures. Do you guys have that in place at all? I don't know what you're talking about. It's a uh, it's called a DAS S certification. That's not a, we're not that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was just kind of curious about that. And so in your petition, you showed that um, this is a K through 12. TK 12. Okay. Um, but you're showing enrollment for just uh, TK through nine. Um, shouldn't you have that projected enrollment for TK through 12 as well? Or does that come somewhere down the road? Yeah, education code for charter schools requires we give three years of uh, projected budget. So with that budget, it requires students to allocate student allocation. Okay. And so it goes out three years, and that's why it shows that. We're okay. not required to show five years because the state law says three years, which, as we know, three years in a budget mm -hmm. is, you know, it's not, it's as accurate as it can be. Right, right. Okay. See, I'm, I'm learning as we go along here. So thank you for, no for giving me that. That's why I'm asking so many questions on that. Um, October 21st, I believe, um, you received a letter of support from the Rancho Cordova Chamber of Commerce, which I understand you're on the board of directors, correct? That is not correct. We're a member. Oh, you're a member. Pacific okay. A member. We're not on the board. Okay. I thought when you did your introduction, you said that you were a board member. I kind of caught on to that. Maybe. I'm on the board on the uh, Rotary Club of Sacramento. Okay. All right. And as well as I'm a Rotarian, Paul Harris, actually. Um, so I, I'm just kind of wondering what this letter of support from the chamber and how many of your chamber board members have students that attend FCUSD? So I'm not on the board of the chamber. We're a member, so we attend luncheons mm -hmm. and events, but I have no idea what the, the board does as individuals, nor do I know anything about their personal lives. Okay, because from what I remember reading is that many of the chamber board members have students that were in FCUSD. I'm just kind of curious of how many. Uh, that was a letter produced by them. I had no... I had no content that I added, nor ideas. It was on their own volition. Okay. 
All right, perfect. Um, I know that you did a lot of canvassing, a lot of marketing of this. I, I'm just, I'm just perplexed why, you know, yeah, a, a charter school is coming. Um, I'm just kind of trying to figure out how you actually marketed this thing, only because I have a, a degree in business and marketing. I'm just trying to figure out, did you put it like, uh, we're this wonderful charter school. Uh, we have things that FCUSD doesn't have, which actually is kind of not true because we are providing things. And I just wanted to clarify that we did have, you know, project lead or project based learning in all of our schools. But I mean, I'm just trying to figure out how did you actually market this at Walmart, at soccer games, at the 4th of July, where you're not going to only get Rancho Cordova, the Rancho Cordova community, I think the 4th of July, and I don't know if the mayor is still here, but I think we have over 14 to maybe 20,000 participants. Are we correct, Mr. Mayor? Correct. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm just trying to figure that out. I mean, how did you, how did you sell that? Well, we weren't selling. We were explaining a pr proposal of a charter school that and we told them what the components would be and would they be interested. Mm -hmm. And by law, we have to have that charter school available to them. So they were able to go online and see our charter school and look into the details and whether it would fit what they're trying to do. Our uh, collateral or marketing pieces took components of the charter document and allowed them to see these are the components of what we plan to offer. Okay. All right. So they went online and they didn't look at a site-based charter. They looked at a... Uh, independent study charter and not a site base, right? Uh, NewPacificSchool.org mm -hmm. is the webpage for this school. It is site based. It is ex it's expressed throughout that webpage. Okay. So th uh, there is a link to New Pacific School both on the PCI webpage and of course you can get to it directly using the the URL. Okay. All right. So another one of my concerns is the location. Um, well, actually, we don't know the location, correct? Um, we have a proposed location, which I guess I can raise a concern over. And, um, you know, we talked about transportation and, and how we get our kids to that site. I mean, you know, if we have families that are working or, um, you know, don't have that transportation, how do we get them there? Even though it's not a requirement, I'm just thinking if you're targeting the absenteeism thing, you know, you might want to figure out how are we going to get these kids to school. We're targeting low-income students. We target low-income low students who are low-performing academically okay. who also have an absenteeism issue. If you go to Rockland District, which is a high-performing district that has high, high, uh, socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, you'll see schools in, in, Folsom, or in uh, Rockland that have a 10 to 12% absenteeism rate. That is not because they don't have a car, that's because they don't want to go to school. Okay. So the very fact that um, the staff member talked about um, when he was asked, what do we do for transportation? He explained the process of re-engaging students so that they want to come to school. So absenteeism is not a matter of only can I get to school. It is a, it's an issue of engagement. Okay. Maybe I phrased that wrong. Um, and with 90 students, engaging students won't be hard, and knowing what particular family needs won't be hard. We would easily be able to find a family who can drive, who live in the neighborhood, and we would connect them. That's very simple. We have a paraprofessional. If we find out a family can't get there, mm -hmm. we would have permission slips in place where that, that we could go and bring that student to school. I mean, right there, those two examples, that's 3% or that's 5% of our, of our ADA that we're able to capture on a daily basis by two simple maneuvers. We do three or four of those a day. Every day we'll have all of our kids showing up because we have 15 to one or better in every classroom, which means we would be able to make sure the kids get to school. Okay. Um, with all due respect, what, what area are you from? Do you live in? I live in Carmichael. I'm on the board at SCOE, which okay. covers Sacramento County. Okay. Does it cover this area? 
I'm in this area quite a bit on the bike path. I actually. understand that, so, but I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, wondering, <laughs> I'm just wondering if, if you, how can I say this? I understand the demographics that you would be working with. Well, so Mr. Clark, you and I both know you work near our Oak Park location. Absolutely. And, so, and, um, and I will tell you this, that I, I told you I was going to go by and, and see that, and, and I didn't because it wouldn't, it wouldn't show me what a brick and mortar would look like a full blown school. So it's like, I just do my research online. So, but I do understand that. And yeah, I do work in Oak Park. I do understand the demographics there. Albeit I understand very well the demographics here at White Rock, Cordova Villa, and all the other schools that I happen to visit at least twice a year. So I understand. So, you know, you can't tell me I don't or make a comparison between Oak Park and Rancho Cordova, that's almost like me, like I said, with all due respect, trying to make a comparison between Rancho Cordova and the demographics in Carmichael. Right? I, I'm, sh I'm sure there's areas that mirror each other. Okay, all right. Well, those were um, some of the questions that I had. Actually, I think that's all of them. Ed, you kind of stole my thunder of... Uh, parents of our socially disadvantaged, mm -hmm. economically disadvantaged students, how many of them were here, I was actually going to do the same uh, experiment. So you kind of stole that thunder from me. Um, actually, I do have one more question because we talk about language. And I know that you would address the Spanish uh, speaking families, but um, I know as a graduate of Leadership Rancho Cordova, I do know that this district alone has 73. I'm, I might be fudging it a little bit. I don't know, Garrett or Mayor Sander can tell me, uh, different languages spoken. So if you have, if you pull those kids into a charter, how do you address that? So having two, two adults in every classroom, we would target staff members that would have, have that language. We already do that work at Sacramento State, UC Davis, looking for, for a staff that could have the potential for uh, bilingual support. Uh, and so having three paraprofessionals and three teachers, the ability to connect students with, uh, with language is a goal, is a goal. But our flexibility of staffing allows for that goal to become uh, a reality, is our hope. Okay. So, uh, so 70 it, languages, absolutely not. It's, so no it's, way a, it's a big answer. goal. It's yeah. a lofty goal. We're not, I mean, but if we, we, certainly we target Spanish and the, you know, the top two or three languages, and, and we do it the very best we can. Every district uh, okay. has that. Because I'm, I'm just kind of pointing out the diversity of, especially the area of Rancho Cordova. Sure. Um, and how will we be able to help those kids that may be from a socially disadvantaged, I mean, economically disadvantaged family or, um, Certainly. you know. I, I did want to address the, when you ask who's here, uh, we had people, families leaving because it became late and we had families with little children. So um, I, I appreciate the straw poll, but uh, the room has thinned out a bit, and part of that thinning was our families that couldn't stay. Okay. I can understand that, I guess. Um, I think if they were going to advocate for something that is this important for their kids, uh, they might have wanted to stick around. I know that we modified our uh, board agenda item uh, to have a public hearing and, and then a uh, discussion action uh, just so we can make sure that we keep our families here, but nonetheless, it's not a point. So uh, that's all I have right now, Mr. Okay. President. Mr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. President. Just, just to confirm, we're, we're just doing questions right yes, now. Yes, that's okay. correct. You know, comment later. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kiefer, and by the way, I apologize. I, I think I called you Mr. Kiefer. Uh, that's okay. I've been called much worse. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dr. Kiefer, um, you mentioned the 15 to 1 ratio. Is that 15 students to one teacher, or is that 30 students to two uh, adults in the classroom? 30 students to two adults. Okay, so uh, Superintendent Kligan, it, it would be safe to say that FCUSD also has a 15 to 1 ratio then. 
It, it depends what grade level we're talking about, but I'm assuming we're talking about elementary or our yeah, class uh, well, sizes are Yeah, smaller. I guess probably elementary, right? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Ogden, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, I just want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples here. Um, Superintendent Kaligian, uh, I was wondering if a staff member could answer a couple questions on attendance. And specifically, I'm curious, what are the major drivers of um, low attendance? I imagine there's more than one factor that's associated with. That, that would be correct. And I'm gonna ask Mr. Meyer because he, he has a um, multi-pronged multi approach for addressing the multi reasons that we have for attendance issues. Right. And I think the connection piece, not feeling connected with the school, let's look at attendance as a symptom. Uh, and I, I think often it's students voting with their, uh, with their lack of better words, cheeks in the seat. And when you aren't showing up, it's often because they don't feel connected to the school. Um, they, I, I, hear, I hear transportation, that's obviously can be an issue. Um, but I, I think with COVID, it's really just highlighted how important those connections are because we're seeing our incoming sixth graders attendance just tanking and behavior because they lost a year or two and then they're coming in and do not feel connected uh i i think there's there's obviously other barriers there too um we some of our essential workers uh it can be transportation it can be uh babysitting it could be working. Uh, so there really are a lot of factors there, but I, I'd say the biggest barriers, especially for elementary, would be that um, could often be the families. And when we're talking, not meaning that they don't care about their students, but that there's so many other things going on. But when we're talking about middle school and high school, that can often be a lack of connection and that's more the student's choice where the elementary we find its barriers from the parents. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it, it's fair to say um, low attendance could, be, uh, could come as a result of family dynamics. It could come from um, uh, other family responsibilities that they may have, um, uh, watching siblings. It could be um, the lack of connectivity with the school site, as you mentioned. Um, it could be. Um, it, it could also be that uh, they're more tactile. I mean, they 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 learn differently than perhaps the model that we we do uh, traditionally teach in. Um, uh, it could be. Well, do you find? And I don't know if if I mean I don't want to. Uh, suggest any um, stereotypes or anything, but would, would children from hypothetically a, a, a single parent household, is there any, any uh, demonstration that perhaps the, the um, absenteeism is higher there because of the lack of two parents helping out getting kids to and from school? Or is, that, is there no correlation? No, honestly, there? I don't have quantitative data for that, but coming from a single, uh, growing up in a single family home, I, I, or single parent home, I have the qualitative data where I could say, oh, boy, I would think there, that's much more challenging, but I, I don't have that data in front of me right now. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, so I, I, I can't answer that though for all 22,000 students. Yeah. And employment status probably of, of, of the parents. If the parents are working, especially um, uh, during school hours before, before sc uh, school uh, starts mm. and after school ends, that could also perhaps cause um, attendance-related issues. Okay, so I, I, I guess the, the reason for my questions that I'm trying to, to, to determine is solving attendance uh, uh, or the focus of the applicant is, is um, attendance, low attendance. But there are many reasons that drive low attendance. It's not just necessarily that the student doesn't engage um, with uh, the, the style of education that's, that's uh, being implemented. That's, that's one possibility, but there are many other possibilities that could drive lower attendance that a model similar to, um, uh, similar to um, New Pacific wouldn't really um, solve. Yeah, there's some truth to that. Okay. Um, 
Superintendent Kligan, uh, how much has uh, FCOSD's enrollment declined since uh, prior to the pandemic to right now? Mr. Martin, do you have our um, latest enrollment? Uh, we are uh, right now at about 20,300. Um, last year, we dropped below 20,000 to 19.5. Um, what were you the year before? Uh, about 20,300 as well. So we, we've somewhat bounced back, but we were projecting growth, if you remember. So uh, we're, we're probably down um, in somewhere between the three to 500 kids over what we potentially would have had. Um, okay. So. so three to 500 kids. Um, uh, Superintendent Klingin, how many layoffs did we have as a result of that decline? Going into this year, we didn't lay off. We actually added stuff. Did we have any layoffs last year when we had the, uh, the more precipitous decline? No, we, we haven't laid off. Well, yeah, there wasn't a need for layoff, partially because staffing, uh, oh. because we had so many people retire or leave the district as well. So is it safe to say then if New uh, Pacific does attract 200 and to students uh, by 24, 25, that that really wouldn't necessarily result in layoffs of FCOSD staff? Potentially not because of the loss of the students specifically to engage those students, but it could be in relationship to the budget shortfall because of the additional loss of revenues. So if, if we're losing, we had those students in class and we were getting those revenues, potentially there would be um, that additional money available to us versus we don't have that money and we would not have enough funds to potentially keep all programs or staff at that same level. But we did lose students over the last two years. Yes, well, we lost students over the last two years. We also have, <coughs> have reduced costs because we haven't had as much staff because of the fact, as we've talked about, we're, we have over 100 and I think 160 or 180 open positions right now that we need to fill. So we have a lot of savings related to that. We were closed for almost over a year. And so all the costs associated with substitutes, utilities, all those pieces, we created savings. And we also received substantial, what, $60 million in COVID funding. Mm -hmm. So that that's part of those reasons. Would it be safe to say that if there was a need for um, staff layoffs, because of 202 students leaving the district, that that most likely could probably be handled through attrition and no one would actually be laid off? Potentially, it, it depends on the, the scenarios that we would be looking at, but you're looking at you know about $10,000 a student approximately, very, pro very rough numbers. So $2 million in lost funding is still $2 million less in the district for services. It may not be staff, it may be programs. Obviously we try to do the, mm -hmm. uh, if we, have to get to the point where we're doing reductions. We have input from um, all the stakeholders and we try to prioritize those things that are furthest away from classrooms and students. So, but you know, uh, support services, um, other programs, uh, materials, those things could be lost um, due to reduction in funding. Okay. Um, Superintendent Kaligian, and this, I don't know, this may be a, a better question for our council, but, um, is it FCUSD's responsibility to run uh, the, a charter school? Because I, I hear a lot of questions about um, th that folks seem to want us to have um, our hands on the puppet strings, if you will. Is, is that the role of a school district with an independent charter school? Well, I, I think, you know, when we talk about charter schools, there are two different kinds. We have our own charter school of which our governing board is the oversight and authorizer of that charter school. And, and, and then of course there's, you know, the, the outside requests that we're entertaining tonight. Um, I would defer that to our legal counsel and ask us that question. Trustee, just to clarify, you're asking whether or not the you, if you were to approve it, is responsible for operating the charter school, correct? Um, correct. So the answer to that is no, you wouldn't be responsible for operating the charter school. You would have oversight responsibility, um, which there's certain statutory responsibilities in terms of oversight and you know fiscal, you'd be reviewing their budgets. I mean, be ensuring that they're complying with the law. Um, but in terms of operating it, no, that would be PCI and the charter school itself that would be operating. And there is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there isn't anything in California law that requires a charter school to be a mirror image of a school 
uh, school district and the school district structure. You're, you're correct. There's nothing that requires a charter school that it, it needs to be a mirror image or that it needs to be completely opposite of. There's nothing that requires a, the type of program that a charter school must offer. Okay. And there's no requirement that the board of a charter school has to be from any certain community. Nope, there's oh. not. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. I will save my. Well, that's yeah. That's those are all my questions. Um, okay. um, I will have some comments later. Mr. Hui. Yeah, okay. Um, I just have I have one question for um, the staff, I guess. Um, so it was mentioned like that the racial and ethnic balance in um, in terms of the New Pacific Charter School um, and just their demographics aren't exactly reflective of um, territorial demographics um, in Rancho Cordova Charter Schools or FCUSD Charter Schools. Are they more balanced in terms of those? I'm, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I'd have to look to see what our enrollment is at Folsom Cordova Community Charter, if that's what you're referring to. Is that what you mean? Yeah, just in terms of like that balance that was considered deficient, I think. Yeah. And Folsom Cordova Community Charter, of course, is one of our, our own charter schools. So we don't, you know, we don't have to have that, we don't have to have that criteria when we're admitting students. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, that was all. Oh, yeah, I have some just I didn't want to be redundant, but I have some questions. I think what um, Mr. Hoover is saying, I have questions from staff. Uh, when we're starting to do comparisons with Riverview and STEM and providing, you know, project, you know, project lead the way verse. I, I was here when that all started. Uh, it doesn't change anything. If I think everybody's looking at a centralized model versus a decentralized model. So when you're mixing bags, you're, you're confusing people. Uh, it doesn't prevent anyway. We have folks that go like earlier, like uh, David Sander, we have folks come, Rancho go to Folsom, we go everywhere. We do all that kind of mismatch. So we have kids at STEM uh, education at math, uh, at uh, Riverview that I hear is like 75% is from the surrounding areas. And I think we had some numbers that were derived from different folks from that local area. Was that correct? Do you have those numbers? I saw a um, email that gave me the breakdown of that. That would be correct. About three fourths of the students currently attending Riverview are Rancho Cordova students. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with that said, um, if you had their position and their location, would we easily say that they can get 75% of that local area from one school, not from a spread out decentralized model, can actually take all those kids from one school? And then would that impact our school sites that we would have to close it? Is that possible? Well, I, I would think we'd have to ask the petitioner that feasibility. Because you, you, earlier, uh, Dr. Kiefer, you said you didn't really know your demographics of the people that uh, signed up because you did them at Walmart, which we all know if you're in the community, a lot of those folks that shop there are not from the community. A large percentage in the, the city can tell you because of the transit system there. People come from all over and shop. So if you're standing out there, taking those petition uh, signatures you you weren't able to answer is that correct that's one location i don't have all the, we we listed all the locations in the petition i think there's over 20 different locations i gave you one mm -hmm. as an example uh, my own my own reflection on that in regards to how we enroll students we have to follow the charter and the charter says we have to first target low-income students i don't know what the demographics are or riverview but those students would be eligible to enroll. Right. And as I said before, it's 90 positions, 90 seats. So uh, uh, once those 90 seats are filled, then it goes to a lottery. From the standpoint of pulling from around the community. Um, Isn't that what you're targeting? targeting? We're, targeting we're targeting the students in the schools that were mentioned earlier. Right. So if you look at the map, Mr. Kiefer, you were saying earlier Here's the map. If you look, if you knew the community in Rancho Cordova, and probably you've been around in there, you said you wanted to potentially look at a site from north of 50. If you knew how the community is, most of the schools that we have are neighborhood schools. 
they're, they're all embedded within neighborhoods. If you look at the commercial over there and you need about 15 to 20,000 square feet, I think the city can tell you, you have a very slim area right over there where an uh, area which's in the heart of the commercial sure. or along Folsom Corridor, sure. which I've seen petitions and charters try to do that before. And there's not very many buildings there that would facilitate that. Well, we're confident that even if we use Kilgore, we're confident with 90 students, we will get those students to school regardless of where they are. And we'll do it by working with the families. It's 90 students. But it's, you it's, don't know who the families are. It, it won't matter who they are because once they enroll, we're, we will work with them to make sure they can get to school. What I'm telling you is how do you target those folks that they're absentee? As you said, we go do door knocks. We try to get them there. Are you going to be doing door knocks? And are you going to be doing that? Are you, are you going to try to recruit those folks, or are you saying they sign up and you let them in? They they apply and then you let them in. So the question is coming: Would you allow anybody to apply to come in, irrelevant of their demographics and social economic condition? We're we're not allowed to discern who the kids are, but we can target through the lottery and also who we make uh, available the information about the schools we are. Of the, the students and the families, as I said, it's in the charter petition. It clearly outlines the apartment complexes that we, yes, we flyered, we talked with families, we, uh, we've been very present in the community talking about this school. So you talked about cherry picking earlier. So what I'm hearing is, is it true then you're not going to deny anybody that applies irrelevant in their demographics and social economics and not that, your targeted? Team. That's the law. So you attack them? If we have a space, we take them, right. and once the spaces are full, then we put them into a lottery. And I think Mr. Clark was getting one when the Chamber of Commerce gave that letter. It said that their chamber kids themselves, that are not kids that I would presume coming from large businesses, wanted to apply to take their kids there. So they would apply and get in, but they're not kids of, uh, of, of a disadvantage. Is that true? You would take those kids? Every student that applies is allowed, in t okay. is allowed to be in the lottery. So, so if that happens, so if a lot of folks in the Shining start applying there, how would you meet the needs of the community that the kids that are absentee, how it could be more of like 50, 75% are not the targeted kids that we're trying to do for our community, for our kids here. Is that true? Could that be possible? Sure, it's possible. Okay. Okay, so that was one of my questions. So I know you couldn't find those kids, but uh, how did you... I'm not sure, what did that... I'm not sure what that is. We didn't find that kid, those kids. You didn't find the kids that your your proposal is saying the target. But it every, sounds like you, know, you have to sec, accept anybody that applies. Every single student is a candidate to be a student that could, could face absenteeism issues. A, a, a student oh, sure. today who's having a great life, all of a sudden tomorrow has a very bad traumatic thing happen. All of a sudden, they now are a student that would face the possibility of being a, a student that's absent from school. It, we can't predict who the kids are that... We, we have, don't have access to your data on who is an absentee student. That's confidential information. We only know that generally speaking, by the academic performance of the schools and the high absenteeism rate, that this is a, a good place for us to start to have a school that would welcome those students so that they, could, mm -hmm. they would be able to uh, feel connected to their school. So earlier you said, why when I asked uh, the parents of those targeted kids weren't here? Can you explain why they're not here? And we also offer them to be virtually on. They didn't have to be here. They could have been, we didn't have a single parent speak up in regards to that targeted audience. Can you explain that? Well, the meeting went, went long, is going long, and we had at least three or four families that left. So that would be 10 to 20% of the population of this school if, in fact, they chose to enroll. And um, beyond that, we have more than, more than half the number of students are listed in the charter petition for signatures of those parents. So that's where the rub is with the district. We counted the number of kids per parent, and that number exceeds, the number of students listed exceeds more than half the number of students that are meaningfully interested in being in our school. Okay, I don't want to beat a dead horse on, but I, I, I hear what you're saying. This might be questions on the budget earlier of what um, my colleague here, Mr. Rio, was talking about. Is it possible that those two years that we had was called the whole harmless on the ADA? So yes, we did lose uh, kids, but we were still held harmless. We still got the same budget from the state. Is that correct? The total ADA funding, yes. Yeah. So yeah. this year, yeah, as compare well as 
those numbers at all because it's COVID data that we're talking about today is not the same data as we've experienced in the past years. You can't rely on any data from anything on COVID on this stuff. It's something that we've never experienced before. We're still learning from the fallout from a lot of this stuff. So the absenteeism, disengagement, the loss of learning, all these things are coming back because we're still in the middle of a COVID recovery. So we're going into territory uh, as all of us here that we're not. So how, how are you as the PC or the charter gonna help us when we don't even know how that's impacted when it's never been seen before in this nation? We're gonna help because we're gonna follow what the charter says and we're gonna get student results that would make the community in Rancho Cordova better and have a choice for families in Rancho Cordova that would allow them to go to a school that fits their child's needs. So that alone is gonna help Rancho Cordova. When we're talking about budget, yes, we, 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 we can see that uh, there's a possibility of, of a, a teacher or two might, might be a, a consequence, but we, we can't even verify that because of the absolute growth of the district in itself, south of 50. Mm -hmm. And your numbers are much, cl you know, you, you, you have the data on that, but uh, by, it, it seems that uh, our, our small footprint would, uh, would, would not affect the growth nor the increase in the budget of the district. That's mm. gonna grow, mm, yeah. regardless so, of- uh, So my final question is, you have this parent right here that came, she's an essential worker. Her parents are working during this COVID part. A lot of those kids that I hear from when I went to the DLAC, parent forum and listen to the Hispanic community, all those parents just were in awe because they had to go to work as essential workers. A lot of the MCTism is due to the fallout of COVID. Those, she, she, she's nodding her head. Have you talked to those five folks in that community? I didn't see anybody in here talking or to those folks that have experienced that type of situation. She's right there, right in front of you. Have you talked to her? Well, I don't see those parents out here. We're not offering services to um, your That's family. Hispanic. We have a, a 50 percent, almost a 50%. We're Hispanic not, we're not population. offering to this person or your family, but I wish you the very best. But I can say of the almost 3000 students that we set service at PCI, we understand, we understand quite clearly what COVID did. And we did all the, all of the work that are required to make sure we kept families engaged. And we made sure that we were able to make sure families were aware of what they could do. We made sure we understood parents had schedules that they had to meet. Uh, we are, this, this charter should have clearly showed we're centered on the student and the family and everything else fits into that. It's not centering on the building and then hope the kids fit into that. Mm -hmm. It centers on the student. And then from there, we're able to maximize student learning. So which I'm sure this person's family would, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna center on my child? Yes, your child comes first. How do we get your child to school? What can we do in the short term and the long term to help you? We have a wellness program, which we talked about a month ago. That is their job. Their job is to both identify families and students and then find remedy for them. Homeless students, homeless students living in uh, containers, homeless families. This is, this is the work we all do. That's the work we wanna do for 90 kids year one. Okay, that's all I have. Um... I have one speaker, is that where we're gonna? Because right now we're just doing board questions. So now if we're done with that, we're gonna go move on to, to the public again. Uh, we'll go out to the public comment. Anybody can come up to the, that provides one of these. We only have one. So that's uh, Angelica again? Okay. Yeah, thank you. I just had a question. Um, I just had a question and I don't know who it's <laughs> addressed to, but I'm wondering if we have any potential conflict um, and no disrespect meant, but with Mr. Huey working for SCOE and Dr. Kiefer being on the board, I'm just curious, but again, I don't know who that's addressed uh, Dr. to. Uh, Dr. Kiefer's not my direct uh, supervisor, so I don't believe there's any conflict. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, any other public comment? Uh, Yes, if you bring that up here and hand us your. Excuse me? Sean oh, I haven't pulled it. it out yet. Oh. But I will. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I promise. Um, uh, thank you. That was a really um, interesting yeah, discussion. 
you guys asked really good questions. Um, I actually do want to say this, and I apologize it sounds rude, but I was a little bit offended by the um, board member that insinuated that the parents did not care because they left early. There were a lot of kids in here that were young, or a handful of kids in here that was young. Um, I found that incredibly disrespectful and not representative of what you guys should be doing. To go online, to come here for two or almost three hours, um, I, I just, that was just awful, okay? And I think you owe those parents an apology. Okay, with that said, we're done with the public comment. We're gonna bring it back to the final board comments and direction. So do we have any board comments? We can talk right now. Uh, Mr. President. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, what? Mover. Yeah, is your final comments and direction? Uh, prior to my comments, I would like to make a motion that the Board of Education reject the resolution number 1118-2115 and the Folsom Court of Unified District Staff Report and findings of fact, and to prove the new Pacific School Charter petition. I'll second the motion. No, this is final comments. It's final comment. He's uh, Mr. Uh, President, I brought my Roberts rules tonight <laughs> just to make sure that I could defend this, but we can make a motion at any time. But it doesn't allow, we're gonna still- The motion has been placed on the, oh, the we're floor and second. final comment. Yeah. Sure, yeah, I just wanna be clear that the Board motion is on the floor. Okay. We got a first, second, and table. We're going to get final comments. Would you like me to go first? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I don't know if there's a timer, but let's see. Um, so first off, I do want to address some 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 issues up front here. Um, it's uh, just a lot of inappropriate stuff tonight here. Um, you know. Um, we had the president of our board, you know, kind of raise the stack of, of petitions of people that aren't here while he criticized uh, uh, students for not being here, uh, which by the way, I went through them. There's almost, there's very few parents in the stack. Um, and um, I also just want to point out kind of this challenge that I've raised in the past um, with a district, an arm of the district acting as an advocacy arm for a political discussion. I think it's completely inappropriate. We've had this discussion before about the equity leaders, about the equity team uh, coming to this board and acting on behalf of the district equity team, as opposed to on behalf of themselves as a political representative with a political position. It's completely inappropriate. If a parent wants to come here as, as a DLAC member and state their opposition, that is absolutely fair game. But for them to be able to present their opposition in, a, in the DLAC report, as a repre which represents the school district committee, I think it's completely inappropriate. And I wanna point that out before I go any further. Um, I just, it's a trend that continues to happen and I think we need to have another conversation about it. Um, I also want to, what our last speaker uh, mentioned here, um, about this comment that, you know, well, where are the kids in here that would go to this school? Where are low, -come, low income kids in this room that would be represented uh, or th that should be here apparently to advocate for themselves? I can tell you as a working parent myself with a large family that school board meetings, if I wasn't on the board, are not a big priority. Um, I, I certainly would not expect any child, including the kids that were sitting right here and left early, um, to sit through a five hour school board meeting uh, and, and be able to survive through that so that they can come up and advocate for opening a school. The whole point of this school is to get kids that aren't engaged. I don't expect them to be at the school board meeting. That's why I fought to require that we live stream these meetings, which Mr. President, you opposed, because we need access to these things. And so I just find it completely appalling and inappropriate that we would expect young children or their families to be here in person at a meeting like this, when we're talking about working families. You said it yourself, these are working families. They have a lot of other things going on than sitting through a five hour school board meeting. Um, next, I want to address um, 
you know, first of all, I really appreciate that our um, Rancho Cordova city leaders uh, came out tonight. I appreciate your input and I want to address some of it because uh, I certainly, uh, you know, want to work with the city on this, um, but there's some issues with uh, some of the comments that you raised tonight. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Council Member Sander pointed out that public schools are better at dealing with absenteeism. Now, don't get me wrong, FCUSD is going to give every effort in the world to engage students. We do that. Mr. Meyer pointed out how much time and effort we put into that. We do. But here's the reality is that we have a district of 20,000 students. We're talking about approving a school that's going to start as a school of 90 students. And there seems to be this expectation that this school needs to have some sort of complex transportation system uh, that is similar to our school district. We're applying what we have to this tiny school and that if they don't have that, then somehow it's inadequate. But the reality is, is that they don't have these families yet. They don't know where they live. They don't know what communities they're in. And they are nimble enough and small enough to be able to work directly with the families to get them to school. That's what makes this such a unique opportunity. And honestly, that's not something that our district provides to every student. We had, I had a constituent reach out to me recently. Actually, they weren't a constituent because now we're in districts. But they were a uh, resident of our school district who reached out to me saying that she had been denied transportation to her school and that if she was not given transportation, her family would have to pay hundreds of dollars a month to get their child to school. Now, thankfully, because of the, um, because of the board's uh, ability to intervene into that situation, we were able to advocate for her and get her transportation. But the reality is, has she not reached out to the board, she was denied transportation. That is something that I think is very unlikely to happen in this school, and I'll tell you why. Obviously, the people here in support tonight, I believe are genuine when they say that they want this child, this child's education comes first and they want that child in school for that reason alone. But we also have to remember that just like our district, this school's gonna rely on ADA and it's a much smaller school. One child absent is going to have a much bigger impact on their budget than for a school of a district of 20,000 people. There is a strong incentive to get that student to school, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because they need the ADA. So this idea that somehow they're not gonna let students get to school is absolutely preposterous. Um, next, I'd like to address uh, Mayor Gatewood's comments and, you know, Again, <laughs> his comment was, I'll start with his comment, uh, something along the lines of, uh, you know, this school won't service the needs of Rancho Cordova and that members who, board members who are elected by Folsom voters do not represent Rancho Cordova. Now, my colleague to the left uh, of me here uh, reminds us very regularly that no matter who votes for us, we all represent all parts of this district. Uh, that's just the reality, we do. And we've talked about that many times. But not only is that the case, uh, but unfortunately Mayor Gatewood's argument is flawed uh, because when Mr. Reed and I both ran for the school board back in 2018, we weren't in districts. We were elected at large. We ran in Rancho Cordova. We were elected by voters in Rancho Cordova. And I hate to say it, but Mr. Reed and I both got more votes than, Ms. than President Short in Rancho Cordova. So this idea that we do not represent Rancho Cordova or we do not represent the voters of Rancho Cordova is absolutely flawed. Next, let's talk about the Rancho Cordova Chamber of Commerce support letter. I find it very interesting that, you know, we talk about Rancho voices and yet the approach of some members of this board are to question and undermine the value of the support of the Rancho Cordova Chamber of Commerce, which is a huge member of the Rancho Cordova community. So let's, let's uh, to read a little bit of their letter, they say, as representatives of the Rancho Cordova area business community, part of our mission is to make Rancho Cordova a top choice for families to live and work. Excellent schools build strong communities and we're pleased to support a high quality public school option within the city. 
Pacific Charter Institute has experience delivering innovative, high quality education programs while preparing students for their college and careers. It is exciting to know Pacific Charter is as confident about the Rancho Cordova community as we are. And we urge you to work with Pacific Charter Institute to approve the school. That is not just one Rancho Cordova de voice, but one of the most influential and involved and engaged Rancho Cordova institutions and organizations in Rancho Cordova. So let's not just throw that aside. Um, last, I'll, I'll just go into kind of my final comments here. Um, is that the opposition tonight to this petition talked a lot about a lot of things, but very rarely did I ever hear them talk about kids. Very rarely did I hear them talk about students. I heard them talk about budgets. I heard them talk about budgetary challenges and transportation issues, but almost it was always, this is why this can't work as opposed to the opportunity that this is, that is being provided to students. I asked earlier um, the superintendent if there was an achievement gap between Rancho Cordova and Folsom. And I asked because I think it's something that everyone on this board feels very strongly about. Because this isn't, this isn't a dig on Rancho Cordova. This is what we are supposed to do as a board is we're supposed to look at the data and we're supposed to take action to fix the problem. And the data says that there is an achievement gap between our two communities. And when I ran for this school board, I ran on closing that gap, not by bringing down Folsom, but by bringing everyone up. That's what we need to be doing. And the reality is, is that this is an opportunity. This isn't gonna fix the whole problem. It's a small school, but this is an opportunity for our district to give us some competition so that everyone will raise its standards. This is an opportunity to give students in Rancho Cordova who may have a different learning style and may not be happy with the education offerings at their current school, an opportunity to change that. And I also want to focus on the fact that this is completely voluntary. There are no, no one is forcing students to attend this school. No one. We, we talked tonight as if there was going to be all of these students stolen from other schools or forced into this school and then treated poorly. That's not how charter schools work. That's just not the fact. Charter schools have to attract students. In fact, they have, an, they have to do something that we don't have to do, which is have a quality program that attracts families and students. No one is forcing people to go to this school. If this school does not meet its targets, if it doesn't meet its, um, what the petition has laid out and said that it would meet, it's not gonna get families to go there. And then it's going to go away because either this district will not reauthorize it or it won't have the students to function. It's that simple. It's on them to get the students and that is what keeps them accountable. So let's talk about accountability. Uh, we have a five-year reauthorization process to hold this charter school accountable. We have uh, revocation proceedings if necessary, if they're not meeting uh, what they said they would do to hold, them accountable, to hold them accountable. If we give up this opportunity to approve this school and Sacramento County approves this school, we give up all of our accountability and oversight over them. So I do not believe that that is the right decision tonight. I think we need to approve this, uh, this petition. And I also think that accountability goes both ways because we as a school district, we also need accountability. And there is no better public accountability system than, a, than charter public schools for a public school district, plain and simple. It was really interesting when this petition got, forward, uh, got brought forward because one of the first things that our district started talking about was ways that it could innovate, ways that we could create new schools, new opportunities, new programs. And I find it very interesting because my board colleague, Mr. Reed uh, from Folsom, has talked for years about small schools, innovative approaches, and nothing has come of it. And yet when this charter petition got introduced, we started having that conversation. 
I think it's very telling that we started having that conversation. And if we approve this school today, then we're going to be able to switch into that permanent mindset of innovation as a school district, and that will serve all of our students. Finally, let's talk about school choice. And I think regardless of your background in this room, we can all agree that families and students that have means, that have wealth, that have money in their bank accounts have school choice. It's that simple. They can pick up, if they're not happy with their local public school, they can do one of two things. They can pick up and they can move to a different district that offers a better education, or they can send their child to a private school. That is afforded to anyone with means. What is a student who does not have means, what are they supposed to do? If their family cannot afford a house in a better community or a better school district, cannot afford a private school education, what is their family to do if their neighborhood school is not meeting their needs? The reality is that the only option for that student is to attend a public charter school. A denial of this petition is a vote for the status quo, which I think we all can agree could be better. And approving this petition gives us the ability to switch our district into an innovative mindset to compete for these students and to make sure they continue to go to our schools. And New Pacific School will do the same and it will benefit all of our kids. That's what we should be making this decision on. And that's why I'll be voting to approve the petition. Okay. Mr. Park. Thank you, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I wanna um, make a quick comment of the parent that came in. And uh, I think probably that was targeted towards me and if there was a comment that I made that was inappropriate. I've been raised by my parents to own it and apologize. So if that parent is still here, um, I don't see her. And then again, I don't have my glasses on. Uh, I do apologize if that comment wasn't um, appropriate. Now, um, with that out the way, because that kind of bothered me, I'm a type of person that will own something. Um, I want to just make this comment that the questions that I asked and the things that I referenced to um, is just business for me because I'm trying to gather facts. I am trying to understand where we are as a district and what this charter is proposed to bring in for the education of our students and particularly our socially economically disadvantaged students. I, I want to hear the information. I want to know how he came up with the marketing, if he, uh, how he came out with the recruitment of parents or talking to parents and if he were targeting children that were uh, have high chronic absenteeism or socially economically disadvantaged or however he's targeting those parents and he's maybe targeting them at a uh, Saturday soccer game, then so be it. I want to get that information. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not into attacking my colleagues. That's not me. That's not my style. I am not the type that's going to divide this board. I'd rather work with this board. And it's been several times that I have been on the short end of the stick. And I, I can tell you right now, I will tell you, I don't agree with the board's decision, but I'll support it. And that's the way it's always been. With that being said, I, I'm just going to cut through everything and cut through the chase. I'm, I'm not going to do a long presentation or, or, or anything or talk about public comments or a stack of forms that I didn't look at. I'm honing in on the best interests of our kids, the ones that speak different languages in Rancho Cordova. I want to talk about the board's recommendation and the presentation they set forth. Uh, Dr. Kiefer, I want to thank you for your presentation. And I just, you know, please understand that the questions I ask you, 
It's business. I want to know. I want to ascertain information. I want to get all that. I want to get it because I learn. Like I said, I'm learning. And I think everybody on this board, every board meeting, you're going to learn. I think those board members who go to the CSBA conference are, you know, are going to learn different things in particular and particularly about budgets and attendance and absenteeism and even charter schools. We're going to learn. Uh, that's the role of us as a governing board to continue to learn, continue to get input from the community, uh, and continue to make right decisions in effort to govern this district. Um, there were a few things that caught my attention that um, I had concerns about. Uh, one was the proposed location. If that's going to be the location, then yeah, I have some issues, not necessarily with transportation, but the area that it's in. That's a concern. I think it's a legitimate concern. So I hope my colleagues don't shoot me down for having that concern. Um, you know, I... I had a concern about the programs that we have in place um, and the programs that you are proposing. It almost seems like it's a conditional thing that, well, yeah, we can probably do it. We're proposing it, but does that mean it's going to get done? So that's the point I'm trying to make on that. Um, you know, like I said, the other concern I had were the, how do we help those kids that speak those different languages? H how do we do that? How do, how do we do the staffing? H how do you get those teachers to come in? I mean, you know, even though they say there's not a teacher shortage, I, I still believe there is. I mean, I've talked to colleagues throughout the district. Yeah, and they're, they're struggling just like everybody. I mean, we are just like everybody else. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I am going to support the board's, rec I mean, the staff's recommendation to deny the petition. I know there's still work that we need to do, and I'm, I'm still hoping that we can work with you. Um, you know, I'm always open for a good coffee and conversation. You know that. Um, but yeah, I, those are my concerns, and just looking at everything... Um, like I said, you know, there were some things that Mr. Short said that I didn't agree with. There's some things that Mr. Hoover said that he didn't agree with, or Mr. Reed or Mr. Huey, but God darn it, I am not going to attack my governance board. We are here to work together and not throw each other under the bus. And I mean, it's just, it's been happening the past, what, three years that we're constantly attacking each other. And, and I know, hon honestly... I'll hear it tomorrow. I'll hear it either an email, phone call, or either on social media. But you know what? I'm going to own it. I am going to own it. I'm not going to dance around it. I'm not going to make it political. I'm not going to make, make it anything. I'm going to own my decision. So my decision is support the staff and uh, reject the petition. That's it. That's all. Okay. That's right. Um, I'm, I'm struggling with this. Um, if it's possible, I'd like to hear my uh, remaining colleagues' thoughts on the matter. Okay, you, Mr. Green. I just think of it like this: in, in three years, if New Pacific Charter hits its targets, that's 202 families that have a school that's working for them that otherwise might not have. And that does mean that there would be funding coming out of SUSD's budget, but it's also funding that belongs to these students. And if we can find a school that works for them, it, it would be unethical not to allow that. Uh, so it's, it's that simple to me. The, the funding falls to students. If we can find a school that works for the students, let's do that. It's also 0.5% of our expected budget. Uh, 
So I, I think it is a hit if it does come out of our budget that we can take for the sake of those students and those families. As Mr. Hoover said, uh, it's up to these families if they attend, it's up to New Charter to build a program that works for them. And if they don't, the risk is on New Charter, not on FCUSD. Uh, so if a family doesn't like the location, if a family doesn't like the transportation issues, if a family doesn't like the programs that are being offered, they're under no obligations to continue going to this school. But if it does work for them, we ought to provide every opportunity we can to give those students that choice to go to that school. Uh, if a family stays in their current school and FCUSD is meeting all their needs, that's good news for us. That means we are doing things right. If a family decides to go to New Charter and it meets their needs and they succeed, that's good news for us because that means families in our community are getting what they need. That's a win-win for me. It means either we're doing well or our community is doing well. The community and the families in the community benefit from both of those things. So just real quick final comment is, I guess instead of seeing New Charter as a threat to our district, which I, I hear a lot of, uh, talk that makes it seem that way. Um, well, I'd like to see it be a potential benefit to the families in our district because we can help between FCUSD and New Pacific to meet the needs of the students that we do have. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I'll, uh, for David, I'll, I'll, I'll go next. Um, Alice? Or Alice, now Gallison and me, and then you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I reached out to like some Cordova students um, who reached out to others in their area and they all kind of expressed the same uh, sentiment and it echoes the staff recommendation um, that the services that the new Pacific Charter School would offer are already provided by the district and um, the type of action moving forward that they'd like to see is improvement and expansion on these services rather than um, just a supplement to them or even just a duplication of them. Um, and I think like Mr. Meyer said, the, um, like a large factor in preventing absenteeism is building those deeper connections with our students um, and just approving, improving on those um, existing programs that um, can form these deeper connections. So um, I just think the solution would be to um, just improve and expand and um, constantly work to better the schools in our district rather than just um, duplicating the programs they offer. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. I want to take a little bit of what uh, Mr. Clark said. You know, uh, I think it's inappropriate that board members uh, attack each other. And I think, Mr. Hoover, I think, I think you made a mistake there. Uh, I think it was not inappropriate for what staff put it up here and I brought up here. I, you know, I'm not going to say it's not appropriate that we got it into the records. Like, these are still not in the records. So I, I disagree with you on that. I think also the DLAC inappropriate uh, translation if you would have attended the parent forum and understand how DLAC works in our communities, that is a wonderful program. They have a lot of translations and they provide translations for parents that want to come to the board. That's one of their services they do. It's not political, it's providing a service. So I think you're kind of off, off on that one. And it's, it's harm, harmful to our staff on that. You know, you guys talk about running for you, Mr. Hui, you always had the parents' voice in mind. When I was asking out there, I've been listening and listening for weeks. I don't hear the parents' voice. I don't hear the local voice. I don't, we don't have local support in our community. Our own leadership, it doesn't say we have it here. I try all the emails I've been getting from local folks and parents is all in opposition. I haven't seen any in favor in my community and in the rancher community. You live in Folsom, I understand that. But you don't live in the community, you're not in connected with. When I go down to the Taqueria, if I, ever, I speak the language, I live there, I understand the community a whole lot better than you guys. And so do our community leaders. So I'm looking for the parents' voice. That's what you guys ran on, so you should be asking for the parents' voice. I don't hear it. So, I did not oppose streaming, I was asking, when I'm going to talk, I'm going to make the record straight here. When I wanted ADA compliant for streaming, I was not opposing streaming. I wanted compliance for our, uh, for our disabled community. Because if you go streaming, you don't have ADA compliant. You're excluding that community. So that's the record straight there too. 
So I'm going to leave it at that, Mr. Hoover. Transportation is a big deal. Years ago when I ran for the first time transportation, I think, Rob, um, if you do public transportation, it puts our kids at risk. They put them on a bus. There was a whole big thing. I remember our classified union was in, remember that? And that was a big deal back then. And so if we're ever going to rely on public transportation, that is not a place for kids to be. We are thinking about our kids when we talk about transportation. That is the safest thing. So I totally, you know, we have to find safe routes to school and safe transportation to our kids. They don't provide it. So the kids that um, come from the social economic area, Dr. Kiefer couldn't guarantee anybody can apply. So if a, a parent in Folsom can have their kids and they can afford to drive them clear across town, just like we have the kids in Rancho, go to Folsom, if somebody can, they can do back and forth. So yes, so anybody can apply. I have major concerns that this charter may not turn out to be, meet the targeted demographic of kids that we're trying to do. I didn't hear a guarantee on that. There is no guarantee. I don't see how they're doing it. I didn't see that. So, you know, bringing up my voting, you talked about you had more votes than me. Well, I went for a record. If anybody go down fair for a house, I raised zero dollars and I ran just on my name. I don't know how many tens of thousands of dollars you guys raised. Nobody owns me. Okay, I'm going to set the record straight when you say that. Uh, people vote me in because I'm part of the community. I did not get the community emails. I did not get any of that. I don't see any of that. And, and you talk about competition. Well, Dr. Deming, if you ever read the 14 points, internal competition is a kiss of death. You don't want to have somebody come into your house, eat you out of house and home, cut your budget, and call that healthy competition. You go to a football game, that's not a healthy competition. It's external competition. And that's how we, over the years, how we created uh, River View, uh, River View STEM is when all the petitions came to, I've seen a lot of good petitions, but a whole lot worse petitions. They were just incomplete. They don't have the resources. They didn't have it. So what, I, what we came up in the past was to com the external competition was to become from good to great in our organization. That's how STEM came. That's how we did all these other ones, as we mentioned before. So I agree competition is great, but it has to be external, not internal. This is internal. So that part in the law that talks about competition, I think it's a flawed concept. We need external competition that's healthy. That's how the free enterprise works. That's how a private business works. It's not inside the, in your home. And you know, I don't want to bring up the, ag, ag, the attorney general thing, but there's a lot of concerns there, I think, from the district side that you probably don't know about which is really concerning to me. And the board knows. And so be careful how you vote tonight. School choice is also that what you talk about is a political agenda, okay? It's a political agenda, I understand that. Kevin Kiley, your senator, I've listened to all his things. Yeah, you're gonna have to vote that way, Hoover. I know, I understand that, okay? So you wanna get political, then don't do that in public, okay? So, Falsa Cordova has the best model for our kids. They are the choice. We are the choice because we have proven track record of providing the best services for our kids that are left here, that we're targeting. Our community, we work closely in partners with our city partners, our leaders. If you see the after school and after food programs, we are the best ones for those kids. There is no other model. I don't see, other than duplicity, of the programs that we talked about. Even the students even said that. The kids in our own community are saying that. They don't see any options, other options or school choice for them. I don't hear it. If I did hear it, and if I hear the parents' voice, and I did it, I would consider it, because we did approve a charter here before. It's not, we need to find the right charter. We need to find the right one that is going to be that. I see this application as incomplete. I see a lot of holes in it. I see a lot of things. It just doesn't come across to me as anything. So, also, I just want to say there's a lot here in the budget. We do have to talk. That's business. When it does talk about half percent or whatever, we can't compare because this is COVID time. 
$2 million is $2 million, and you know our budget. We'll be talking about our, our, our certification with the county board of education, which is Mr. Kiefer, on our certification for our budget. So it's $2 million. We have $5 million at structural deficit. We're living on steroids right now with all the one-time funding. We don't see all those changes. We're, we need to talk about it. it. It is part of our kids because there's going to be programs that might be cut across the district. $2 million or $5 million, we might get, I get certification. And then the county board and the superintendent of schools comes in, they start managing what we do. So we need to be cognizant of that. That's part of our responsibility, our oversight. That's what we're elected for to do. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to be in support of the staff's recommendations to deny. Doesn't mean there's a lot of options for them to do an appeal and all that kind of stuff, and we'll see how it goes. I just don't see the district being the authorizing. If the county wants to be that, fine. But I, you know, that's, but we will see how that comes out. So with that said, I'm gonna hand it over to our final. Yeah, make a few comments Oh yes, too. we'll go to you <laughs> and then you, okay, 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 and you can go ahead, yes. Okay. Um, on behalf of our staff and on behalf of our board, you know, we, we thank those that come forward and, and give us an opportunity to look at other choice and options. And I think our board has been on the cutting edge of looking at choice and options for parents and for students for many years with this current board, with previous boards, with, with as recently as last spring when we started a new school called Innovations Academy, which is a virtual school. And we've, we've uh, also advocated for many different opportunities from, for students at the elementary, the middle and the high school level. And we have many examples of that. We shared those in our findings of fact, but ultimately our board has a responsibility. Our staff has a responsibility. And we took our job very seriously in looking at what the ed code elements are of determining if this particular choice of this petition is offering something that Folsom Cordova doesn't. It doesn't mean that we're opposed to other options and choices. I think we have always been open-minded and will continue to be. The question for this board is, is this, the, is this the right fit for a charter, an independent charter school to increase those options for students, looking at what we needed to look at in terms of the ed code requirements for a charter petition. As you heard from our staff's report, Many things were, um, conditions were met, some were deficient, some were able to be mitigated, but ultimately there are significant deficiencies in the petitions that, that was prevent, presented to us tonight and the time frame in order to correct those significant deficiencies don't look like a realistic timeline knowing what those deficiencies are, specifically on the facilities piece being probably one of the greatest deficiencies as far as meeting that timeline of August 2022 implementation. So with that, I just want to remind our board that we have due diligence as the authorizing agency to keep all of that in mind. And, and I know there's a lot of um, different opinion and perspective and, and we all have uh, the right to have those opinions and perspectives, but ultimately what is our due diligence as a board um, in carrying out our duty and function in being the authorizing agency of, of the charter petition. This is a first for us, so I know this is this is a huge and very heavy responsibility and deliberation, um, but that's what we have to keep in mind when the final decision is made. Mm -hmm. Okay. Last one out. <laughs> all right. Uh, let me try to put this all together. All right. Um, for starters, uh, Dr. Kiefer, thank you for bringing this uh, application to uh, the board. Um, you know, I, I've said before, and I'll say again, that, that I truly believe competition is good. It's not something to be scared of. Competition forces everybody to do better, um, including school districts including individual schools. It's the lack of competition when folks may not strive to 
think outside the box, force difficult conversations, and come up with new ways of doing things. Um, and Mr. Hoover is correct. Um, one of the things that I was very passionate about running for school board was my desire to see smaller, not only smaller class sizes, um, but also trying to convince my, my colleagues to think outside the box on, on school facilities. Um, you know, not one size fits all um, works for everybody. And now granted, we have a lot of varying programs and, and, and methodologies in different schools, but, you know, especially uh, the size of facilities. I mean, you know, we have some very, well, not necessarily in the elementary level, but at the middle and high school, we have some very large facilities that um, not all students thrive at. Uh, and, you know, it would be nice to see FCUSD consider some smaller facilities, smaller schools that cater to the population that, that we're not, catering to right now. Um, and this application seems to have um, revived that conversation. And I think that's a good thing um, that we're having these conversations. And I wonder if it wasn't for the application, when would we get to those conversations? And it kind of dovetails with my thoughts that competition is good. It took an application for us to start to have these conversations again. And if this were approved and FCUSD had competition, I am confident it will force us to do even better. Um, You know, I, I, there were a number of, well, it was probably more in emails than, that, than spoken tonight where folks have said as a, as a fault of New Pacific that they've never operated a classroom-based school. Well, that's, that's true. But I don't know, <laughs> I don't see that as, as a fault. Um, we all try new things. We have to try new things. Um, do, does FCUSD take a chance every time we hire a new teacher right out of school? Yes. Do we take a gamble after two years and we grant tenure to teachers? Yes. So when a, when a company opens for the first time, Tesla, we'll use Tesla. There's never been a self-driving car or a, a viable electric car. There's always a first for everybody individually. There's always a first for businesses. There's always a first for educational models. And to say that you have to have had experience in order to be good at something is just not true. Now, Yes, you need to make sure whatever um, you're looking at is a quality model that you're confident will, will do well. I mean, you just don't, you, you don't approve a charter school for the sake of approving a charter school. Um, it has to be a charter school that, that works. Um, you know, I've heard tonight several people talk about that FCUSD pro uh, provides better outcomes, that FCUSD has rigor, that FCU FCUSD has proven outcomes, that to go with New Pacific Charter School would be a gamble. Well, all right, so let's, let's talk about that. Um, if you look at uh, the California assessment of student performance and progress, and you look at uh, the test results for the state of California for uh, English language and math 
first of all, it's, it's appalling. Um, but 51.1% um, of schools in California meet or exceed English language, 51%. I mean, I, how's that even possible? But, but math is even worse. So um, in math, in the state of California, 39.7% of schools met or exceeded standards. Uh, um, now, Folsom Cordova, yeah, which is nice, we're, we're better than the state, yay. Um, but it's not necessarily something to be proud of because Folsom Cordova as a school district for math, for English, it's 63.49. Okay, so we're better than 51%. Uh, and for, for math, we're at 52% rather than 39%. All right, so we're better than the state, still an embarrassment. Um, now let's look at Rancho Cordova schools. And I'm, I won't, I'll just focus on English language, um, but math is always worse. Cordova Gardens, 39%. Cordova Villa, 37%. Navigator, 52%. Still lower than, uh, actually that's higher than the state. Um, Peter J. Shields, 43%. Rancho Cordova Elementary, 27%. 27%. Um, White Rock, 30%. Williamson, 39%. Even when you look at the secondary, Cordova, 40, uh, high, 49%. Mills, 28%. Mitchell, 37%. Now you'll notice I did skip a couple and I'll get back to them in a second. I, I'm sorry, we are failing our students right now. You can't tell me any of those percentages is anything to be proud of. I, I mean, it feels like you need to be apologizing for what, what we're doing now it's not I'm not saying that as a dig to, to, to the teachers. We are doing our best, but our best can be better. Competition could be better. Now, we do have some bright spots in Rancho Cordova that are worth highlighting. Mather Heights, 68%. So that's, that's uh, um, higher than, actually that's higher than uh, FCOD's average. Um, you have uh, you have Riverview STEM, as we've said, is is knocking it out the park. Eighty six percent, eighty six percent. That is incredible. Um, and then uh, and, and Navigator, I already mentioned. So so back to the comments. FCSD has better outcomes. Do we really? FCUSD has rigor, do we really? FCSD has proven outcome. Is this a proven outcome that we want to say is something that we should admire? No. So, you know, as for the, the new charter application, you know, after reading the, the application, after reading the staff report, I will say that I, I do think that the vast majority of the items that were highlighted by staff in the areas where they did not find them conforming, in my mind were minor and could have been resolved if we had more time. Uh, they, they really were not major issues in, in, in my mind. Um, you know, I think it's important to note that section, Education Code section 47605 subdivision C, uh, it has some interesting language there, which I think is important to note. 
that the chartering authority, this is the language, the chartering authority shall be guided by the, by the intent of the legislature, state legislature, that charter schools are and should become an integral part of the California educational system and that establishment of charter schools should be encouraged. So even though the legislature has created a bizarre process for approving charter schools, they at least have statutorily codified that they see the value and they should be an integral part and they should be encouraged. Um, it goes on to say um, the governing board of the school district shall consider the academic needs of pupils the schools propose to serve. Well, I know that the academic needs that these statistics are showing that, um, and by the way, I did go back and look at uh, um, new charters for schools to see how they compared with our percentages. And, in some instances, some of their schools did better. Majority of them were about even with uh, the percentages. So, um, but the, the final uh, the determination here is is the governing board. Again, this is section forty seven six hundred five subdivision C. Reads: The governing board of the school district shall not deny a petition for the establishment of a charter school unless it makes written factual findings specific to the particular petition, setting forth specific facts to support one or more of the following findings. And there's eight. And I've been going over and over and over and over this list. And again, I find that the new Pacific Charter School is a quality program. But I don't think they meet all of these eight requirements. I think there was a tactical error in the application in focusing on absenteeism rather than focusing on hands-on education. I don't think if absenteeism was not the focus, but providing hands-on education was the focus, I think they would have met all of the requirements in this. Partly because of the location or the lack of location. By suggesting, well, first of all, we don't know the location, but the, the proposed location is uh, at least tentatively is on Kilgore. And I think item number two says the petitioners are demonstrably unlikely to successfully implement the program set forth in the petition, set forth in the petition. And as what's set forth in the petition is that it's based on absenteeism and I can't see a, a successful outcome that you're going to be getting students in the schools that are identified as having high absenteeism over to the location where on Kilgore. I think if they found a location north of 50 where the high absenteeism exists, it's another slam dunk. You could still focus on absenteeism because there was a re there's a realistic opportunity for the kids to get to the, to the school. But given the needs of students that have high absenteeism, to think that they're going to get from north of 50 over to south of 50, I think is, is what makes this program not successful if we're focusing on absenteeism. It goes on to say that the charter uh, number seven, the charter school is demonstrably unlikely to serve the interests of the entire community in which the school is proposing to locate. Again, I think it's proposed location is not gonna satisfy that requirement. I think if they could find a, a location north of 50, I'm confident they would satisfy that requirement. So ultimately, 
um, based on those two items, um, I regretfully am going to vote no on it. I, and, you know, I'm a big fan of charter schools, but I just don't think it meets the statutory requirement um, as, as, as is laid out. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this before, but, um, you know, I, I was actually one of the staff members in the New York State Legislature that drafted the New York State Charter School Law. Um, they work. They work. Um, and the competition works. But the, the applicant here just uh, has fallen sh um, short on, in my mind on um, two other items. So I'm going to vote now. Roll call. Mr. Short, this would be in support of, so, oh, no, the motion on the table. Let me repeat the motion on the table was to um, approve the charter and not take staff's recommendation. I would say a no for me. Mr. Reed? Uh, no. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? No. Mr. Huey? Yes. Ms. Gal? No. Okay, so I'm asking for a motion yeah, to, to support. We just said, no, now we come back. Oh, yeah. So I need a motion now to... To support staff's recommendation? Support staff's recommendation. Do I have a, a motion? I'll move to support staff's recommendation for denial of petition. You probably need me to second it, don't you? Um, Yes, I'll okay. second it. Okay, roll call. Mr. Short? Yes. Mr. Reed? Yes. Mr. Hoover? No. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Huey? No. Ms. Gao? Aye. Motion carries 3-0, uh, 3-2, okay. sorry. Okay, uh, and thank you everyone for sticking here and thank you, Mr. Kiefer. Moving on to public hearing uh, item B, notice of public hearing education effectiveness of block grant. Superintendent. Yes, a second public hearing that we have this evening. Um, and again, it's required uh, by um, the funding source coming from the state for one-time dollars to help support professional learning and development with the educator effectiveness grant is to hold the public hearing at this meeting and give you a description of what the allocation can be used for and then for the board to take action at the following meeting. Okay. So Ms. Carla Magno is going to give a brief overview of the potential uses for the allocation of $4.6 million to Folsom Cordova. Welcome Ms. Carla Magno. Thank you Dr. Cleegan and good evening. President Short, board, colleagues. I will be brief, I know it is late. Uh, FCUSD is slated to receive approximately $4.6 million this fall. Information will be presented tonight and then recommend for adoption at the December 16th board meeting. This is a five-year grant and at this time we have a general plan in place due to a quick state timeline. There are 10 allowable uses for these funds and they are all rooted in professional learning. I will highlight a general overview of the proposed use. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. Uh, funds may be used to support professional learning for certificated teachers, administrators, paraprofessional educators, and certificated staff. There are 10 opportunities in which funds can be expended that include coaching and mentoring certificated staff serving in an instructional setting. We would include learning community coaching for site administrators and teachers, teacher and administrator induction programs. I'm very excited about this one. Robust professional development for our classified staff that work with students in the educational setting. This is well needed in our district. Practices to create a positive school climate that would be around PBIS. Next slide, please. 
And then we would be focusing on programs that lead to effective standards aligned instruction and improve instruction in literacy across all subject areas. And we have a program right now that over 200 of our teachers are receiving, it's a PD and it's called Letters. It's Language Essentials for Teachers Teaching, Reading and Spelling. And it is rooted in the science of reading. And I would like to expand this with this grant. So we also have strategies to implement social emotional learning that improve pupil well-being. And then to improve our inclusion practices, we're gonna look at universal design for learning. It's something that we have had sp training at different schools, but I would like to bring it to all special education teachers and general education. And then lastly, uh, instruction and education to support implementing effective language acquisition for our language learners. And we have used guided language acquisition development PD in the past. Next slide, please. So curriculum and instruction is gonna partner with the following groups for input on these funds. So our bargaining unit certificated and classified, I would like their input as well as our site principals. I've given this presentation to both the elementary and secondary principals already. And then other FCUSD departments such as special education, SEL equity, HR, ETIS and categorical programs. So this concludes my presentation. And I just wanted to say thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Carly Magno. Okay, any uh, board questions? Mr. President. Yes, you have some. Ms. Um, Carly Magno, thank you for that uh, presentation. I'm just kind of curious on the timeline that we'll be um, partnering with these groups for input. When is that going to happen? I think it's working now, yes. Great question, board member Clark. Uh, this will be ongoing. So we just had to submit a general plan. We do have to meet the 10 um, allowable uses for the educator effectiveness funds. So we can adopt an overview, a general overview, and then we can drill down and create a more solid plan later. Okay, thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Any other board questions? Hearing none, um, we have to open up public hearing. Do we have anybody from the public that would like to speak on this matter, including virtual? Do we have any? Hearing none, hearing is closed. Bring it back in final board comments. None? Okay. That's it for the hearing. All right, we're going to move on to the public hearing item C. Folsom Cordova Unified School District proposed contract openers for Article 2 for the Folsom Cordova Education Association 2021 22 negotiations. Superintendent? Yes, this is procedural in nature. So, our bargaining team, um, our district, and FCEA groups can open up Article 2 to negotiate uh, revisions to the article to include teachers that are at our different alternative sites. So, with that, um, it would uh, give us the ability to do so. Okay. Any board questions? Hearing none, or we'll come back to we'll open up the hearing. Anybody from the public would like to speak virtually? Seeing none, close the hearing. We're done. On the next item, uh, Mr. President, yes, sir. Uh, point of order. Um, we have crossed the 1030 threshold. Okay. Um, We're uh, going to have to go a little longer. And I'm yeah. going to also propose we uh, go back to B, C, D, and E and do discussion item on the district safety committee as we have students here tonight. So if that's okay with the board and you can make your motion yeah, to include right. that if you could do that. Yes, uh, I move that uh, the meeting be extended to no later than 11.30 p.m. and that the next item that we take up is the um, recommendations from the, the security uh, okay. committee. Okay, item 12. Item 12. Yes, the discussion second? action item. Yeah, do you have Just a for clarification, I, I second. Hey, roll call. Oh, just, oh, yes. <laughs> okay, we all just say aye. 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 Okay. Motion carries. Motion carries. It's just Thank a you. procedural thing. Okay, so approve or deny. Okay, we'll move on to uh, item 12, discussion on uh, item A, District Safety Steering Committee Report and Recommendation Superintendent. 
Yes, I want to thank all those that have participated in the safety steering committee. I want to thank those that are in the audience and have stayed until this late hour. Appreciate yeah. that. I also appreciate um, your voice that has been um, listened to and heard uh, over the course of several months um, with our different student groups and um, appreciate those that have participated and uh, working together with district and different um, staff to look at where we have come to consensus and the work that we continue to have to do. So Mr. Meyer, we'll start the presentation. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, good evening, Dr. Kluge and members of the board, cabinet, and everyone else here. Um, I'd like to first introduce uh, my partners that will be helping present tonight, and they've been, we've kind of been working on this together the whole time. Uh, we have Kate Hazarian, and she's our coordinator of social emotional academic development, and Peter Maroon, our director of athletics. Uh, and before we get started, I definitely want to recognize the members of our committee who are here right now. Um, so if you could stand up, if you've been part of the committee, I know we have a few of you. So I, uh, yes, yes, I, I definitely, uh, on behalf of the district, just so appreciate the effort, the long nights, um, well over 15 hours. You can sit down, uh, <laughs> but I do appreciate that. And. Uh, President Short, Board Member Huey, uh, also really appreciate not only your attendance, but your input, and that's huge. I think part of the point of the committee was to have a well-rounded committee. Um, and I'd also, Alice, I, I appreciate you being part of that. The last couple, you brought a great, um, you know, representing all the students in our district, really uh, powerful, and it worked so so closely with, with the students that we already had. Uh, and then where's uh, where's Nina at? I, oh, she's here. <laughs> Nina has been our awesome moderator, and uh, she has just uh, been dedicated, and she's going to be here till the end. So we appreciate her, uh, you know, guiding us and her leadership. So, uh, and do we have the clicker? Oh, right there. Um, can you put it on? Present mode. No, no worries. Uh, so we had a, we've had safety committees before, and I think you'd be hard pressed to find any studies out there, any um, surveys out there, nationally, that where safety does not rank as one of the top concerns, not only for students, for staff, for community, uh, for parents. And our district's no different. Uh, we've had safety committees before. They've been very broad and focused. Uh, this committee really did have more of a, a razor focus. And that was really to, uh, was put on by the board, was asked by the board, is to bring back <coughs> a couple, um, at least two different uh, Model A, Model B, however you want to put it, but a couple different recommendations uh, how we can best meet the need of safety for all our students. Uh, I think it's also safe to say with current events, uh, whether we've seen additional violence in our schools, um, also the killing of George Floyd, we've, we've seen um, definitely folks within our community, within our schools, even within this room, who feel real passionately how we can best meet the needs of all of our students when it comes to safety. Um, there's a lot of passion here, and we did spend some time going over norms. We felt that those were really important, and if we can't have these discussions with our uh, really diverse and eclectic team, if we don't feel comfortable speaking our mind or speaking our heart, speaking our truth, then we're not going to move forward. So we did, we did spend some time on our norms uh, before we did get started. So, Also the challenge that uh, this was something that the board um, and staff really have been working for, working towards, and we did present this back in May. Uh, these are some of the questions that were brought up from this very board, and uh, I think that social and emotional piece, we, we often think of safety as the physical safety, but we also know that that emotional piece is real, and that's been highlighted with meetings here, in our leadership, whether it's Gen Up, our BSU, uh, we've seen this with COVID really on steroids, how important our, uh, our emotional health is. 
I would say equally as important as our physical. So when we are talking about safety, I would like, I would ask the board to think of both of those. Uh, decrease racial, racial disproportionality in the district. We know we have uh, disproportionality, not only with discipline, but with attendance, with graduation rates. Um, and we, we also with law enforcement arrest. The restorative model is also another piece that we've really been focusing on the last three years and we get it takes a few years to really, really five years to really shift into a, this concept, but we're really excited about that work, but it's still a challenge and we have a lot of work to go, a, a long ways to go there. And then consistency in law enforcement interactions with students. Uh, this MOU that the board is, and, and I don't envy you, this is the first MOU really that we've done radical changes to in almost 20 years with the SROs. And that also puts our SROs in a tight spot because we have kind of had an archaic uh, agreement with them mm -hmm. that as, as we know through our six board meetings, we've done a lot of adjustments to that. Uh, we also wanna improve the communication between interested groups around the safety practices. And uh, really the question the board is, has to decide is, is are the SROs the best, uh, the most effective use? Um, and it, so I am gonna pass it over to Kate Azarian. Thank you so much. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, we held five evening meetings between September and November, ranging from two to three hours each. We had representatives and invited them from our different student leadership groups, our labor groups, law enforcement partners, as well as student and parent leaders from Rancho Cordova and Folsom. We had an average of 20 committee members attend each meeting, as well as a few guest student leaders for our last two meetings. The topics we discussed were understanding our current safety model, reviewing discipline data and survey feedback, discussing the disproportionate impact that our current safety and discipline models have had on special education, low income and black and brown youth, reimagining what safety looks like on our campuses with a focus on restorative practices. And we also had an opportunity um, to learn how to use a consensus model when we're making recommendations on difficult subjects. Part of the process that Nina led us through was empathy gathering and empathy gathering. One of the challenges she really had for us is to see things from somebody else's perspective. And so she gave us a process for going out into the community and talking to other, other students, staff, parents, just about what safety meant to them. So some of the questions were, what do you love about your school? What concerns do you have about our current safety practices? Is safety the same as security? We use this feedback to create our empathy maps and that's the foundation of the recommendations that you're seeing this evening. You'll also see on there that we had expert presentations from Fairfield Sassoon, which has a SRO model, uh, San Juan Unified and Sac City, which both moved away from an SRO model. Research tells us that in order for students to learn, retain and apply knowledge, they must feel physically and emotionally safe. The last two years of public comment at board meetings has made it clear that what makes one student, parent or staff member feel safe may feel like intimidation to someone else. The safe and supportive schools model was developed by a national panel of researchers and focuses on engagement, safety and environment. The committee applied this holistic approach to conversations around what our district needs to have as part of a comprehensive safety model. Part of what we talked about quite a bit is substance abuse and that's 60% of our calls for law enforcement support and really looking at a more restorative way to support our students that are using or abusing drugs. All right, and we have all heard staff, student and community concerns about the need for more mental health supports in our schools, and we have responded. This graph shows the investment that FCUSD has made to add staffing to meet the emotional needs of our students. Seven years ago, we hired our first five mental health specialists. Now we have 17. We also have several school social workers that support mental health and system change at their schools. This dedicated team provides individual and group counseling, connects families and community resources with community resources and conducts mental health risk assessments. 
Thanks to additional COVID related state and federal funding, we've also added additional campus monitors, yard supervisors, and an additional assistant principal at Cordova High. So this is a partial list of the professional development that goes on in our district and some of it will be supported by the funds that Angie spoke about. But we recognize that professional development is a, and safety is a continuous improvement process. This is not a destination. And we have had to expand our professional development to meet the physical needs of our, our schools for safety, but also emotional needs. And when the return to school we knew was gonna be rough and it has been. We have made a public commitment to disrupting practices that have a disproportionately negative impact on any of our student subgroups. This commitment is seen in our professional development offerings and cultural responsiveness, understanding the impact of trauma on behavior and repairing harm through a restorative approach to discipline. We are continuing to teach adults strategies for de-escalation and exploring peer mediation models. We are on the path to make sure every student has explicit SEL instruction weekly to learn self-management, social awareness, and responsible decision-making. This is only a partial list of the PD happening in our district and was critical for our committee to consider as we developed the recommendations we are sharing with you tonight. I'll pass it to Mr. Maroon. Thanks, Kate. So perception of student safety. Our parents and staff were asked to assess student safety, not their own, in the spring of 2021. The survey was sent to secondary parents, some of whom have elementary students as well. Staff survey was for the both elementary and secondary staff. The survey has, that was done at the time was also around the same time we were having our secondary students come back to in-person learning. The committee consensus and the key indicators in regards to safe learning environments. These are the indicators that through this process, our committee determined that these are the best components to measure success of a safety model. As we mentioned before, physical as well as emotional safety has been an emphasis. We've started a restorative approach about four years ago. However, it was not, it's at its infancy as far as the stage that we're in. And then COVID-19 of course, slowed the progress. We need to focus on a restorative approach with all sites, as well as calibrating and norming with our staff. Cultural sens sensitivity and implicit bias training has been emphasized with our administrative team. However, the committee recognized that there's a need to provide this training to a larger group of staff members, including campus monitors and yard supervisors. The wide parents, we need to do a better job of clearly communicating with our families, our approach to safety. Mental health has continued to be a focus of our steering committee, recognizing that also importance of continuing our safety advisory committee meetings quarterly. So in other words, this is not a one and done. This is something we continue to do as we measure progress as we move, as we move forward. And then looking at the common safety improvement areas. These are the areas the committee truly focused on. As Scott and Kate have mentioned before, during this process, the committee, we found our similarities were much larger than our differences. This slide indicates that the growth model, we need to ensure that we do what we said we're going to do and that we need to reflect upon that practice quarterly to monitor for our progress. This was overwhelmingly what all committee members stated. As a priority, we need to move forward. With that in mind, Scott will elaborate on the needs for additional training. Yeah, so, sorry, it's a late night. Yeah. This is, we're coming on hour 16 for all of us, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. All right, so uh, another consensus that we had and also researching other districts and including having San Juan, Fairfield and Sac City coming and presenting to our, our group and committee, uh, we found they all had one thing in common and all the districts surrounding us, our size or larger and even some smaller, they had one person that really overs oversaw safety. Um, 
we've done a lot of shuffling here so we can most effectively serve our population through our, with our management and the board's been part of the shuffle. During that shuffle though, we really do here in Folsom Cordova, we have four or five of us that are involved in safety, but we don't really have one person that that's their sole job. And that's what they go to bed thinking about, wake up thinking about, and when you think safety, that's who you call. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was something that w when we were talking and, and researching, we found out. Uh, so with this position, uh, it, would, it would really assist with investing in our own staff. I, I think we are at a point where we can't keep adding, 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 and we need to invest in our own people. But to do that, we really need someone whose sole job is to invest in those uh, 240.5 FTEs that, uh, that Mrs. Hazarian had mentioned earlier. Because right now our campus monitors, um, our, our yard supervisors, our support staff, a lot of our classified staff that often have closer relationships with kids than some of our teachers, our health clerks. So this position uh, really would be the support for the 34 schools, uh, the families, the communities, staff, but provide that district-wide training. And if they're not up in front providing it, make sure, or facilitating it, uh, they're organizing outside trainers or internal trainers. Um, this also goes with families and students. And um, we are really seeing an uptick in self-medication. And uh, Board Member Reed, I remember you're, you did a really big push for our drug forum. And I, I definitely think that is something we need to bring back annually. Uh, I know we're, we're working with the fentanyl right now, which is just, it makes the hair on my arm stand up when we, when we just even saying that word. So, but it would be great to really start providing meaningful um, conversations with our families and our students and really um, organized um, throughout and not just certain schools. Uh, this position would also uh, be a liaison between FCUSD and the SROs and law enforcement. Uh, that, that restorative response piece that you often are here, gonna hear a lot of our staff talk about, um, that takes a lot more time. That takes a lot more energy. I wanna be really clear about that. The easy thing is to go the punitive model. And I think, I even think as a parent, the easy thing is just send my kid to the room. But that doesn't really change behavior. So we're, we're really working hard and, and, and training, but it, it sure would be nice to have someone who, who could assist with that district-wide. Uh, addressing attendance concerns, I know that's been brought up a lot. Um, that's one of the few things that we can actually make money on, that we can put money out there and get a bigger return, uh, make a true investment. Uh, at least, I, I should say monetary. I think we get, it, we get a return on a lot of things, it's just not monetary. Uh, and then the, the, another big piece is, and we've had a lot, and I think more than normal this, let me rephrase that, I know more than normal. I, have, I actually have the quantitative data on that. We have had a lot of major disruptions this year. And I think having that year and a half off, uh, not off, but where students were not seeing each other, staff was not seeing each other, that's really amplified. But having a contact for these major disruptions is such a huge component. Uh, so if I'm principal A at school B, I know exactly who to call and they triage everything and I can take care of my school and know that I'm in good hands whether I need mental health specialists to be at the school, law enforcement, fire department, um, I need extra administrators. Uh, that, that is a huge piece and, I, and uh, our administrators are spread so thin right now that this is, a, this is something that I strongly feel we need to do. Uh, responsible for preparing and executing the district's emergency operations center uh, for those crises. And also I would say um, other, other training would be that culturally responsive. I mentioned the restorative, uh, the trauma, I think the, I don't have to tell the board this, but trauma, trauma is a fickle beast. And it's not that trauma is popping up for the next six months and it's gonna be gone. The trauma that we're gonna see from this pandemic is gonna be, be here probably as long as I'm gonna be in the district. It's gonna, it's not just with our students, but our staff and our families. So, we, we really need to improve um, our knowledge in that area and how to work, work with uh, folks who are going through trauma. Uh, the de-escalation, the mental health and suicide prevention uh, and active supervision. Everything I just men mentioned, we do a really good job training our teachers in this. 
we do a great job, but there's, we have 2,500 employees and I'm only a teacher's only a thousand of them. Uh, so I did include the cost in there um, that, you know, there's always a price tag, but uh, now Mr. Maroon mentioned earlier, uh, one of the cool things that we did learn is, although we're very passionate on, on um, the best way to support all of our students, just like the board, you all have a lot more in common than you do different. And I really felt that that was the same, same way this committee was. Uh, but we did have two proposals and uh, Mr. Maroon went over a lot of the things we did agree on. And uh, Nina did have a, an awesome exercise called the gradients of agreement, which is really cool when you're, when you're really trying to get some groups that don't agree to try and focus on the things they do agree about. Uh, but on that, we spent our last meeting and I threw up some numbers there. So let's talk about recommendation A. Uh, that would be to keep the current SRO model with additional training. Um, keep, you know, we, we made nine additions last year, we being the board. Um, those, if you remember correctly, those were where we're part of the hiring that we can remove uh, or petition to get a new SRO if it wasn't working out, that if there were any um, complaints about an SRO, it would go through the district office. So I, I have all those if you'd like me to refresh, but including those, but also adopt board policy. This was a really big piece, whether uh, the board uh, moves forward with SROs or not, we still need to have a board policy that really identifies when we use law enforcement and when we don't. Um, I know Mr. Ogden, myself, Mr. Huber, we're working with OCR right now, the Office of Civil Rights. They're gonna come um, and provide a training to our, all of our administrators uh, and we're gonna update our policy. They have some recommendations, so it's really clear cut when, when we contact law enforcement, <laughs> enforcement and when we do not. So. Uh, we're really excited to have that policy. I know some of our neighboring districts have been working on that as well. Elk Grove has a really solid foundation there. Uh, so that current cost is 500,340. And then recommendation B uh, would be the elimination of the SRO models. And this would be based upon the San Juan model. The San Juan model does have a uh, director uh, at the district office, a coordinator position that does the triaging, and then they have safety specialists. So those safety specialists are, uh, are highly trained. Uh, some of them are former law enforcement, uh, some, some are not. And they have cars, they wear polos, they're identifiable, um, so they, are not always located at one school. For example, San Juan's twice the size of Folsom Cordova. They have nine comprehensive high schools and they have seven of these safety specialists. So they, uh, they, they do provide some of the training. They also uh, travel and, and assist when schools are, are needing assistance. And if there was a crisis, they would be involved in that as well. Uh, there is a one-time cost for these folks, including training, laptop, the vehicle, um, handheld radios, and um, a slight annual cost with maintenance, gas, insurance. So, so pretty pretty simple there. Uh, and then the last piece, this, like I said earlier, I, I don't envy the, all the decisions the board has to make. Um, they're tough, but we thought it, as a staff it would help if we cr created a proposed timeline for both models up here. Um, and during our last safety steering committee, we tried to build consensus with the two models, uh, with the exercise, the, with the gradients exercise. Uh, we did find there was still a little bit more need for discussion. We, 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 it was a three hour meeting. I think we went almost three and a half hours, but you could tell it's kind of like right now, our, our eyes were getting a little heavy and, uh, we also, the hybrid model was, po was discussed mm -hmm. uh, and brought up and we had some pretty good conversations on that. And there was one other component that I 
don't think we quite quite finished, and that was the risk mitigation factors for both models. Mm -hmm. What both models might by might not completely meet the needs of all of our students, staff, and community. Uh, so this this timeline uh, really is up here. Uh, I, I guess the first one that we would recommend probably having one more meeting to go over these components and also anything that we that might arise during our discussion tonight. Uh, so we could go over the, the timeline here. I just wanted to we wanted to give a little bit of an idea to the board what we, we think it would take if we went with either A or B. Uh, we have those listed in spring and those listed in the summer. And uh, I, I, it's worth mentioning, uh, working with San Juan, they were very vocal that the, if they were to do it over again, uh, when they went with the safety specialist model, they said that they transitioned too quickly mm -hmm. and it was an extremely rough year. Mm -hmm. um, so that was mentioned when we met with them individually and then when they came and presented to our team. So I, I did want the, the board to know that and with that said, uh, okay. we are open for any questions. Hey, board questions. Uh, do I have? Uh, Mr. President. Okay, Mr. Clark and Mr. Hoover, did you want to? I, this, I, my iPad died. Is this a discussion, correct? Only discussion. Okay, I'm just clarifying. Yeah, I mean, whatever. We wanted to vet it out. And, yeah, that works. Okay. And, and, and you heard Scott saying there's needs more discussion yeah. and this is a good forum to do it right yeah, yeah. I, I agree Mr. Scott thank you for um, proposing this just a couple of questions you actually had groups from other um, districts come in I, I believe San Juan San Su uh, Fairfield Sassoon and Sac City I'm, I'm just kind of curious who did the presentation from Sac City uh, Raymond Le... Ra what's Raymond's Hey, Lozado. Lozado, yeah. Is it any way affiliated with uh, BCLC, Black Child Legacy? Uh, they've they've assisted with some of the um, with some of, like the lunchtime and after school, helping kind of monitor. Okay. But uh, I don't know. I, they have an MOU with them, but he didn't mention he didn't too mention. too much. But uh, I know that he's working closely with them. Mm -hmm. I, I can give a quick cliff notes of the three different models that presented, if you'd like. Um, Actually, no, I, if you can send it, I, I thought it was sent to the board before, but obviously not. Um, it was a while ago. It was, it was back in Yeah, if you September. can resend it, that'd be great. I, and the question, the reason why I asked that is because obviously I'm mm -hmm. a program director for Black Child Legacy Campaign, so I just was wondering about that. So, um, yeah, I was kind of looking at this... Uh, um, Gradients of agreement, and boy, I mean, it's just so conflicting, um, these numbers. Um, was this something that, that the group worked on together? I mean, uh, how, did, how did they come up with, like, I'm looking at the wholehearted endorsement and the abstentions and everything else like that. How, how did that work? Right, so... Yes, we've kind of spent all five meetings building up to this. Uh, to be tr completely transparent, we were hoping that we could get those numbers a little bit, uh, not on the outside, but get a little bit closer to the middle. Right. Uh, and that's another reason why I think we need a little bit more time to meet. Uh, we, we were really trying to be cognizant of the board and all the pressures. And if you were to make any, any decisions to make any changes that you had time for that. Mm -hmm. But I think safety, this is too important to rush. And I really do feel strongly about that. Um, and that's why we are asking for that additional meeting if, if the board grants that. Um, but that, that's kind of, I, I agree with you, I hear you. Yeah, and, and the other thing I, gosh, I, I think I've been probably talking about this ever since I came on the board. There's little or no discussion about the roles of a campus monitor, none whatsoever. What are they doing on campus? What are their roles? Um, I see nothing. And, and the only reason why I bring that up, and, and you know, I'll say it again, uh, when I 
got out of the military, my first job was a campus monitor. And I mean, it was work. Uh, building relationships, yes, and breaking up fights and, and everything else. And I'm just kind of... Can, can I answer that, though? Sure. Because we did spend quite a bit of time talking about campus monitors and yard supervisors. That's really where we identified that need for that coordinator of safe schools. Right. Uh, Board Member Clark, we have a lot of campus monitors. We have a lot of yard supervisors. Um, they're kind of, we've provided traditionally one training at the beginning of the year. Yeah. That's not enough. That, it needs absolutely to be Absolutely not. I mean, yeah. I mean, but, but how long is that training? It, we've done anywhere from a half day to two hours. And we, then we'll come sometimes sprinkle in, but they're an extremely challenging group to train uh, during the school year because you don't want to pull them oh, off. Absolutely, yeah. So one of the areas that we were talking about and uh, working with Don is adding a day at the beginning of the year, a full day, where they can do a, you know, a full intense training and then throughout the year kind of revisit the restorative piece or revisit the um, de-escalation. But really somebody needs to oversee that. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, it's nobody's fault, but just kind of our current system right now, we have four or five of us in this room that have our big toe in safety. Yeah. So uh, on top of uh, quite a few other jobs. So they deserve more than that. Uh, they deserve the best training out there. They are on the front line. And I, I would also say it's not just our campus monitors and yard supervisors. We have a lot of other classified staff that, are, that also too need that training. Our front office... Um, we've done a number of uh, Civility Act restraining orders where we've had some, some escalated parents, and I think that's kind of the sign of the times, and I think there's a lot of stress out there. And uh, unfortunately, our front office staff are often the ones dealing with that, and many of them have received little of any training. Okay. All right, yeah. No, I, I just, I, I like the really like the, I, I'm just concerned about that number eight and more discussion needed. I mean, there's eight of them, eight okay. people who uh, think that there's more discussion on that. And I, and I just wish that it was touched a little bit more with the uh, campus monitors in mind and a couple of other things that you might want to look at, like the additional liability that comes with this safety specialist model. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reduction of uh, contracted third-party liability is something that needs to be looked at as well as, um, I, I don't know, you guys mentioned a hybrid model. Uh, was it something that was discussed, some, mm -hmm. something that was talked about? or um, Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Mr. Pre Mr. President. Yeah. Um, m might I suggest that we um, go imme immediately to the students and let them speak? Um, yeah. uh, we can ask our questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm good for that. Yes, the discussion. I, I kind of keep yeah. that. I thought that would be good. Well, I yeah. thought maybe yeah. they wanted yeah. to hang out with us. They would appreciate. Yeah, they're they're looking, <laughs> they're looking tired, but you know, they're, you spend a lot of time with us. So I, I want to. We have like uh, all this. I, cl I clustered everybody. If you if you would though, for our time, if you, if you could stay, if you have the same thing repetitively try to come up and we're going to do two minutes but if you can if it's not repetitive you know maybe have somebody uh, that's saying the same thing just try to be your spokesperson but i'll go through each one of them but if it's repetitive please try to not be repetitive because i know sometimes we'll have the same message but we'll start with arusha arusha is that correct uh, arushi yeah okay, okay. Arushi, uh, before you start, uh, just for the record, Mr. President, these are considered students, correct? Yeah. Are we, but we're going to do two minutes. We're to still going to do two. That's why I said if they want to take full three. two minutes, a okay. lot would be repetitive. But sure. But if you could, if you could try to be very succinct and you know on spot, because I know there's a variety of different opinions in here, but some of, there's a common. I, I've heard it a lot, so if you could do that, it'd be great. Yeah, I'll definitely try. Yeah. All right. Uh, good evening, board. My name is Arushi Mishra, and I'm a current junior this year at Vista Delago High School. I had the opportunity to attend and participate in at least two safety, er, in the last two safety steering committee meetings held by FCSD. 
I was one of the six students there in a room full of around 20 or so adults, including three student or school resource officers who were in full uniform and armed. Even though the last meeting was supposed to provide any sort of closure and allow both campus safety models to be thoroughly heard through and understood, it became apparent about like halfway through the session that the adults in the room simply did not want to really hear students out or even begin considering exactly what a campus without SROs would mean and its benefits. The back of every name placard at everyone's seat had keep students at the center uh, written on it. And I'm sure you saw that in the presentation as well. <coughs> it wouldn't be a stretch to say that half of the time, um, any one of the three SROs were speaking and answering questions back and forth. And on the fact that in the there were eight people who wanted like more rep, more talk about our uh, about recommendation B. I think that's best like exemplified by the fact that we had less than an hour to really go over uh, recommendation B, while recommendation A got three out of those hour, four hours. So, yeah. But yeah, they were given plenty of time to explain the logistics of their jobs in a, at a committee dedicated to looking into alternatives to SROs, while students were co consistently interrogated and spoken over. All of the adult, adults present repeatedly established that they cared for students and wanted the best for students, but rarely sought to understand and anything that we'd been saying or comprehensively discuss the benefits of Recommendation B or the safety specialist model. Yeah, I just try to sum it up, if you could. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. FGSD really does have the opportunity to take uh, the lead and pioneer a non-SRO school safety model that reimagines safety for all students and prioritizes equity first. The decision you guys make in December really will affect your students. So keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you for being succinct. Ria, if you could just send, that'd be great. And like I said, uh, it's, if the board decides, we'll be going back and discussing more. So. Um, and my comment is three minutes, and I plan to take three minutes. Um, good evening. My name is Rhea Shavastov, and I am a junior at Vesselago High School and organized with Jen of FCUSD, and I also served as part of the School Safety Steering Committee, which submitted these two proposals tonight. Also, four more students were here in support but had to leave, and my hope is that they'll be able to join via Zoom. When myself and my co-organizers started this advocacy <coughs> almost two years ago, we cannot begin to imagine the uphill climb this would be. On July 17, 2020, we held a protest at the SUSD district office where we all stand right now. We demanded the removal of SROs, a culturally responsive teaching staff, diverse curriculum, and equity for all students. We received no response from the district, not even an attempt to affirm our experiences. It took months of advocacy after this to even gain the board's attention. When we gained public support for the board to allow us to speak at a meeting, we presented statistics and data regarding the schools of prison pipeline and the negative effects that campus police have on students of color. The board then requested to hear from other students, so Jenip FCUSD and the Black alumni of FCUSD held a town hall meeting with students, faculty, and local activists to discuss their experiences with policing on campus. Many bravely and vulnerably shared their experiences with SROs and racism on campus, yet the district yet again did nothing to acknowledge this event, much less take action to address their stories. When the board requested to hear public opinion, we coordinated dozens of parents to flood public comments during a board meeting, expressing their support for our demands. Since, myself and my co-organizers have attended almost every single school board meeting. We have been subject to gaslighting, blatant disrespect from the district and from community members, and constant silencing of our voices. I personally experienced aggression from a police representative during a district-sponsored committee meeting to write the same proposal that we are discussing tonight. The longer you sit complacent, dozens of black and brown students are entering the school to prison pipeline at alarming rates. After tonight's board meeting, you will go home and not have to think about this issue. But that is not possible for black and brown youth who are forced to constantly face the violent and traumatic reality. The decision you make in December can quite literally change students' lives. So we are tired of being told we are too young to understand. We are tired of being told the district wants to hear student voice yet not take action. So I ask you, what will it take? What will it take for you to realize that each day you allow SROs on our campuses, you subject black students to trauma in an unsafe environment? Was it not enough when black students told you that during a Cordova High BSU meeting, one of your officers told the group that she would shoot and kill them if they did not comply? Was it not enough to hear that black students are 25 times more likely to be arrested on our campuses than their white peers? Was it not enough to know that students who attend schools with SROs are five times more likely to be arrested than those who do not have SROs on their campuses? Was it not enough to know that only 7% of secondary FCUSD students report going to an SRO for assistance? Was it not enough when we saw an RCPD cop beat a young black child to the ground last year? 
We have provided you with the statistics, the stories, the public support, and the solution. All of the six students in the committee opposed Proposal A and supported Proposal B. So once again, I ask you, what will it take for you to finally listen to your students and take action to address their needs? Thank you. Maria. A Emma? Emma? No? No Emma? Yes, oh, okay, yeah, we have four in there, so okay, if, uh, I'll put her to the, the side when I ask. Okay, uh, Dia? Also on Zoom. Also, okay, she must be one of the four. Amaya, ah? Uh, Maya? And, and try to be succinct, if you could, if all possible. Uh, two minutes, we, you know, I'm not going to knock you up, but I mean, if it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, duplicate, just try to sum up as quickly as possible. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Maron Nguyen. I'm a student at Vista Del Lago High School and I'm here in support of Proposal B. I'd like to share my experiences and my own opinions on this proposal. I've encountered negative interactions between students and police officers and the statistics support this. The school to prison pipeline is all too real and Proposal B takes action against this. Since we, the students, are directly affected by SROs, it is imperative that our concerns be valued to the highest extent. I speak for myself and many of my peers when I say that in a crisis situation, I rather speak with a counselor that is specifically and professionally trained to understand my behavior and um, respond properly. Proposal B has specifically laid out a plan to resolve student concerns in our own experiences and concerns to um, resolve dangerous incarceration trends. It is imperative you validate our experiences and never neglect or brush off the opinions of the students. It is imperative you listen to the students and their experiences and take appropriate action. Thank you. Thank you for being succinct. Okay, next is uh, Jordan. All right, I'm Jordan Kaisapu, Cordova alumna, representative of Black alumni of FCSD. Also, I was also recently appointed to Sacramento County's Behavioral Health Advisory Board, but I'm not representing that board tonight. Um, I just want to take a second to amplify the students' voices and how they felt like they were talked over and gaslit uh, during these committee meetings as well as board meetings and that sort of thing. Um, so I'll shorten my comment, uh, my original comment, for the sake of time. Why does I will ask this question instead? Why does Folsom Cordova need to switch from a law enforcement and punitive lens to a trauma-informed restorative justice-focused lens? I'll pose a hypothetical to illustrate why. If you were a student right now in a classroom, you find out that you failed a big test, which of the following situations would be beneficial to you? A, a teacher gives you a chance to go over the test to identify what you did wrong, and you're given the opportunity to do test corrections to improve your grade and learn from it. In addition to that, you're connected with any tutoring resources that you may need. Or B, getting certain privileges taken away as a result of your bad grade with no opportunity to improve. And this grade could have a lifelong impact on you, could reduce your chances of furthering your education. A seems like the most sensible option, right? So shouldn't that be the overall consensus in the school setting? Being focused on allowing students to learn from their mistakes versus punishing them when displaying any undesired behavior, which is synonymous with failing the test in this scenario. And this is why restorative justice practices are so important. Kids make mistakes. Kids have bad days. Kids sometimes need redirection when it comes to the behavior. Maybe you failed the test because you were so tired from babysitting all night. Maybe you had just worked a long shift after school the previous day. Maybe you didn't get a chance to study for the test because you didn't have access to your prep on Google Classroom. These factors should always be taken into consideration before any punitive measures are taken following any undesired behavior. Allowing students the space to acknowledge their behavior may not have been appropriate at the moment, also taking time for parties involved to understand what provoked that behavior and then both parties learning how to adjust and grow from this incident is of value. Growth over punishment. Interactions with law enforcement don't allow for kids to grow. It introduces them to a system that focuses only on punishment. And that's why this safety specialist model is important. And with all that being said, as an advocate for black students in this district, with their best interest in mind, I urge you to adopt this uh, safety specialist model. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Israel. Hi, my name is Israel. I'm a seventh grader at Mills. Um, hi, my name is Zion. I'm also a seventh grader at Mills. 
Okay, uh, okay. I just want to share how me and my friends feel about SROs because it feels like middle schoolers are really considered and talking about safety. Um, just the other day at school, I was walking to sixth period class with uh, my peers and I saw a police car. And when I pointed it out, everyone got scared and ran away. Um, police are threatening my friends and I always try to avoid them at all times. Even seeing the SROs parked on the corner between Cordova and Mills every morning puts me on edge because I, I haven't done anything wrong and yet I already feel threatened. I support the safety specialist model without SROs because SROs will make me feel safe. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Zion. Mr. President, yes. uh, should we extend the meeting? I, I just some word about the, didn't we say 1130? Yeah, well, we're gonna re re re-up it at 1130. I think I said midnight. No, you said, I think you said 11.30. I just don't want to run out of time. I don't want to. We're going to do it at 11.30 and then we'll Okay, re that's fine. It. Okay, see how, that's why I'm trying to get everybody to do is be, you know, sum it up real quick. Because we got a lot more to go, guys. <laughs> okay, so Zion? Are you going to do it together? Who's Zion? Yes, Zion. Oh, you did? Okay, okay. Okay, so let's go back to the online virtual. Oh, we got more now. Uh, yeah. Was Diaya or Emma, Emma on that? None of those names that you mentioned. Mr. Okay, Short. so then let's, those are they're gone. So then let's bring them up uh, the virtual. Okay, I'm going to call on Courtney first. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I just have to say, if you were not entirely moved by these young people telling you that they are terrified of the police, I don't know why you would think that you know better or why you would think that they would be lying. Police react, respond after something has happened. They escalate, arrest, disappear people, youth into a school to prison pipeline. And they always, no matter what, school resource officers target young people of color and poor and working class people and they reproduce cycles of violence. So stop talking about disparity, like it's not something you can't directly begin to eradicate by lessening, decreasing police contact between your students and officers and stop blaming young people of color for a racist system. I have been doing anti-incarceration work for over a decade, and I can assure you that these young people are headed in the right direction. Long story short, I urge you, I know it's late, to support option B. And you will hear the reasons why over and over again from the people who are most directly impacted by this issue. And they are not just telling you what they don't want, they are dreaming up solutions for what we want instead, for what will solve societal problems in their schools and amongst their peers. And it's not police. You cannot deny the inherent racism of this system that is harming students. So please listen to them. Please go with option B. Okay, next. Yeah, L. Hi, my name is JL and I'm a community organizer and I'm here on behalf of Decarcerate Sacramento and the youth. I support the youth-led movement for safer schools. I do not have a child in this district, but I have ties here, and I am in contact with families here and the youth, and their, and their well-being is on the top of my list. Sorry, my phone went out. I apologize. Um, we should be listening to their voices because they are important and need to feel important as well. Myself, the youth, and I'm sure the parents and a host of community members believe that these students will have a much safer and better experience if they were not being policed. As a parent myself, whose teen was shot by the, by the very people that are supposed to protect us, I know that there are many other youth who, for reasons we should all understand, why they don't want to be policed in our schools with surveillances, with law enforcement roaming school grounds, when they already have to deal with that outside of the school. The definition of safety is the condition of being protected from or unlikely to cause danger, risk, or injury. So ask yourself, 
Do we have to have cops or a form of policing in the schools to feel protected? Because many youth don't feel safe or protected being policed. They deserve to feel safe while getting an education that they rightfully deserve. There are far too many other alternatives that can be exercised as they spoke about today. And so many other problems, there are so many other problems in this district that this money could be used towards. So I say all this to say, please change the narrative and choose what should be the only option, which is supporting option B. Show the youth that we hear them, see them, and support them. Thank you. Okay, next. Next, we have Caroline. <clears throat> Caroline? Hello, and good evening. Okay. Um, my name is Caroline, and I'm an alumni of Visita Lago High School. Um, can you hear me fine? I just got a yes. notification yes. about meeting. Okay, yes. for sure. Um, throughout the last year and a half, we have consistently organized to remove police presence from our campuses. With Proposal B, there's an opportunity to create an environment where rehabilitation is valued over punishment, allowing students to learn and grow as people. In order to create a successful learning environment for all students, and not just white students, police cannot be present on school campuses. Board Member Hoover, tonight you said that your goal has been to close the achievement gap between Rancho Cordova and Folsom. You said to look at the data, so I'm asking you to look at it. The students most impacted by the achievement gap are low income and black students. This is partially because of the vast disproportionality between suspension, expulsion, and arrest rates. The way to improve the status quo is not to create an internally competitive environment or to put a band-aid charter school on a multi-decade issue, the issue of inequity. How can you say that equity leaders brought politics into our board meetings, then speak over their voices with a solution that doesn't service equity or work towards improving the work of the students currently impacted? Solution-oriented proposals like Proposal B already exist, and we have presented data to you consistently for the last year and a half to support them. Over the last couple of months, my co-organizers have worked tirelessly with the Safety Committee on creating a plan that places value on the safety and success of each and every student. On top of the solid evidence that has been consistently presented to you, we have shared plenty of anecdotes from students who have experienced violence by police on campus, both physical and psychological. The Southern Poverty Law Center finds that students in schools where SROs are stationed are five times more likely to be arrested than students in schools without SROs. In Rancho Cordova specifically, according to logs from the Folsom Police Department, or not the Folsom Police Department, the Rancho Cordova Police Department, between 2016 and 2020, 0% of students arrested were white, despite making up nearly 50% of the student population. 22% of students were black, despite making up only 7% of the population. Without SROs, you have the opportunity to practice true restorative justice and to prioritize and uplift the futures of your black students. I urge you to support Proposal B. Thank you. Okay, next, how many have left? Next we have Steven. Is that our last? Good Good evening. evening. My name is Steven Sander. I'm an organizer with the Answer Coalition, Act Now to Stop War and End Racism. And I'm also a former educator. I appreciate the opportunity to address you this evening. I would urge you to consider adoption of recommendation B and to listen to the students. SROs don't actually improve outcomes for students, they actually hinder them. The funds would be better spent investing in alternatives that actually have been shown to improve outcomes for students. Let us examine the data surrounding students and their current relationship with SROs. We know that minority students and students of color by and large don't have a good relationship with SROs. They have good reason to be afraid of law enforcement when on average, black students are 25 times more likely to be arrested than white students. Here in the district, black students make up about 6% of total student enrollment yet represent 55% of all students arrested. In addition, over half of FCUSD secondary students surveyed indicated that they have had either a neutral or negative interaction with SROs. This is because their actions contribute to the criminalization of behavior that would have otherwise been dealt with through the in-school disciplinary procedures. Think about how many fewer prospects coming out of high school a student with a criminal record would have. We must set up students for success as much as possible, not failure through the school to prison pipeline. And we know that recommendation B with safety specialists has enjoyed better success. Let's go for trauma informed counseling, de escalation, and emphasis on behavioral health. It produces far better outcomes. Let's invest in better educational outcomes for our kids. Um, so, also, let me add in that if front office staff are having Next, please. Next, we have Maria. Maria. 
Maria, can you try him? There you go. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. So uh, I just want to be brief. Um, I sent a letter to all of the um, board members and um, I would appreciate it if you read that in detail. I, I, I don't want to go over exactly what I wrote, but I, I'm just, you know, I'm really moved by all the speakers here. Um, some of them, you know, deeply involved in this issue for years, the students who have like committed their time and effort and um, passion to this um, effort. And I just, I, I'm, I'm baffled by how, um, how difficult it has been for them to um, get your ear and to really be listened to. Um, these are, you know, not students who are living this real experience um, and, um, and they've been working so hard and I feel like they, they just haven't been heard. Um, our student, Rhea Shravastava, um, has been advocating, as she mentioned, for years. And when she comes up to, she sits through these meetings every week or whenever they happen. And she, um, and yet when it's her turn to speak, she's hurried through her three minutes. I'm, I'm just appalled by that. Um, you know, listen to what is being, you know, <laughs> presented to you. There are real um, data issues. I'm not going to go over those again. Um, this is a real issue for so many people. And if, if, if the facts and the reason and the passion and the advocacy don't, you know, um, move you, then, you know, maybe it's look to your own, you know, if this was your own children, you know, what would you do? What would you think if your own children were vulnerable in the same way? Um, maybe it, emotionally it will make a difference for you. <laughs> but um, please, um, you know, hear, hear what is being said. And, you know, you are in a position of leadership. You have the opportunity. Okay, is this our last? Yes. Okay, thank you. So we got more. Was that the last? Yes, oh, Mr. Okay, Short. I got more here, though. <laughs> so, uh, and done <coughs> with these, right? Are these the ones I did already? Yes, these are the ones I did. Yes. Oh, these are the uh, parents. No, we're going to do parents now. Laura Norris? Left. She left, okay. Jason Ferrer? Yeah, I'll be super, I'll be super brief. I was a member of the uh, committee and uh, it was an outstanding, and uh, I, would, I would implore you just to listen to the children, the students. Um, when I started, I had my own opinions, mm -hmm. and when I left, I shared their opinions and realized that they knew what safety was uh, for them. And as a member of the committee, I would continue, I would willfully continue on the committee and trying to move this, uh, <clears throat> much needed change uh, forward for as long as it takes. So again, thank you, uh, pr uh, President Short and Scott Meyer for putting this together because I think it's critically important. And please listen to the students and anything that parents can do, I'll, I'll be happy to help continue that effort. Thank you. And thank you for your participation. It was well received and you had a good voice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Polha? Nicole? Anybody? Oh, okay, there. Thank you. Sorry, I don't think I can be short because I, I don't speak eloquently like some of the others, so I have a little bit that I've written already. I am an immigrant, and when I came to this country, I didn't have any money, but what I did have was an education in the form of a bachelor's degree and a deep-rooted belief that education was truly the way to success in the land of opportunity. That education has opened many doors for me, and my daughter, Ria, is bearing the fruit of that. Ria has taken that privilege to amplify the voice of those that don't feel heard and for whom education is not equitable. She and her friend, Jordan, have tirelessly and courageously come to board meetings for the last two years, shared data, pleaded to you, volunteered countless hours to serve on your committee, sometimes even encountered verbal abuse by adults. And despite their experiences, they continue to fight for the cause and have shown you today that today's education system is broken, too standardized, favors a few, 
disproportionately impacts students of color, reinforces divisiveness, and fails at many levels to serve all kids equally. Ria has been able to do all this because she was privileged and has been granted opportunities that many of her peers don't get. We can produce many such leaders to serve our communities, but only if we give all students a fair chance. Unfortunately, many black and brown students do not have a positive educational experience within FCUSD due to the harmful impact SROs have on them. I implore the board today to open your heart and your mind, listen to these young leaders, listen actively to the unheard communities, and then put the constructs in place to tailor the educational experience so that it's equitable for all kids. A spiritual leader once said, without creating, great human be without creating great human beings, we will be unable to create a great society. It is time we stop the lip service, let go of our preconceived notions, engage in authentic dialogue, build trust, and work to show these young voices that we adults can be part of the necessary change. Please vote in support of Proposal B. Thank you. Okay, well, we're going to bring it to the board. Do we need to extend the meeting? So. With what I got here, I would say we can't go more than 1230. I mean, otherwise we have to cut off the meeting. I mean, we got a lot more on the agenda. Mr. President, Yeah, I move that we extend the meeting until 1230. Okay. And is the board in acceptance of that? Aye. Yeah. Aye. I mean, Aye. Aye. Okay. Sure. Here we go. Okay. Uh, I'm asked people to be succinct too, sir. So. Uh, Vanette. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Vineet Srivastava. It's really late. I don't know how you guys are still in your ties. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been in such long meetings. Uh, so I'm Ria's dad, yeah. and I'm here to support Proposal B, of course. Uh, I believe that we all share a common bond as parents, and that we all love our kids unconditionally, and want the best for them, regardless of our color, race, or socioeconomic background. We want to provide them with better opportunity than we had. We want them to go to school and learn and flourish. When our kids go to school, we want them to be safe and sound. Unfortunately, it is not the same for a lot of parents of color in our district who have to fear that their child will be arrested by a police officer on campus. Secondly, I feel that when we make a mistake, uh, we all like to be given a second chance. We would like others to show us grace and forgiveness. I know that forgiving someone and guiding them towards a correct path can change their lives forever. Showing love, compassion, and understanding is a lot better than being punitive and use force, which can lead to lifelong negative uh, impacts. I'm proud of Ria and Jordan and other kids we spoke here today who are really passionate about this issue and have presented the problem using data and facts. They have come up with a proposal which can work better than what we have in place when it comes to student safety and their well-being. Making change is hard and it takes time. Uh, some of the things I heard today from all of you uh, when we were discussing the agenda about the charter school, uh, you said don't vote for the status quo. You said look at the data, uh, think outside the box, try new things, uh, there's always a first. So I would urge you to follow the same line of thinking and listen to their ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Bennett. Carol, and after that is Mikhail. Hello. Yeah, please try to be succinct. My name is Kara, and I have two daughters attending FCUSD. I work in special education, and I'm on a campus with students in an ED program. These are students and sometimes also family members with severe emotional and behavioral difficulties. I've learned a lot on this complicated subject. First and foremost, that we all have the same needs, the need for safe and quality learning environments for our children. Our opinions and strategies to meet this goal is where the tension and conflict arises. We all have different perspectives. If what we really want is a safe campus, we need to look at the statistics and the research and make policies and decisions on that. Voices are important, but misinformed assumptions, even though well-intentioned, will not solve the need for safe school campuses. Strong mental health support for students and staff with trained monitors, social workers, counselors, psychologists, and school-wide trainings result in positive prevention and productive interventions. 
We need coordinated and rehearsed emergency responses as well as liaisons that work together to provide resources where needed and individualized plans for student growth. At work, I get to observe the process of de-escalation, growth mindset approaches, and restorative justice. The research points to promoting mental health support and train campus monitors with the removal of SROs from campus if we want a safe learning environment for all students. The proactive engagement and interventions that very skilled and well-intentioned SROs do can be done with the above mentioned support staff. We are lucky to have such caring and skilled SROs. Their removal is not personal. It is research based. We can have emergency responses to our campus if the de-escalation and emergency plans need additional support. We do not need SROs housed <coughs> on campus. A coordinated relationship with established plans and trained support staff will result in safer schools and even extend to a safer community for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Makam? Anybody here? Okay. Makam? It just says M-I-C-A-H. Okay. We still got a lot more. Yes. Okay, I'm moving on to Robert Thomas. Thank you, Rob. <coughs> Welcome again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I am very impressed with uh, the student voice on this issue. Um, it's, it's so very clear that, um, that students see this, this issue so much differently than the classified staff by and large. And it has been a great experience for me to hear you because you definitely see things very differently than I do. Um, I am the strongest supporter of option A and I am the strongest opponent of option B, but I still don't think we're all that far apart because I think we really have very much the same goal. Um, I think it's helping to distill what my real concerns are about this issue. And I think it's not so much a visible presence of SROs on campus as much as it is maintaining appropriate services um, from law enforcement that benefit our students, that benefit our staff, and that support our administrators that need law enforcement to help take care of our students to help take care of sometimes their families and to take care of us, our staff sometimes when we have extreme situations. That's not every day in every situation. I get it. Um, we have to change the environment, but I think we also have to look at what our legitimate need is for law enforcement and figure out how to put that together in a way that deals with our students' needs to feel safe and deal with the other needs we have as a school district. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Amanda? Amanda? Don't see Amanda? Okay. Next would be Pooja. Pooja? Thank you. And after that will be Monique. Good evening. My name is Pooja Bhatia, and I am a family member of a student in the district. I am here tonight in support of Proposal B. I want to start by validating the experiences of students in the district. These students are stakeholders who are directly impacted by SROs on campus day in and day out. Dozens of them have bravely shared with you their negative interactions with SROs, along with numerous statistics that are concerning to say the least. I won't go through them for the sake of time, but I'm sure that having these uh, negative statistics was never the intended objective of having SROs on campus. But unfortunately, this is the reality our students face every day. I want to take a moment to thank these students for speaking up, collecting the data, and sharing their experiences with all of us so that we can make more informed decisions in creating a safe school environment. Thank you. I'm truly inspired by all of you. Student safety is a top priority for all of us. Unfortunately, SROs do not improve my perception of safety for students on campus. The proposed plan B with safety specialists is similar to that of San Juan Unifieds, where they have seen far better perceptions of safety, both by students and parents, which is remarkable. The fact of the matter is, this is the future. 
We are seeing these changes being made both at the national and local levels, and I hope that you all will support Proposal B and be a part of increasing safety for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Monique? That'll be our last one. Do we have any virtual left? Okay, great, okay. Hello, thank you for having me. I come at, uh, at it from a different way. My name is Monique, I, I'm a parent coach, and I am going to make the case for curiosity. When moms and dads come to me, it is because of problems with their kids or their own sense of being overwhelmed, stressed. Often what has happened is that curiosity is gone. Curiosity about themselves and also curiosity about their kids. Curiosity has been replaced with fear, judgment, blame, corralling or overmanaging. Now you all have felt the enormous power of curiosity. When someone asks you how you are, what is going on? What ticks you off? What you feel? What you think? You feel seen and heard and you belong. And when you, we, feel seen and heard, we have a much better chance of our brain and heart working together. There is a lot of data available about that. In short, the most powerful brainstorm comes when curiosity, heart and brain fire together. Any great invention, be it planes, economics, or penicillin, was because of these three coming together. Heck, Albert Einstein would never have come up with his great expensive idea like general relativity had he not had insatiable curiosity. So what I am saying, a curious kid is set for life, will always find solutions and ideas, will go for innovation. Now, if a family cannot foster curiosity, I hope that a school can foster it. However, when feeling violated, managed, abused, accused, handled wrongly, not seen, not heard, the subtle power of curiosity in a kid is under threat. I have followed the recommendations of the kids in the district for the last two years, trying to create a healthy environment where curiosity can blossom or develop. The committee has come up with excellent ideas and solutions in answer to problems because of their curiosity. I am not going to go over those again, but if the goal is to create a healthy and constructive learning environment for all, then the school needs to ensure that all students feel safe, belong, and that the right sources are available. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's our last one. We'll bring it back to the board. We're gonna have a comment question combined. So I think it was, uh, it was you, right? Yeah. Okay, well, and then we'll go back with as needed, okay? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Scott, uh, where's Scott? Oh, there he is. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Getting tired. <laughs> I'm, I'm sneaky. <laughs> Scott, um, who, who do <laughs> campus monitors currently report to? To their site principal. To the site principal. Or AP. Mm. Uh, okay, all right. Um, and the same thing with um, uh, yard duty. Yeah, they report. Yeah, up they're to not it. itinerant. They they have a home. That's, that's and the SROs currently report to. So they used to report uh, to my office and also risk management. We would work kind of together, but now they're directly with me. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, is there? Um, is there? Was there? Was there any discussion? about having a school safety or, or having the, um, the campus monitors report to you directly. So no. basically having you and your current role serve as the school safety specialist. No, that, that was not discussed. I would, and just on, I'd put on the record, I'd be adamantly against that just right now. Um, just, just with my current workload, are, are they would need more than that. And I, I, would, I, I could not go to sleep at night being spread that thin and not, yeah. not being able to support them. All right, fair, fair enough. Um, is there, was there any um, discussion of a hybrid between A and B where we would hire mm -hmm. a school safety specialist that the campus monitors from all across the district would report directly to the school safety specialist um, uh, and the SROs would report directly to the um, school safety specialist. The coordinator? 
or the spe the yeah. coordinator or the specialist? Uh, I apologize. The the czar, the whatever you. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, we we started getting into that discussion because kind of the tricky part here is you have um, you have a lot of interested parties here, and you have ninety five percent of administrators feeling for seventy six saying we they want six go back to six SROs. You have another twenty plus percent. So basically, ninety five percent want. You have all um, of Rob. I know Rob had mentioned last time. Everyone, out of all the classified folks who took survey, you have 92% that want at least the same or more SROs. But then we also have to take into consideration our students and their, their mental well-being. So it, it is tough here. So that's kind of where that hybrid model started being brought up. And that's another reason why we wanted to request more time yeah. to talk about, honestly, the title doesn't, whether it's SRO, liaison, doesn't really mean as much to me. It's more the description and what it is. Um, I think what we had talked a lot about was um, the concern that when we need someone, how the, I'm not sure if the board's aware of how a triage works with law enforcement. It's not your next in line. It, they actually triage to um, importance. So I think the big concern right now is the delay of we do not have at least a liaison or somebody that we that we could get quickly and we've I, I'll be honest we've had five incidents this week that we've needed someone to get there quickly so we're trying to you know walk this tightrope yeah. and um, keep a lot of parties happy and feeling safe including staff including students so that's where that hybrid was why that was brought up but we did not get deep enough into it so again that's why we were talking about having another meeting Okay. Um, this year, uh, for the first time, we decoupled uh, the SROs in the contract from the school site. Um, we directed them to be roving, not to camp out at high schools, but to rove from school to school to school to school and check in with the principals. Has that helped uh, at all? As far as students not feeling comfortable with having a car parked on? Correct. I would assume for those that, that were really upset about that, and we definitely, we've had students, some here, that have, have really voiced their concern about that. So I, I don't have any, we haven't done another survey about that, but uh, they've been keeping, they're, not, they're no longer parking on campus. They're no longer parking directly in front. They have, some have designated spots or they're parking in the parking lot. So they're, I guess, more incognito and not... Um, right smack in the middle of campus. Well, I, I hear they're still uh, not incognito on a particular corner. Well, um, well, well yeah, and, and I should be clear on that. When they're, when they're coming in for a crisis or a response, uh, they do have the directive, and I've given them a directive if it's, if it's an oh, emer right. emergency. But, um, All right. but standing yeah. on corners, giving high fives, isn't um, being incognito. Mm -mm. Oh, you're talking about the actual officers? Yes. Oh. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I thought we were talking about um, their cars. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. well uh, still, I mean, I probably could elaborate a little bit more on what the vice president is saying. It's just the car being on the corner with the flashing lights and right. and the officer out there doing high fives or whatever. I, I think that's probably one of the concerns. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I, I, I mean, obviously it's a late hour, and I, and I uh, would love to chat more about this. Um, but um, uh, I, I am all in favor of extending the directive to the um, school safety working committee to continue your dialogue. I guess uh, personally, I would love for the committee to talk about what a hybrid. If you took option A and option B and put it together, what that would look like. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't mind seeing that come back as, as a third option for the, the board to consider. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, who's next? Uh, Mr. Huey. Just one quick question, Mr. Meyer. I, you mentioned San Juan had uh, stated that the one thing they would do differently is, I think, take a little bit longer to roll things out. Mm -hmm. If I remember that correctly, do you know how quickly they did move from the, for implementation? We have uh, Mrs. Hazarian. She was actually she was actually there. So during um, this time, yeah. So we stopped having SROs at the end of one school year, and we started with a safety specialist model right away. 
I think part of what we were talking about in this hybrid is that we need our administrators and staff to have some trust in what a safety specialist can do on their site. And we need our students to have some trust too and what that, that could do. And that's where we're looking at maybe a phased approach mm -hmm. where we could be bringing on a safety specialist support and letting go of the SRO support. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so last thing for me is that, yeah, I would uh, agree with Mr. Reed, I'd, I'd be uh, open to extending the amount of time that the safety steering committee would meet uh, to talk about a hybrid or, or even flesh out this option B a bit more and, and bring it back to the board. Okay, thank you. Back over here. Um, yeah, well, first off, you know, thank you everyone that spoke tonight. I mean, I think this has been a really productive process. Um, I mean, I don't think... I know I've made it clear in the past that I support SROs, but at the same time, I think it's also important to have these conversations. And, um, you know, I think uh, I, I definitely, I'd concur with my colleagues, you know, definitely do another meeting. Uh, obviously it's clear, if anything's clear, it's that more discussion uh, is required here. Um, I, I do like option A from the standpoint of, you know, hiring a coordinator and the reason, or what is it, the czar? I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know where czar came from. I don't know. Is that a thing? Uh, but anyway, I, I like that idea from the standpoint of, you know, when we, when we were ta had the SRO discussion before, you know, I, I really think it is important to hone in on the idea of accountability and having another person involved in that process who can not only, you know, work with the officers, but also be another, you know, set of eyes or uh, on situations and things like that. Um, you know, I, I think more accountability is always good. And um, so I definitely think that some version of that um, could be workable, but would be interested in seeing a hybrid proposal as well. Um, also, I don't know if there was any discussion about adding more cameras or whatever, you know, and not just, obviously we, we made some progress with the body cameras on the officers, but I think also we should be looking seriously at adding cameras to a lot of our school sites. And that'll serve two purposes. One, it's another mechanism for accountability for any incidents that take place. But also, um, you know, it'll help us keep our campuses open uh, at night <laughs> because we'll feel a little more secure uh, that they're unlocked and, and being uh, visually guarded. So um, I, I really like the direction this is going. Um, I also really like the uh, focus on restorative practices. I mean, you know, honestly, I don't know if this is something you can incorporate into your meeting. I wouldn't necessarily make it a priority if there's bigger things to discuss, but uh, I think we should discuss how we can advocate um, at the state level too on some of this. I was pretty shocked recently to find out that there's still marijuana charges that you can get expelled for. <laughs> uh, that blew my mind. Mm -hmm. And that was something I learned recently. Uh, and uh, it's a state law that requires us to do that. And that blew my mind. I think I think that's something that we should seriously talk about mm -hmm. uh, as a board, advocating for a change to that law, because that's not restorative. You know, sending that child uh, to a totally different school because of a, a marijuana uh, incident. Mm -hmm. I just I don't think that's a restorative practice. So um, maybe that could be part of the discussion as well. But anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there for tonight. But thanks for for everyone that spoke tonight. Alice and then Ms. Clark, did you wanted to have final comments mm -hmm. too? So go Alice. Ladies first. Then, uh, <laughs> Somebody just had a bird today here. It's midnight. <laughs> 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 what uh, okay, Alice. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so you mentioned that um, like in other school districts, these school safety specialists have been like ex-law enforcement. Is that something like the district would be wanting to pursue? Like where would we be finding the, the coordinators and specialists? Yeah, I would want, we've talked a lot about this and I would want the best candidate and the best fit for our students, whether that's former law enforcement, uh, uh, a campus monitor who might be extremely experienced and kind of it is quite a, a step up on the pay scale, so maybe that would interest some of our campus monitors. But to be honest, um, I don't want to lump any group. I, I want the best candidate to be in there if we went that route. Okay, thank you. And then um, just for like clarification, I guess, um, like what type of outcomes have we been seeing like out of San Juan and then Sac City and Fairfield? Like just general trends like in relation to like punitive action um, and then like recorded and perceived safety. 
Great question. And so the Fairfield, uh, they, they actually have very similar, we did Fairfield because they're almost identical to our district. Mm -hmm. The amount of schools, the amount of students, uh, the breakdown. Um, uh, so, but they do have SROs. They actually have seven SROs, but they also have a center that they have an SRO placed at. It's kind of a full wraparound service. So they, they've been doing this for a few years, but all three of these models are relatively new. Sac City's started right before COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And then they, of course, didn't go back to school. So we really don't have until later. And then they started later. So we really don't have a lot of data from Sac City. They've, uh, and then when did San Juan fully implement this? Three to four years ago. Three to four years. So I, I haven't looked at, at their, their data for that. I know, um, I mean, are you talking for, probably for as far as arrests? Um, so I don't know. They, did they present on that? I don't remember if they did. It's a great question. I will, I will find out. Hmm. I'll have it for our next meeting. Okay. You just have to show up. You're, you're a great addition. So, all right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that was all my questions. Okay, Ms. Clark. All right. Uh, thank you so much. I, I just want to give kudos to our students who came out and spoke and actually had taken their time because I know some of them have jobs and some of them are going to school to serve on these committees. And I know that these I heard that they run for two, three hours. So, I mean, my hat's off to you guys for um, sticking in there and making your voice heard. Um, you know, I really like uh, recommendation B, the safety specialist model, only because I've seen it work at a couple of high schools um, in Sac City. Um, you know, because I, I work with those kids and I usually go out to the schools and check in on them and talk to their safety specialists. Uh, and I know it works. Now, I, I, I hear classify plea for more SROs on campus. I, I'm just trying to, you know, from a fiscal <laughs> perspective, how would that work? And I think using this model for a safety specialist is probably much better. It could be a, a former cop, or I'll make a plug and say maybe a vet. That Absolutely, a, and that's, that's another, uh, that's uh, a great. Being biased. That I mean, was also just, brought up as well, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, a, a veteran would work. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm kind of, well, I, kind of on the fence with this phasing <clears throat> in thing. Um, I think it's a good idea, but, I don't know. I mean, it'd be up to the rest of the board to talk about that. What I'm really concerned about is the hybrid model and what it would look like. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure there'll be more discussion on it. Um, like I said, I looked at this gradients of agreement and there was eight of them that said more discussions needed. So I, I'm kind of feeling the same way that my colleagues are that, yeah, more discussion is needed. I think it needs to go beyond December, maybe reconvene the first meeting in in January if that's feasible. Um, but it'll give folks enough time if you meet once, maybe twice. Um, but I'm very concerned about, you know, this number eight, and I think that's probably the highest one on all of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we need to really vet this out, talk about it, and and come to an agreement Maybe, you know, um, the uh, wholehearted endorsement or agreement with, you know, minor points of contention. I don't know. Maybe get those numbers up. So that's it. But, yeah, I really like um, the way Model B is looking right now. Okay. So I appreciate it. Staff's in agreement with you for more time. Yeah. So Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, right. Sure, sure. And, I, and then I will get on my comments. Great, thank you. Mr. Clark, yes, um, please, yeah. I don't, I, I really think that what classified staff wants is to, to, just like the students, we want to feel safe and we want to be safe. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean 
that uh, that a uniformed officer needs to be on campus all the time. Okay. We just need to have a program that provides the the services necessary to keep our students and our staff safe and to take care of the variety of needs that our administrators have mm -hmm. and our staff have in dealing with things that the students um, the students may not see, but they're real. They are, there are things that need to be handled and they're, they're serious things. And so could uh, you, the, staff, the staff understands that. Yeah, but could right. you tell me what that is? And I'll make it clear. I just yeah. kind of want to know. Threats. Threats to students, threats to staff, threats to administrators, um, in, uh, people wanting to intrude on campus. Uh, the, the, the administrators can probably give you a much better idea of, <laughs> of what those things are. But it, it's, we want to be safe too. Yeah, it's, not, it's not that we need to have uniformed officers all over campus all the time. It, it, it's, it's just just like the students. We want to feel safe. We want to know that, the, that, those, yeah, yeah. That, that that's in place. Okay, thank you. Okay, are you? Yeah. Okay, um, my final comments. I, I think we can address, I said on there, and I think this is a very healthy discussion. I'm very proud of the students having a voice, and, and we all started this to have a voice. We wanted to hear all stakeholders, and it's been going along, and I do agree with the colleagues. We need to go back, and I think maybe even longer, more than one meeting. I think it's going to take a couple more meetings, and maybe we can extend it to January. Uh, but as the, it's a little history. I think we brought this up before. I know you want more SROs, but the last uh, safety committee that we developed years ago, the the narrative nationally was the active shooter external extreme, and the committee came out and said, wait, we want more SROs to protect from external threats, which is a whole other scenario with another s solution. I know what happened at Mills and Mitchell was an external thing. It was uh, adults coming on board, and the pop officer showed up. There's, there's other areas to, to solve these, these areas that I can see. I work as a consultant in fire life safety as a fire marshal and everything else. Fire departments are really good at fire drills. They know when they come on, they're first responders, they know the buildings, they know the people, they, they spend a lot of time on plans. We don't have a plan when those pop officers showed up. They didn't know who to talk to, they didn't know the buildings, they didn't know anything. We should be emulating what fire departments do. So there's other solutions out there with separate scenarios. So we have the physical, what you're worried about, I understand that. But having officers or more officers, it's, SR is not gonna solve that problem. I think it's a separate scenario with a separate solution. The physical, or the physical part is different, external. The emotional part is another you know, scenario with a different solution. And I think what, when the board comes back and there's a hybrid model, what I heard the students say, they're not really against SROs per se. They're, they just don't know what the calibration is when you call an SRO. What I got out of those meetings was staff and everybody else and administrators calling SROs almost for anything and everything. They didn't want to be, they were out there anytime and everything and they weren't breaking up fights. They weren't doing those things. They thought the campus monitors were. They, so there's a lot of roles and protocols and stuff that I think that needs to be vetted out. I think there might be better solutions out there. We can maybe look at that. And I'm, I'm open-minded to see how that would work. That would also address the emotional side and also the physical external. So we, we got work to do on that area because we still touch the surface. We mentioned an active shooter plan is required by law, but we haven't even done anything on that yet. And, and may, we have every individual site doing, maybe we have that czar, if you will, or that hit person make a policy on that and make it happen across the so, so there's all kinds of ideas there i just want to make sure that <coughs> that calibration is thought about in the roles and i think that we need to talk about the board coming up with a policy what the, what are the roles of sros and what are what do we call them and so those are the kind of things we, we law still, enforcement in general right and, and i you know i talked I even sat with the mayor and in, in Rancho, you know, it was shocking to me that in some given time, there's only four patrol officers for the whole city at any given time. So if we had six, we'd probably have more officers in our district than they have for the whole city at any given time. That's kind of shocking. We were there. So, you know, response times are all about resource availability. So we got to figure out a balance in there somewhere with, along with our city and our police force there. Again, they're going through a change where maybe their county revenue neutrality, they might end and then they'll have a lot more money. Maybe they'll go to a, their own police and they have more control and more coverage. 
and that will address a lot of those physical things that we every school will have a plan and, and they'll have more officers available that know everybody so that can address your thing that's a long-term solution with that said i don't want to go any more but i i'm forward moving forward and taking it back to the committee and maybe even longer like Ms. clark said so i think more time might be more beneficial to hear the voice of the students we can certainly ask the committee keep in mind they did commit to no i know but it, I hear yes. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely. I, I think I you're think, tired. I think it's a strong committee. <laughs> <laughs> no, President, okay. Short. Uh, President Short. Yeah. Just one quick point of clarification. I, I don't mean to speak for our students. Yeah. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but I thought it was pretty clear at the meetings that they are actually against SROs. It's not a matter of uh, in certain situations. They're saying in all situations, they do not want SROs on our campus. Yeah, on Cal, I'm talking about. They weren't against SROs roaming the community. As long as it's clear, I, I believe they're saying on campus, they are, they are against sure. SROs. So, so, it's yeah, yeah. End of sentence. Well, uh, Mr. President, uh, can, can we schedule this for a, a follow-up at the next meeting? Yeah. Uh, th th this, we, we should not be having this dialogue at 12.15 in the morning. Yeah. Okay, let's go. All right, let's keep on. We're done with the discussion, so let's go back. And... Okay? Thank you. All right. Okay, our items, we're going to have to go back to approve the Falls Cordova Unified School of Proposed Contract, open our Article 2 for the Falls Cordova Education Association 2021 negotiations. Superintendent. This is the action item that goes along with the public hearing to open up uh, negotiations with FCEA on Article 2. Whatever it is, I move it. Out <laughs> <laughs> of first? I'll second. All right. Any public comment? None. Okay, coming back, roll call. Mr. Short? Yes. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Gow? Aye. Motion carries 5-0, thank you. Okay, approve uh, item C, approve uh, the instruction calendar 2023. This item is also uh, returning back to the board with additional um, variations to the two calendars we looked at last week. Oh, yeah, we have, an uh, we have a calendar C and a calendar D. Uh, Mr. Ogden, did you want to? Answer any questions that may come up here. Yeah. Uh, the board has a choice, two calendars, C or D, to choose from. Um, I think you've had an opportunity to look at them. Um, can you bring questions? it up? Because I, I looked at them, but I think I have some questions. Mm -hmm. I can bring it up. Um, the, the, question, the question that I recall a couple people wanting to you know the answer to, uh -huh. had to do with um, both calendars end uh, prior to June. And there's a couple of reasons that we do that. Uh, one is the month of June is typically when we do our summer school. Uh, the second is the way our employees are paid. Um, our employees, if they worked into June, would have their paycheck spread over one extra month. And so uh, employees prefer to have it spread over one less month. Okay, any questions? I have a motion. A motion that uh, the board accept calendar D and adopt it. Uh, I'll second that and apologize to the public. I mean, this is, I know a lot of people care about this, so I feel yeah, a little bit they're, bad at they're the not time, here but so. I don't know if we're going to have yeah, we got a first and a second. <laughs> Are there any public comments yeah, either online or anything? That's what I I'm just asking. just want to make sure. Yeah. Okay. 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 I'll, I'll, I'll second it. We already did. We got a first. Oh, okay, so let's take good. a roll call. Uh, hold on. Question. Um, what schools are still on trimesters? They're all in, yeah. Elementary. Elementary. Yeah. Okay. All secondary or semesters. Okay. All right. That's all. Okay. Roll call. Mr. Short. Yes. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hoover. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Mr. Hui. Aye. Ms. Gow. Aye. Motion carries right. 5 -0. Thank you for coming. Madam D. Thank you to Don. Organization meeting notice. The <laughs> annual organizational meeting of the Folsom Cordova Unified School District Board of Trustees is set for Thursday, December 16, 2006 p.m. Education Service Center. Ranch Cordova, California, as superintendent. Yes, this item um, is required by County Office of Education that we declare when our organizational meeting is sometime between December <clears throat> 10th and 24th, and we're recommending that that date be the December 16th meeting. Public comment? Hearing none. Mr. Okay, President, motion. Uh, I'll move it. A second? Second. Uh, okay, roll what, call. Sorry, what are we betting on? <laughs> <laughs> the the organizational organizational meeting. standard. Okay, yeah. uh, roll call. That motion was to move ahead with the date as articulated. 
I, I made the motion. Uh, Chris Clark, and then it was second by Mr. Hui. Sorry, mm -hmm. going a little too fast. Okay, roll call. Mr. Short? Yes. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Hui? Aye. Ms. Gow? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, Aye. item E, approve the 2022 California School Board Association Delegate Assembly notification. Uh, we have two of our board members who are currently serving on CSBA <clears throat> Delegate Assembly and Mr. Clark's term expires this year and is interested in running again. Mm -hmm. It would take board action to recommend that he continue for another term. Okay, any public comment? Bring it back to the board. I have a motion. I'll move. I have a second? Second. Okay, that was Hoover and Ms. Reed. Uh, roll call. Mr. Short? Yes. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Gow? Aye. Motion carries, 5-0, thank you. Okay, thank you. We're moving over to information. The budget book is there if anybody needs to go to it. Item 13, item 14, reports the Board of Education Superintendent. Just want to thank all staff yeah. and our board. Uh, yeah. This was, you know, um, this, yeah. quite a meeting tonight, and and I know uh, everyone has uh, strong strong feelings about uh, the topics that were discussed, and they are all very important topics. and And I look forward to coming back and talking about our safety committee recommendations at our future meeting. Just want to wish everybody well as they go into the Thanksgiving break, and to remind us all to count our many blessings. Thank you. Okay. Back to Board of Education business. Anybody want to talk? We'll go real quick. Uh, I have something really quick. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, uh, I had um, distributed um, a draft uh, red line of our uh, board policy 7310 regarding the naming of facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to see if there was a consensus uh, or a majority of the board that would be willing to have this agendized for discussion. Yes. I do. Uh, uh, Mr. Board. Vice President, I, I support it. Mover? Sure, let's yeah. do it. Can we? Yeah, you got, you got support. Okay, and then the second item um, is uh, I, I would like um, to be on a future agenda, not too far in the distant future, a discussion about elementary school boundaries. Um, we, we promised we were going to come back to that issue, um, uh, but then the pandemic happened. And we have some small tweaks to certain <coughs> schools that we need to consider. Um, and I'd like to have that back on the okay. agenda. Talking about your first of the year? What? First yeah. of the year? This okay. one. Yeah. yeah, I think that's no problem. Everybody okay with that? Sure. Tentatively. Okay. Okay, who else wants to go? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Mark I'll make Mac? it really, really quick. I just want to thank the board uh, and the public for engaging in two pretty um, contentious um, articles that we addressed tonight and just you know oh my god we're gonna have to learn to agree to disagree on some things and not slam each other um, we've got to work in unison as a board uh, believe it or not folks are out there and they're watching mm -hmm. um, I know that Ed has got comments I've got received comments during some delegate meetings and it's not fun because now we're on the defense because we have to, you know, particularly uh, stand up and defend our colleagues on the board. And, and, you know, it's like, well, that's not what we're seeing. It's like, well, you know, it's just hard for us to explain. So hopefully we can continue to agree to disagree, um, but work together and support each other. Um, I had the opportunity last week to visit Natoma Station um, hang out in a couple of classrooms. And then I went over that same day to uh, Vista Del Lago where Chris and Laura Didier uh, did a presentation with their student government. Um, on, you know, they actually shared their son's life with us, Zach, who um, fell victim to fentanyl poisoning. Um, I'm not sure. I know they had a parent summit on that. Was that just for Vista parents? At this time, yeah. Yeah, what I would hopefully like to see, and, and I know they're fully on board, is to um, get it out to our Folsom parents as well as our Cordova parents and maybe include our, our middle school since, you know, they have access to phones and ordering things and do Snapchat and, and all that. So... Hopefully you continue to get the word out about fentanyl poisoning. Like I said, it really touched me because I had a student, former Cordova student, who 
also lost his life uh, that lived right around the corner from me. And he used to sit outside when I walked around the block a couple of times. And it was just sad to hear that he had perished due to this, um, this poisoning. So hopefully we can bring awareness, if we can, you know, to our other schools. Uh, thank you, sir. Do you want to have yep, a comment? Sure. Um, so I'll try to keep it quick, but I do have a few things to say. Um, uh, first off, you know, I, I did want to clarify some of my comments. Uh, were a lot of them honestly were in response to things that were said in this meeting. So they were not intended to bring something new to the discussion. But um, I do want to apologize to the president because uh, bringing up your voting record on live streaming was out of bounds. Uh, that was focusing on on you and not the issue. Um, and that's you know as uh, you know we we know decorum and all these things. I mean we need to focus on the issues at hand and not on the people. Uh, that are on this dais. So I do apologize for that comment. Um, however, I do want to clarify some of my comments that you had kind of restated um, because I, I, these are really, really important and I, um, at least in my mind. And uh, the reason I asked about DLAC's mission was kind of exactly what you were getting at, uh, Mr. President, is that I think their mission is extremely important and extremely valuable to this district. Um, my concern uh, is focused on this idea. And in fact, Jordan, uh, she's not here anymore, but when Jordan spoke on the SRO issue, she mentioned that she sat on a board, but she was not here representing that board. And that's really the point I was trying to point out is that if someone from DLAC wants to come and share their opinion as you know, and sits on the DLAC committee, that is completely appropriate. What's not appropriate is to do it on behalf of DLAC. And I, I say that, and it's, it's a small but important distinction be, because had the opinion of the speaker been reversed, I think there would have been people in this room that that would have made them uncomfortable. If someone on behalf of a district committee came and spoke against district staff, that clearly would have made people uncomfortable. So that's the only point that I was making earlier. I wanna just be really careful that, that's, that there's some sort of separation there between the district uh, speaking on behalf of a district organization versus speaking on behalf of the person. Um, and then finally, you know, Mr. Clark has made the point so many times, and we have this discussion so many times when we talk, when we split into districts, that we're here to represent every, dis every student in this district. And I still believe that. I, I think we all, with one exception, got elected at large, and that's what we want to do. And I think tonight there was an implication that that was not the case. And so I think that's what uh, I think was frustrating to me because we have had this discussion as a board that that's not how we view our role as board members. So just wanted to clarify that. Um, obviously I'm disappointed in the decision tonight, but as Mr. Clark stated earlier, I respect my colleagues and I respect their decision, but I do wanna make sure that we, I really wanna encourage us to ignite a spirit of innovation in this district, use this as an opportunity to not just move on from this, but how can we kind of start talking about some of these creative ideas? How can we create another STEM Academy? How can we do some more work in this area where we give even more students those opportunities? So I hope that we can continue to have that discussion. Okay. Yep. Less than 20 seconds. Okay. Uh, I'll do it. Rob, congratulations on your retirement. That's great news, yeah. really happy for you. Uh, last thing, uh, Vista Del Lago boys cross country team, they're still running. Good luck in the state championships uh, in about a week and a half. Yeah, and may I add, uh, not only that, but uh, go Vista, go Folsom. Mm -hmm. Football. Alex, yes, go ahead. Uh, Alex. Oh, Alex, she said no. Okay. Uh, well, I'll make mine real quick. I, I agree, um, and, and I probably am the senior board member. I've seen a lot of change. <laughs> Uh, I think this district is a great district. I think the staff is great and we are innovative. I, and you know, what caused us to move from good to great before on these things was charter petitions. I was there. It does spark that conversation as Mr. Reed said. In the past, that's how we started. And it is, it, it gets you going and gets you started. We can do that at any time. We can do, that's up to us to be innovative. And I think we do have an innovative staff always thinking that way so i think it's up to us to just have that conversation we don't really need to have a petition because you know last time i was there it was just a bunch of petitions coming in and 
finally, I remember Teresa and I and everybody on the board, we all said, hey, wait, we can do this. We can do this better. We actually did, and we've proven it with STEM education. So I encourage us, yes, we should be doing that. And I am really proud of the district where we come, but we do can, and we need to continue to constantly think of better ways of doing things. Continuous improvement philosophy is, I guess, is what I'm talking about. So I thank this, the board, the staff for being here so long. Great discussion, and I'm gonna have to adjourn this because I think we're getting tired. <laughs> Hey, can I have a motion to adjourn? I'll move. Everybody? Say yay? Uh, yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay, yes, adjourn. Yeah. Okay.